Chapter One of Adventures of Bindle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. Chapter One The Coming of the Lodger. Bang! Even Bindle was startled by the emphasis with which Mrs. Bindle placed upon the supper-table a large pie-dish containing a savoury-smelling stew. "'Anything wrong?' he inquired solicitously, gazing at Mrs. Bindle over the top of the evening paper. "'Wrong?' she cried. "'Is there anything right?' "'Well, there's beer and Beatty and the boys what's fightin,' began Bindle suggestively. "'Don't talk to me!' mrs bindle banged a plate of stew in front of bindle to which he applied himself earnestly for some minutes the only sound was that occasioned by bindle's enjoyment of his supper as he proceeded to read the newspaper propped up in front of him you're nice company aren't you making a dive with the spoon at a potato which she transferred to her plate i might be on a desert island for all the company you are bindle gazed at mrs bindle over the small bone from which he was detaching the last vestiges of nutriment by means of his teeth he replaced the bone on the edge of his plate in silence you think of nothing but your stomach mrs bindle continued angrily look at you now well now ain't you funny remarked bindle as he replaced his glass upon the table if i'm chatty you say hold your tongue if i ain't chatty you ask why i ain't a-makin love to you after a moment's silence he continued meditatively i kept rabbits silkworms and a special kind of performin flea and i seem to get to understand em all but women well you may search me and he pushed his plate from him as a sign of repletion mrs bindle rose from the table bindle watched her curiously it was never wise to inquire what course was to follow i answered an advertisement to-day she announced as she banged an apple pie on the table with difficulty bindle withdrew his interest from the pie to mrs bindle's statement you don't say so he remarked pleasantly and about time i should think with food getting up as it is she continued as she hacked out a large v-shaped piece of pie crust which she transferred to a plate and proceeded to dab apple beside it bindle regarded her uncomprehendingly in the gospel sentinel she vouchsafed the information grudgingly and rising she fetched a paper from the dresser and threw it down in front of bindle indicating a particular part of the page with a vicious stab of her forefinger bindle picked up the paper the spot indicated was the column headed wanted he read christian home wanted by a single gentleman chapel-goer temperance quiet musical home comforts good cooking moderate terms references given and required apply lonely care of the gospel sentinel bindle looked up from the paper at mrs bindle well she challenged he turned once more to the paper and re-read the advertisement with great deliberation forgetful of his fast cooling plate well remarked bindle judicially this is a christian ome right enough plenty of soap and water and an em or two thrown in so as you won't notice the smell cookin's good likewise and as for ome comforts if we ain't got em who has there's sweepin and scrubbin and mats everywhere mustn't smoke in the parlour unless you happen to be the chimney and of course there's you the biggest ome comfort of all yes mrs b he concluded shaking his head with gloomy conviction we got enough home comforts to start a colony i'm always trippin over em eat your pie snapped mrs bindle perhaps it'll stop your mouth bindle applied himself to the apple pie with obvious relish glancing from time to time at the gospel sentinel well demanded mrs bindle once more i was just wonderin said bindle what about i was just wonderin continued bindle why we want a lodger us like two lovebirds a singin and a cooin all day long what about the housekeeping demanded mrs bindle aggressively the housekeeping inquired bindle innocently 
yes the housekeeping repeated mrs bindle with rising wrath as if bindle were directly responsible the housekeeping i said and food going up like like ell suggested bindle helpfully how am i to make both ends meet she demanded i suppose they must meet he inquired tentatively don't be a fool bindle was the response i ain't going to be a fool with that there lodger hangin about retorted bindle if he starts a playin with my own comfort he'll find his jaw closed for alterations i'm a desperate feller where my art's concerned there was poor old orus only the other day just back from the front he was bindle paused and shook his head mournfully horace who demanded mrs bindle horace gaze replied bindle nice cove too he is hullo horace i calls out when i see him just a-comin from the station with all his kit cheerio says he the missus'll be glad to see you i says she don't know i'm here yet he says didn't you send her a telegram i asks telegram says he not arf why not lord ain't you a mug joe says he you don't catch me a trustin women i got my own way i have says he mysterious like what is it i asks him well i goes ome says he er thinkin me at the front rattles me key in the front door then i nips round to the back and catches the blighter every time i won't listen to your disgusting stories said mrs bindle angrily disgustin said bindle incredulously you've a lewd mind bindle well well remarked bindle it's something to have a mind at all it's about the only thing they don't tax as war profits you'll have to be careful when the lodger comes there was a note of grim warning in mrs bindle's voice lodgers ain't to be trusted said bindle oracularly if you expects em to pinch your money box arf they goes with your missus and if you're open it'll be your missus blowed if they don't pouch the canary no he concluded with conviction lodgers ain't to be depended on that's right go on but you're not hurting me snapped mrs bindle rising to clear away you always oppose me perhaps you'll tell me how i'm to feed you on your wages she stood her hands on her hips looking down upon bindle with challenge in her eye my wages why i'm gettin never mind what you're getting interrupted mrs bindle you eat all you get and more and you know it look at the price of food and me waiting in queues half the day to get it for you you're not worth it she concluded with conviction i ain't mrs b replied bindle good-humouredly i ain't worth half the love what women have had for me mrs bindle sniffed you always was fond of your food she continued as if reluctant to let slip a topic so incontrovertible i was mrs b agreed bindle and what is more i probably always shall be as long as you go on cooking it what i shall do when you go orf with the lodger i don't know and bindle wagged his head from side to side in utter despondency mrs bindle made an unprovoked attack upon the kitchen fire well said bindle after a pause if it's rations or a lodger i suppose it's got to be a lodger and he drew a deep sigh of resignation he turned once more to the gospel sentinel musical too ain't he he continued i wonder what he plays the jew's arp or a drum seems a rare sport he does chapel goer temperance quiet musical fond of own comforts good cookin and don't want to pay much regular blood i shall call him he's coming to-night to see the place mrs bindle announced and don't you go and make me feel ashamed you'd better keep out of the room how could you cried bindle reproachfully as he proceeded to light his pipe me don't do that snapped mrs bindle bindle regarded her over the flaming match with eyebrows raised interrogatingly perhaps he doesn't smoke she explained but i ain't going to give up tobacco said bindle with decision holy angels me with a wife and a lodger and no pipe he looked about him as if in search of sympathy then turning to mrs bindle he demanded you mean to say i got to give up smoking for a lodger 
indignation had smoothed out the wrinkles round his eyes and stilled the twitchings at the corners of his mouth it doesn't matter after he's here mrs bindle responded sagely slowly the set expression vanished from bindle's face the wrinkles and twitches returned and he breathed a sigh of elaborate relief mrs b he said admiringly you ain't lived for nineteen years with your awful wedded husband lovin honourin and obeyin him i don't think without learnin a thing or two he winked knowingly yes he continued apparently addressing a fly upon the ceiling we'll catch our lodger first and smoke him afterwards all of which is good business funny how religion never seems to make you too simple to bindle was interrupted by a knocking at the outer door mrs bindle performed a series of movements with amazing celerity she removed and folded her kitchen apron placed it swiftly in the dresser drawer gave a hasty glance in the looking-glass over the mantelpiece to assure herself that all was well with her personal appearance and finally slipped into the parlour to light the gas she was out again in a second and as she passed into the passage leading to the outer door she threw back at bindle the one word remember pregnant with as much meaning as that uttered two and a half centuries before in whitehall nippy on her feet is mrs b muttered bindle admiringly as he listened intently to the murmur of voices and the sound of footsteps in the passage presently the parlour door closed and then silence bindle fidgeted about the kitchen he was curious as to what was taking place in the parlour and above all what manner of man the prospective lodger would turn out to be he picked up the evening paper endeavouring to read what the austrian prime minister thought of the prospects of peace what berlin thought of the austrian prime minister what the kaiser thought of the almighty and what the almighty was permitted to think of the kaiser but international politics and the war had lost their interest bindle was conscious that he was on the eve of a crisis in his home life ow the injure rubber ostrich can a cove read when he ain't smokin he muttered discontentedly as he paused to listen he had detected a movement in the parlour yes the door had been opened there was again the murmur of voices steps along the passage and finally the sound of the outer door closing a moment later mrs bindle entered bindle looked up expectantly but remembering that curiosity was the last thing calculated to open mrs bindle's set lips he became engrossed in his paper mrs bindle seated herself opposite to him and smoothing her skirt folded her hands on her supper as bindle had once expressed it he's coming monday she proclaimed with an air of one announcing an event of grave national importance does he smoke inquired bindle anxiously he does not replied mrs bindle with undisguised satisfaction but she added as if claiming for some hero the virtue of self-abnegation he doesn't object to it in moderation she added significantly well that's something admitted bindle as he proceeded to light his long neglected pipe there was poor old alf garley what beer made sick but he used to like to see other coves with a skinful don't be disgusting bindle snapped mrs bindle piqued that his apparent lack of interest in the lodger gave her no opportunity of imparting the information she was bursting to divulge what's disgusting demanded bindle him watching men make beasts of themselves retorted mrs bindle them making beasts of themselves bindle exclaimed if you'd ever seen alf after half a pint of beer you wouldn't have said it was them what was making beasts of mr hearty will like him interrupted mrs bindle unable longer to keep off the subject of the lodger mr hearty had married mrs bindle's sister and had become a prosperous greengrocer hearty like alf old me orus cried bindle i mean mr gupperduck said mrs bindle with dignity mr waterduck bindle cried his interest too evident for concealment mr josiah gupperduck repeated mrs bindle with unction that is his name bindle whistled the long low sound of joy and wonder well i'm damned he exclaimed don't you swear before me joseph bindle cried mrs bindle angrily for i won't stand it gupperduck repeated bindle with obvious enjoyment sounds like a patent mackintosh 
oh you may laugh said mrs bindle drawing her lips you may laugh but he'll be company for me he plays too she could no longer restrain her desire to tell all she knew about mr gupperduck is it the jew's harp or the drum what he plays inquired bindle presently it's neither replied mrs bindle it's the accordion bindle groaned mentally he visualized mr hardy's hymn singing sunday evenings plus mr gupperduck and his accordion well well he remarked philosophically i suppose we're none of us perfect he's a very good man and he's going to join our chapel announced mrs bindle with satisfaction bindle groaned again arty and mrs b and old buttercup he muttered joe bindle you'll be on the safe bench before you know where you are and rising he went out much to the disappointment of mrs bindle who was prepared to talk lodger until bedtime to bindle the lodger was something between a convention and an institution he was a being around whom a vast tradition had accumulated in conjunction with the mother-in-law he was on the halls the source from which all humour flowed his red nose umbrella and bloater were ageless he was a sore of discord in other men's houses waxing fat on the produce of a stranger's labour he would as cheerfully go off with his landlord's wife for ever as with the unfortunate man's shirt or trousers for a few hours thus losing him a day's work nemesis seemed powerless to dog the footsteps of the lodger retribution was incapable of tracking him down he was voracious of appetite prolific of explanation eternally on the brink of affluence forever in the slough of debt he was a prince of parasites a master of optimism a model of obtuseness he could achieve more and at less cost to himself than a gipsy he was as ancient as the hills as genial as the sunshine as cheerful as an expectant relative at the death bedside of wealth he was unthinkable unforgettable unejectable living on all men for all time nations rose and declined kings came and went emperors soared and fell but the lodger stayed on bindle looked forward to the coming of mr gupperduck with keen interest since the evening of his call mrs bindle had become uncommunicative what's he do bindle had inquired he's engaged upon the lord's work she had replied and proved unamenable to all further interrogation on the monday bindle was home from work early only to be informed that mr gupperduck would not arrive until eight o'clock now you just be careful what you say bindle mrs bindle had admonished him as she busied herself with innumerable saucepans upon the stove don't you be nervous mrs b he reassured her sniffing the savoury air with keen anticipation there ain't nothing wrong with my conversation once i gets goin what about drink he demanded as he unhooked from the dresser the blue and white jug with the crimson butterfly just beneath the spout he's temperance replied mrs bindle with unction well i hope he looks it was bindle's comment as he went out when time permitted bindle's method of fetching the supper beer was what he described as half inside and half in the jug which meant that he spent half an hour in pleasant converse with congenial spirits at the yellow ostrich when he returned to fenton street mr gupperduck had arrived depositing the jug upon the table with deliberation bindle turned to welcome the guest pleased to see you mr gutter he paused the name had momentarily escaped him gupperduck mr josiah gupperduck volunteered the lodger it ain't easy is it said bindle cheerfully must have caused you a rare lot of trouble a name like that mr gupperduck eyed him disapprovingly he was a small thin man with a humourless cast of face large round spectacles three distinct wisps of overworked hair that failed to conceal his baldness a short brown beard that seemed to stand out straight from his chin and a red nose his upper lip was bare save for a three days growth of bristles looks like a owl what's been on the drink was bindle's mental comment you can read his old history in the end of his nose been a pleasant day remarked bindle conversationally quite forgetful that it had rained continuously since early morning pleasant interrogated mr gupperduck bindle suddenly remembered 
for the ducks i mean he said then with inspiration added not for gupper ducks bindle admonished mrs bindle you forget yourself oh don't mind me mr g said bindle there ain't no real arm in me bindle proceeded to put an ed on the beer this he did by pouring it into the glass from a distance of fully a yard with astonishing accuracy catching mr gupperduck's eye he winked can't get an ed like that on lemonade he remarked cheerfully the atmosphere was constrained mr gupperduck was tired and hungry bindle was hungry without being tired and mrs bindle was grimly prepared for the worst well ere's long legs to the baby cried bindle raising his glass and drinking thirstily mrs bindle cast a swift glance at mr gupperduck who gazed at bindle wonderingly over the top of the spoon he was raising to his mouth the meal continued in silence bindle was hypnotized by mr gupperduck's ears they stood out from each side of his head like signboards as if determined that nothing should escape them after a time mr gupperduck began to show signs that the first ardour of his appetite had been appeased if it ain't a rude question mister began bindle might i ask what's your job i'm in the service of the lord replied mr gupperduck in a harsh tone trade union wages queried bindle with assumed innocence bindle admonished mrs bindle behave yourself i am a sower of the seed said mr gupperduck pompously and with evident self-satisfaction well personally myself said bindle i ain't much belief in them allotments you spend all your time in diggin and gettin yourself in an ell of a mess and then somebody comes along and pinches your bloomin vegetables i refer to the spiritual seed said mr gupperduck i preach the word of god the peace that passeth all understanding bindle groaned inwardly and silence fell once more over the board mrs bindle said mr gupperduck at length you have given me a most excellent supper mrs bindle's lips became slightly visible the lord shall feed his flock remarked mr gupperduck apropos of nothing in particular and he keeps a few little pickings for his gupperducks flashed bindle bindle mrs bindle glanced across at mr gupperduck the two then entered into a conversation upon the ways of the lord about which they both seemed to possess vast stores of the most intimate information from their conversation bindle gathered that mr gupperduck was a lecturer in the parks mission halls and the like being connected with the society for the suppression of atheism and what are the tenets of your spiritual faith mr bindle mr gupperduck suddenly turned and addressed himself to bindle what's my what inquired bindle with corrugated forehead he's a blasphemer mr gupperduck i'm sorry to say volunteered mrs bindle mr gupperduck regarded bindle as if mrs bindle had said he was the missing link mr bindle he said earnestly have you ever thought of the other world thought of the other world bindle exclaimed if you lived with mrs b you wouldn't have much time for thinking of anything else she's as dotty about evan as an inn over a shop egg and as for arty that's my brother-in-law well arty gets my goat when he starts about evan and angels i fear you speak lightly of serious things mr bindle said mr gupperduck harshly think of when the trumpet shall sound incorruptible and think of when the all-clear bugle sounds in fulham responded bindle mr gupperduck looked at mrs bindle in horror i'm a special you know explained bindle i got to be on the listen for that bugle after the air raids my don't they just nip back into their little beds again feelin how brave they've all been mr gupperduck seemed to come to the conclusion that bindle was hopeless for the next half hour he devoted himself to conversing with mrs bindle about the message he was engaged in delivering you plays don't you inquired bindle as mr gupperduck rose i'm very fond of my accordion replied mr gupperduck i suppose you couldn't give us a tune ventured bindle not to-night mr bindle said mr gupperduck i have a lot to do to-morrow then as if suddenly remembering his pose he added there is the lord's work to be done on the morrow and his servant hath need of rest bindle stared mrs bindle regarded her lodger with admiration tinctured with awe 
when mr gupperduck could not call to mind an appropriate passage from the scriptures he invented one i'm sorry remarked bindle as mr gupperduck moved towards the door i wanted you to play a thing i picked up at the granville the other night it was a rare good song if you squeeze me tighter jimmy i shall scream i can whistle it if but mr gupperduck was gone then the storm burst you're a disgrace to any respectable home joseph bindle that you are mrs bindle broke out as soon as mr gupperduck's bedroom door was heard to close me inquired bindle in obvious surprise what must he think of us demanded mrs bindle you with your lewd and blasphemous talk what have i done now inquired bindle in an injured tone talking about baby's legs and and oh you make me ashamed you do mrs bindle proceeded to bang away the supper things steady on admonished bindle or you'll have the duck out of bed what must he think of me with such an husband mrs bindle's h's were dropping from her under the stress of her pent-up feelings well speaking for myself said bindle relighting his pipe which had gone out he most likely thinks you're an uncommon lucky woman you see lizzie bindle continued evenly you're fickle that's what's the matter with you mrs bindle paused in the act of pouring water over the piled-up dishes in the sink as soon as you sees another cove what takes your fancy you sort of loses your taste for your own husband bindle seated himself at the table and spread out the evening paper first it's arty then it's gupperduck now i ask you mrs b what would you think if i was to say we must have a woman lodger now i ask you that's quite different cried mrs bindle angrily mr gupperduck is a sort o prayer og in trousers judging from his talk interrupted bindle me and him ain't going to fall out though you did give him an extra dose of gravy at the same time we ain't going to fall in love with each other if he pays his rent and behaves quiet like then i haven't nothing to say for what's an ome without a lodger but it's got to be ands orf my missus see bindle you're a dirty-minded beast retorted mrs bindle snapping her jaws viciously that may or may not be replied bindle as he walked towards the door on his way to bed but if you and him start giving each other the glad eye then i'm hurt in my private feelings and when i'm hurt in my private feelings i'm hot stuff and he winked gravely at the text on the kitchen wall containing some home truths for the transgressor end of chapter one of adventures of bindle read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter two of adventures of bindle by herbert jenkins this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter two a downing street sensation me ride eight miles on an orse exclaimed bindle looking up at the foreman in surprise and oo's a comin to old me on bindle stood in the yard of messrs impsom and daly cartage contractors regarding a pair of burly cart horses ready harnessed with the traces thrown over their backs the foreman explained in the idiom adopted by foreman that orders is orders you can ride on top run beside or hang on behind but you gotta be at merton at twelve o'clock he said we just had a telephone message that a van's stranded this side o merton horses broken down and you and tippet have got to take these ere and deliver the goods then take the van where you're told and bring back them ruddy horses ere and don't you forget it bindle scratched his head through the blue and white cricket cap he habitually wore horses had suddenly assumed for him a new significance with elaborate intentness he examined the particular animal that had been assigned to him what part do you sit on old son he inquired of tippet a pale weedy youth with a thin dark moustache that curled into the corners of his mouth tippet's main characteristic was that he always had a cigarette either stuck to his lip or behind his ear sometimes both on his tail replied tippet laconically his cigarette wagging up and down as he spoke sit on his what cried bindle 
walking round to the stern of his animal and examining the tail with great attention sit on his what on his tail repeated tippet without manifesting any interest in the conversation right back on his haunches he added by way of explanation more comfortable oh said bindle relieved i see pity you can't say what you mean tippy ain't it personally myself i'd sooner sit well up so as i could put me arms round his neck hi spotty he called to an unprepossessing stable hand bring a ladder a uh, what inquired spotty dully a ladder explained bindle i got to mount this ere derby winner spotty strolled leisurely across the yard towards bindle and for a moment stood regarding the horse in a detached sort of way i'll give you a leg up mate he said accommodatingly bindle looked at the horse suspiciously and seeing there were no indications of vice at the same time realizing that there was nothing else to be done he acquiesced steady on old sport he counselled spotty don't you chuck me clean over the other side with a dexterous heave spotty landed him well upon the animal's back bindle calmly proceeded to throw one leg over sitting astride not that way said tippet both legs on the near side you can ride your nag what way you like tippy said bindle but as for me i likes to have a leg on each side how the ell am i going to old on if i sit like a bloomin lady my god he exclaimed passing his hand along the backbone of the animal if i don't have a cushion i shall wear through in two licks here spotty give us a cloth of some sort then you can back me as a two to one chance tippet more accustomed than bindle to such adventures vaulted lightly upon his animal and led the way out of the yard for some distance they proceeded at an ambling walk which bindle found in no way inconvenient just as they had entered the fulham road where it branches off from brompton road an urchin gave bindle's horse a flick on the flank with a stick sending it into a ponderous trot amidst the jangling clatter of harness bindle clutched wildly at the collar ere stop him somebody hold him he yelled i touched the wrong button whoa steady whoa old iron he shouted then turning his head to one side he called out tippy tippy where the hell is the brake for god's sake stop him before he shakes me into a jelly tippet's animal jangled up beside that on which bindle was mounted and both once more fell back into the ponderous lope at which they had started with great caution bindle raised himself into an upright position i wonder what made him do a thing like that he said reproachfully bruised me all over he has i shan't be able to sit down for a month ere stop him tippy i'm getting orf tippet stretched out his hand and brought both horses to a standstill bindle slipped ungracefully over his animal's tail you can have him tippy old sport i'm going to walk he announced when i get tired of walking i'll get on a bus i'll meet you at wimbledon common and tippet his cigarette hanging loosely from a still looser lower lip reached over caught the animal's bridle and without comment continued on his way westward well live and learn mumbled bindle to himself i don't care what a jockey gets but he earns it every penny fancy an horse being as hard as that catch you up presently tippy he cried mind you don't fall orf and bindle turned into the dragon hounds for something to take the bruises out as he expressed it to himself catch me a ridin of an orse again without an air cushion he muttered as he came out of the public bar wiping his mouth he hailed a westbound bus and climbing on the top and lighting his pipe proceeded to enjoy the morning sunshine when tippet reached the extreme end of wimbledon common bindle rose from the grass by the roadside where he had been leisurely smoking and enjoying the warmth add quite a pleasant little snooze tippy he yawned as he stretched his arms behind his head wonder who first thought o ridin on an orse's back he yawned as for me i'd just as soon ride on an and saw they jogged along in the direction of merton bindle walking beside the horses tippet silent and apathetic his cigarette still attached to his lower lip you ain't what i should call a chatty cove tippy remarked bindle conversationally but then he added 
that has its points if you don't open your mouth no woman can't say you ever asked her to marry you can she married mate tippet vouchsafed the information without expression or interest bindle stood still and looked at him tippet unconcernedly continued on his way well i'm damned remarked bindle as he continued after the horses well i'm damned they'd get you if you was deaf and dumb and blind poor old tippy no wonder he looks like that just outside merton they came upon a stranded pantechnicon drawn up in front of it was a motor-car containing two ladies this the little lot inquired bindle as they pulled up beside the vehicle which bore the name of john smith and company merton are you from empson and daly's inquired the elder of the two ladies a sallow-faced angular woman with pince-nez that's us mum responded bindle i suppose those are the horses remarked the same lady indicating the animals with an inclination of her head you ain't got much to learn in the way of guessin mum was bindle's cheery response the lady eyed him disapprovingly her companion at the wheel smiled she was younger bindle winked at her but she froze instantly the horses that were in this van were taken ill said the lady what both together mum exclaimed bindle yes replied the lady looking at him sharply must have been twins or conchies footnote conscientious objectors to military service end of footnote was bindle's explanation of the phenomenon if one of ginger's twins as the measles sure as eggs the other'll get em on the next day that's what makes ginger so ratty bindle walked up to the van and examined it as if to assure himself that it was in no way defective and where are we to take it mum he inquired to mr llewellyn john number one ten downing street was the reply bindle whistled he ain't movin is he mum the van contains a presentation of carved oak dining-room furniture she added and very nice too was bindle's comment outside downing street she continued you will be met by a lady who will give you the key that opens the doors of the van hadn't we better take the key now mum bindle inquired you'll do as you're told please was the uncompromising rejoinder right o mum remarked bindle cheerily now then tippy let's get these ere horses in which end do you begin on tippet and bindle silently busied themselves in harnessing the horses to the pantechnicon now you won't make any mistake said the lady when everything was completed number one ten downing street mr llewellyn john there ain't going to be no mistakes mum you may put your and on your art bindle assured her coffee money mum inquired tippet it's ot tippet never wasted words tippy tippy i'm surprised at you bindle turned upon his colleague reproachfully only twice have you spoke to-day and the second time's to beg oh, i'm sorry mum he said turning to the lady it ain't his fault it's just abbott the lady hesitated for a moment then taking her purse from her bag handed bindle a two shilling piece tippet eyed it greedily with a final admonition not to forget the lady drove off bindle looked at the coin spat on it and put it in his pocket funny thing how a woman'll give a couple of bob where a man'll make it half a dollar he remarked what about me inquired tippet what about you tippy repeated bindle well least said soonest mended you can't help it but i asked her persisted tibbet ah tippy remarked bindle it ain't im what asks but im what gets however you shall ave a stone ginger at the next stoppin place your old pal ain't going back on you tippy without a word tippet climbed up into the driver's seat whilst bindle clambered on to the tailboard where he proceeded to fill his pipe with the air of a man for whom time has no meaning good job they ain't all like me he muttered i likes a day in the country now and then but always not me he struck a match lighted his pipe and with a sigh of contentment composed himself to bucolic meditation one of the advantages of the moving profession in bindle's eyes was that it gave him hours of leisured ease whilst the goods were in transit you can slack it like a cuthbert he would say all you got to do is sit on the tail of a van and watch the world go by some life that bindle was awakened from his contemplation of the hedges and the white road that ribboned out before his eyes by a man coming out of a gate 
at the sight of the pantechnicon he grinned and with a jerk of his thumb indicated the van as if it were the greatest joke in the world bindle grinned back although not quite understanding the cause of the man's amusement up little lot that mate remarked the man stepping off the curb and walking beside the tailboard bindle looked at him puzzled at the remark what actually might you be meaning old son he inquired oh come orf it said the man i won't tell your missus like a razzle myself sometimes and he laughed obviously amused at this joke bindle slipped off the tailboard and joined the man who had returned to the pavement you evidently seen a joke what's caught me on the blind side he remarked casually a joke remarked the man a whole van load of jokes if you was to ask me well perhaps you're right remarked bindle philosophically but if there's as many as all that i should have thought there'd have been enough for two but as i say perhaps you're right these ain't the times for giving anythink away although he added meditatively i adn't eard of their avin rationed jokes as well as meat and sugar we shall be avin joke cues soon he added you seem to be a sort of joke og you do bindle turned and regarded his companion with interest you mean to say that you don't know what's inside that there van inquired the man incredulously carved oak dining-room furniture i been told replied bindle indifferently the man laughed loudly then turned to bindle you mean to say you don't know that van's full of gals he demanded full o what exclaimed bindle coming to a dead stop his astonishment was too obvious to leave doubt in the man's mind as to its genuineness gals and women he replied saw em gettin in down the road out of motors dressed in white they was with coloured sashes over their shoulders suffragettes i should say they didn't see me though he added bindle gave vent to a low prolonged whistle as he resumed his walk old me orus he cried happily what did mrs b say if she knew suddenly he paused again and slapped his knee well i'm damned he cried a raid of course the man looked anxiously up at the blue of the sky it's all right said bindle reassuringly ma mistake it was a bird a few minutes later the man turned off from the main road oi tippy bindle hailed don't you forget that stone ginger at the next dairy a muttered reply came from tippet five minutes later he drew up outside a public house on the outskirts of wimbledon bindle took the opportunity of climbing up on the top of the van where he gained the information he required every inch of the roof was perforated arrows he muttered with keen satisfaction arrows as i'm a miserable sinner and he clambered down and entered the public bar where he convinced tippet that his mate should be trusted with money when bindle had drained the last drop of his second pewter his mind was made up number one ten downing street he muttered white dresses and coloured sashes that's it well joe bindle you can't save the bloomin british empire from destruction but you can save the prime minister from having his afternoon nap spoilt leastwise you can try i'm a-goin for a little stroll tippy he remarked as he walked towards the door back in ten minutes if you gets lonely order another pint and put it down to me right oh mate replied tippet bindle walked along wimbledon high street and turned into an oil shop do you keep lamp black he inquired of the young woman behind the counter yes she replied how much do you want we sell it in packets let's have a look at a packet said bindle when he had examined it he ordered two more start a minstrel troupe he confided to the young woman but you want burnt cork she said practically lamp black's greasy you'll never get it off that's just why i want it remarked bindle with a grin the young woman looked at him curiously and when he had purchased a pea puffer as well she decided that he was a harmless lunatic but took the precaution of testing the half crown he tendered by ringing it on the counter shouldn't be surprised if we was to have an heavy shower of rain in a few minutes remarked bindle loudly a few minutes later as he rejoined tippet who was engaged in watering the horses tippet looked at bindle his cigarette wagging then turning his eyes up to the cloudless sky in surprise he finally reached the same conclusion as the young woman in the oil shop <laughs>
now up you get tippy admonished bindle and there's another drink for you at the green lion bindle knew his london as the pantechnicon rumbled heavily along by the side of wimbledon common bindle whistled softly to himself the refrain of the end of a happy day whilst tippet was enjoying his fourth pint that morning at the green lion bindle borrowed a large watering can which was handed up to him on the roof of the pantechnicon by a surprised barman bindle emptied the contents of one of the packets of lamp black into the can and started to stir it vigorously with a piece of twig he had picked up from the side of the common when the water had reluctantly absorbed the lamp black to bindle's entire satisfaction he called out loudly i knew we was going to have a shower and he proceeded to water the top of the pantechnicon now i must put this ere tarpaulin over or else the water'll get through them holes he said he clearly heard suppressed exclamations as the water penetrated inside the van having emptied the can he proceeded to drag the tarpaulin over the roof leaving uncovered only a small portion in the centre the barman of the green lion had been watching bindle with open-mouthed astonishment what the hell are you up to mate he whispered bindle put his forefinger of the right hand to the side of his nose and winked mysteriously then going inside the green lion he in a way that did not outrage the regulations that there should be no treating had tippet's tankard refilled and called for another for himself if you watch the papers bindle remarked to the barman i shouldn't be surprised if you was to see what i was a-doin on the top of that there van and again he winked the barman looked from bindle to tippet then touching his forehead with a fugitive first finger and glancing in the direction of bindle made it clear that another was prepared to support the diagnosis of the young woman at the oil shop bindle completed the journey on the top of the van industriously occupied in puffing lamp black through the holes in the roof his method was to dip the end of the pea puffer in the packet then insert it in one of the holes and give a sharp puff this he did half a dozen times in quick succession then he would pause for a few minutes to allow the lamp black to settle he argued that if he puffed it all in at once it would in all probability choke the occupants by the time they turned from king's road into ebury street bindle's task was accomplished the lamp black was exhausted victoria station he called out loudly to tippet shan't be long now mate another shower a-comin better cover up these bloomin holes and he drew the tarpaulin over the rest of the roof let em stew a bit now he mumbled to himself that'll make em ought he had been conscious of suppressed coughing and sneezing from within which he detected by placing his ear near the holes in the roof opposite the houses of parliament a lady came up to mendel and handed him a key this is the key of the pantechnicon she said loudly you are not to undo it until you reach number one ten downing street do you understand right o remarked bindle i got it now don't forget said the lady and she disappeared swiftly in the direction of victoria street no i ain't going to forget murmured bindle to himself and i shouldn't be surprised if there was others what ain't going to forget either he watched the lady who had given him the key well out of sight then slipping off the tailboard of the van he walked swiftly along whitehall a few yards south of downing street an inspector of police was meditatively contemplating the flow of traffic north and south bindle went up to him pretend that i'm asking the way sir i'm most likely being watched i got a van what's supposed to contain carved oak furniture for mr llewellyn john one ten downing street i think it's full of suffragettes going to raid him you get your men round there the van'll be up in two ticks now point as if you was showing me downing street the inspector was a man of quick decision and looking keenly at bindle decided that he was to be trusted right he said then extending an official arm pointed out downing street to bindle don't hurry he added right o said bindle joseph bindle's my name i'm a special fulham district the inspector nodded and bindle turned back to the van a moment later the inspector strolled leisurely through the archway leading to the foreign office that's downing street on the left shouted bindle to tippet as he came up much to tippet's surprise he was at a loss to account for many things that bindle had done and said that day as they turned into downing street bindle was a little disappointed at finding only two constables but he was relieved 
a moment later by the sight of the inspector to whom he had spoken hurrying through the archway leading from the foreign office where are you going to called out the inspector to tippet taking no notice of bindle tippet jerked his thumb in the direction of bindle who came forward at that moment number one ten downing street sir responded bindle some furniture for mr llewellyn john right said the inspector loudly but you'll have to wait a few minutes until the motor car is gone bindle winked as a sign of his acceptance of the mythical motor car and drawing the key of the pantechnicon from his pocket showed it to the inspector who by closing his eyes and slightly bending his head indicated that he understood tippet had decided that everybody was mad this morning the police inspector's reference to a motor-car outside number one ten whereas his eyes told him that there was nothing there but roadway and dust had seriously undermined his respect for the metropolitan police force however it was not his business he was there to drive the horses who in turn drew a van to a given spot there his responsibility ended after a wait of nearly ten minutes the inspector reappeared it's all clear now he remarked draw up as the pantechnicon pulled up in front of number one ten bindle glanced up at the house and saw mr llewellyn john looking out of one of the first floor windows he had evidently been apprised of what was taking place bindle noticed that the doors of number one ten and one eleven were both ajar he was however a little puzzled at the absence of police the two uniformed constables had been reinforced by three others and there were two obviously plain-clothes men loitering about now then tippy get ready to lend me a and with this ere furniture called out bindle as he proceeded to insert the key in the padlock that fastened the doors of the van tippet who had climbed down was standing close to the tailboard facing the doors with a quick movement bindle released the padlock from the hasp and lifting the bar stepped aside with an agility that was astonishing votes for women votes for women votes for women suddenly the placid quiet of downing street was shattered the doors of the pantechnicon were burst open and thrown back upon their hinges where they shivered as if trembling with fear from the interior of the van poured such a stream of humanity as downing street had never before seen following bindle's lead the inspector had taken the precaution of stepping aside but tippet unconscious that the van contained anything more aggressive than carved oak furniture was in the direct line of exit at the moment the doors flew open he was in the act of removing his coat and with his arms entangled in the sleeves sat down with a suddenness that caused his teeth to rattle and his cigarette to fall from his lower lip synchronizing with the opening of the doors of the pantechnicon was a short sharp blast of a police whistle the effect was magical men seemed to pour into downing street from everywhere from the archway leading to the foreign office up the steps from green park from whitehall and out of numbers one ten and one eleven plain clothes and uniformed police seemed to spring up from everywhere but no one took any notice of the fall of tippet all eyes were fixed upon the human avalanche that was pouring from the inside of the pantechnicon for once in its existence the metropolitan police force was rendered helpless with astonishment women they had expected women they were prepared for but the extraordinary flood of femininity that cascaded out of the van absolutely staggered them there were short women and tall women stout women and thin women young women and well women not so young the one thing they had in common was a lamp black it was smeared upon their faces streaked upon their garments it had circled their eyes marked the lines of their mouths had collected round their nostrils the heat inside the pantechnicon had produced the necessary moisture upon the fair faces and with this the lamp black had formed an unholy alliance hats were awry hair was dishevelled frocks were limp and bedraggled the cries of votes for women that had heralded the triumphant outburst from the van froze upon their lips as the demonstrators caught sight of one another each gazed at the others in mute astonishment whilst tippet from his seat in the middle of the roadway stared wondering in a stupid way whether what he saw was the heat or the five pints of ale he had consumed at bindle's expense during the morning the inspector looked at bindle curiously and bindle looked at the inspector with self-satisfaction whilst the constables discovered that their unhappy anticipation of a rough-and-tumble with women a thing they disliked had been turned into a most delectable comedy 
at the first floor window mr llewellyn john watched the scene with keen enjoyment for a full minute the women stood gazing from one to the other in a dazed fashion finally one with stouter heart than the rest shouted votes for women this is a woman's war but there was no answering cry from the ranks slowly it dawned upon each and every woman that in all probability she was looking just as ridiculous as those she saw about her one girl produced a small looking-glass from a handbag she gave one glance into it and incontinently went into hysterics flopping down where she stood the public conscious that great events were happening in downing street poured into the narrow thoroughfare and the laughter denied the official police by virtue of discipline was heard on every hand christy minstrels ain't they inquired one youth of another with ponderous humour it was at that moment that one of them had raised a despairing cry of votes for women and had received no support votes for women remarked one man shrewdly soap for women is what they want fancy coming out like that even in war time commented another how'd they get like that inquired a third oh, you never know them suffragettes remarked a fourth sagely they're always out for doing something different from what's been done before well they done it this time commented a little man with grey whiskers enough to make god himself ashamed of us them women is bah and he spat contemptuously the inspector felt that the time for action had arrived walking up to the unhappy group of twenty he remarked in his most official tone you cannot stand about here you must be moving on moving on but where they looked into each other's eyes mutely suddenly an idea seemed to strike them and they turned instinctively to re-enter the van but bindle had anticipated this manoeuvre and had carefully closed barred and padlocked the doors the inspector nodded approval he had formed a very high opinion of bindle's powers although greatly puzzled by the whole business at a signal from their superior a number of uniformed constables formed up behind the forlorn band of females several of whom were in tears move along there please they chorused dexterously splitting up the group into smaller groups and finally into ones and twos thus they were herded towards whitehall will you call some cabs please said she who was obviously the leader the inspector shook his head whereat the woman smacked the face of the nearest constable obviously with the intention of being arrested again the inspector shook his head he had made up his mind that there should be no arrests that day nemesis had taken a hand in the game and the inspector recognized in her one who is more powerful than the metropolitan police force slowly amidst the jeers of the crowd the twenty women were shepherded into whitehall oh please get me a taxi appealed a little blonde woman with a hard mouth and what looked like a dark black moustache i cannot go about like this suddenly one of their number was taken with shrieking hysterics she sat down suddenly giving vent to shriek after shriek and beating a tattoo at the heels of her shoes upon the roadway but no one took any notice of her and soon she rose and followed the others in whitehall frantic appeals were made to drivers of taxicabs and conductorettes of omnibuses none would accept such fares it'd take a month to clean my bloomin cab after you been in it shouted one man derisively what yer want to get yourself in such a dirty mess for go home and wash the baby shouted another nowhere did the black and white raiders find sympathy or assistance two of the leaders of the suffragette movement who happened to be passing down whitehall were attracted by the crowd on learning what had happened and seeing the plight of the demonstrators they continued on their way this is war time one of them remarked to the other and they're disobeying the rules of the association with this they were left to their fate some made for the tube others for the district railway whilst two sought out a tea-shop and demanded washing facilities but were refused the railway stations were their one source of hope for the next three hours passengers travelling to wimbledon were astonished to see entering the train forlorn and dishevelled women whose faces were rendered hideous by smears of black and whose white frocks limp and crumpled looked as if they had been used to clean machinery a pleasant little afternoon's treat for you sir remarked bindle to the inspector when the last of the raiders had disappeared mr john seemed to enjoy it bindle indicated the first floor window of number one ten with a jerk of his thumb was that your doing inquired the inspector 
well replied bindle it was and it wasn't and he explained how it had all come about and what am i going to do with this ere van he queried better run it round to the yard then you can take home the horses replied the inspector right o said bindle by the way added the inspector i'm coming round myself i should like you to see chief inspector gunny bindle nodded cheerily hullo tippy he cried knocked you down didn't they tippet grinned he had thoroughly enjoyed the entertainment and bore no malice that's why you got the watering can mate he remarked bindle surveyed him with mock admiration now ain't you clever he remarked fancy you a seein that there ain't no spots on you tippy whereat tippet grinned again modestly that afternoon bindle was introduced to the famous chief inspector gunny of scotland yard who for years previously had been the head of the department dealing with the suffragist demonstrations he was a genial large-hearted man who had earned the respect almost the liking of those whose official enemy he was when he heard bindle's story he roared with laughter and insisted that bindle should himself tell about the black and white raiders to the deputy commissioner and the chief constable it was nearly four o'clock when bindle left scotland yard smoking a big cigar with which the deputy commissioner had presented him chief inspector gunny's last words had been well bindle you've done us a great service if at any time i can help you let me know now i wonder what he meant by that murmured bindle to himself does it mean that i can have a little flutter at bigamy or that i can break artie's bloomin ed and not get pinched for it still he remarked cheerfully it's been an happy day a very happy day and he turned in at the feathers and ordered something to wet this ere cigar end of chapter two read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Chapter Three of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Three, The Air Raid. One. There wasn't no home life in England until the Kaiser started a dropping bombs in people's backyards. Remarked Bindle oracularly funny thing he continued how everybody seemed to find out how fond they was of settin at home because they was afraid of goin out mr hardy looked at mr gupperduck and mr gupperduck looked at mrs bindle they required time in which to assimilate so profound an utterance mr gupperduck had firmly established himself in the good graces of mr hardy and the leaders of the alton road chapel he was a constant visitor at the hearties especially at meal times and at the chapel he prayed with great fervour beating all records as far as endurance was concerned i don't agree with you remarked mr gupperduck at length i do not agree with you the scriptures say every man to his family mr hardy looked gratefully at his guest it was pleasant to find bindle controverted you know alf you never been so much at home wheezed mrs hardy hitting her chest remorselessly you never do go out on moonlight nights you trust him said bindle hardy and the moon ain't never out together we're told to take cover said mr hardy with dignity and what about us poor fellers what has to be out in it all demanded bindle looking down at his special constable's uniform you should commend yourself to god said mr gupperduck piously he that putteth his trust in him shall not be afraid ain't you afraid when there's a raid on demanded bindle i have no fear of earthly things replied mr gupperduck lifting his eyes to the ceiling he's all gupperduck and camouflage ain't he millikins whispered bindle to his niece then aloud he said well mrs b ain't like you she's afraid like all the rest of us i don't believe much in coves what say they ain't afraid you ask the boys back from france you don't hear them a sayin they ain't afraid they knows too much for that there's one above who watches over us all joseph said mr hearty emboldened to unaccustomed temerity by the presence of mr gupperduck mr bindle said mr gupperduck our lives and our happiness are in god's hands wherefore shall we feel afraid 
well well remarked bindle with resignation you and arty beat me when it comes to pluck when i'm out with all them guns a-goin and bombs a-droppin about i'd sooner be somewhere else and i ain't a-goin to say different perhaps it's because i'm an eathen the hour of repentance should not be deferred said mr gupperduck it is not too late even now it's no good said bindle decisively i should never be able to feel as brave as what you are when there's a raid on oh ye of little faith murmured mr gupperduck mournfully think of daniel in the lion's den said mrs bindle and jonah in the er, interior of the whale added mr hardy with great delicacy now remarked bindle shaking his head with conviction i wasn't made for lions or whales i suppose i'm a bit of a coward i don't feel brave when there's a raid uncle joe said millie hardy loyally she had been a silent listener and mother isn't either are you mums she turned to mrs hardy it's my breath responded mrs hardy patting her ample bosom it gets me here that's because you don't go to chapel martha said bindle if you was to turn up there three times on sundays you'd be as brave as what mr gupperduck is ain't that so he inquired turning to mr gupperduck you're always sneering at the chapel broke in mrs bindle without giving the lodger time to reply it doesn't do us any harm whatever you may think that's just where you're wrong mrs b remarked bindle settling himself down for a controversy i ain't got nothing to say against the chapel if they only let you set quiet but it's such an up and down sort of life when you ain't kneelin down a askin to be saved from what you know you deserves or kept from doin what you're nuts on doin you're a-standin up a-singin hymns about all sorts of uncomfortable things what you says you opes to find in heaven you have a jaundiced view of religion mr bindle said mr gupperduck ponderously a jaundiced view he repeated pleased with the phrase have i really remarked bindle anxiously i hope it ain't catchin no he continued meditatively i wasn't meant for chapels i seem to be able to think best about evan when i'm settin smokin after supper with mrs b a bangin at the stove to remind me that i ain't there yet what does me he continued is that i never yet say any of your chapel coves appier for all your singin and prayin why is it look at you three now if you was goin to be plucked and trussed to-morrow you couldn't look more fidgety instinctively each of the three looked at the other two mr gupperduck shook his head hopelessly you don't understand joseph murmured mr hearty with mournful resignation i can understand ruddy bill getting drunk bindle continued because he do look happy when he's got a skinful but i can't understand you a wantin to pray arty i really can't i only once see a lot of religious people happy and that was when they got drunk by mistake lord didn't they teach me an old uggles things he blushes like a gal when i mentions it uggles is a nice mind he has well i must be goin arty in case them uns come over to-night you ought to be a special arty there's some rare fine gals in putney hill do you think there'll be an air raid to-night asked mr gupperduck with something more than casual interest in his voice maybe said bindle casually maybe not funny things air raids they've changed a rare lot of things he remarked meditatively once we used to want the moon to come out sort of made us think of gals and settin on styles mrs b was a rare one for moons and styles wasn't you lizzie don't be disgusting bindle there was anger in mrs bindle's voice now continued bindle imperturbably no cove don't want to go out and set on a style a oldin of a girl's and not im when his job's done he starts arf for ome like giddy-o and you don't see his nose again till the next morning bindle paused to wink at mr hearty if there's any gal now he continued what wants her and eld on moonlight nights she'll have to old it herself or wait till peace comes if you would only believe mr bindle said mr gupperduck earnestly making a final effort at bindle's salvation if thou canst believe all things are possible ah mr gupperduck started into an upright position with eyes dilated as a loud report was heard what was that he cried that remarked bindle dryly as he rose and picked up his peaked cap is the signal for you and arty to put your trust in god in other words he added it's a gun in what fulham calls the barker bindle looked from mr hearty leaden-hued with fright to mr gupperduck whose teeth were chattering 
on to mrs bindle who was white to the lips well i must be orf he said adjusting his cap upon his head at a rakish angle if i don't come back mrs b you'll be a widow and widows are wonderful things cheero all bindle turned and left the room his niece millie following him out into the passage uncle joe she said clutching hold of his coat sleeve you will be careful won't you then with a little catch in her voice she added you know you are the only uncle joe i've got and bindle went out into the night where the guns thundered and the shrapnel burst in sinister white stabs in the sky whilst over all brooded the great queen of the heavens bathing in her white peace the red war of pygmies two two hours later bindle's ring at the hearty's bell was answered by millie oh uncle joe she cried joyfully i'm so glad you're back safe hasn't it been dreadful her lower lip quivered a little you ain't been frightened millikins have you inquired bindle solicitously a soldier's wife isn't afraid uncle joe she replied bravely millie's sweetheart charlie dixon was at the front my ain't we gettin a woman millikins cried bindle putting his arm affectionately around her shoulders and kissing her cheek loudly everybody all right he inquired yes i think so uncle joe but she squeezed his arm i'm so glad you're back i've been thinking of you all the time every time there was a big bang i i wondered well well interrupted bindle we ain't going to be downhearted are we it's over now you'll hear the all clear in a few minutes bindle walked into the hearty's parlour where mrs hearty was seated on the sofa half asleep hello martha he cried ah joe she said i'm glad you're back i'm afraid there's been a lot of her breath failed her and she broke off into a wheeze bindle looked about him curiously hello what's happened to them three little cherubs he inquired mrs hardy began to shake and wheeze with laughter and millie stood looking at bindle what's happened millikins he inquired done a bunk have they they're they're in the potato cellar uncle joe said millie without the ghost of a smile somehow it seemed to her almost like a reflection on her own courage that her father and aunt should have thought only of their personal safety bindle slapped his leg with keen enjoyment well i'm blowed he cried if that ain't rich three people what was talkin about puttin their trust in god a goin into that little funk hole well i'm blowed don't laugh uncle joe began millie i i she broke off unable to express what was in her mind don't you worry millikins he replied as he moved towards the door i better go and tell em that it's all right mr hardy's potato cellar was reached through a trap door flush with the door of the shop with the aid of an electric torch bindle looked about him his eyes fell on a large pair of scales on which were weights up to seven pounds this gave him an idea carefully placing a box beside the trap door he lifted the scales and weights in his arms and with great caution mounted on to the top of the box suddenly he let the scales and weights fall with a tremendous crash full in the centre of the trap door at the same time giving vent to a shout millie came running in from the parlour oh uncle joe what has happened she cried are you hurt it's all right millikins knocked over these ere scales i did ain't i clumsy ush moans and cries could be distinctly heard from below ere help me gather em up millikins i hope i haven't broken the scales having replaced the scales and weights on the counter bindle proceeded to pull up the trap door all clear he shouted cheerily there was no response only a moaning from the extreme corner of the cellar ere come along arty what do you two mean by taking my missus down into a cellar like that is it gone quavered a voice that bindle assumed must be that of mr gupperduck is what gone he inquired the bomb whispered the voice oh come up gupperduck said bindle don't play the giddy goat in the potato cellar what about you putting your trust in god there was a sound of movement below a few moments later mr gupperduck's face appeared within the radius of light he had lost his spectacles and his upper set of false teeth his hair was awry and his face distorted with fear he climbed laboriously up the steps leading to the shop he was followed by mr hearty literally yellow with terror what have you done with my missus demanded bindle she she she's down there stuttered mr gupperduck then you two jolly well go down and fetch her up or i'll kick you down cried bindle angrily 
nice sort of sports you are leaving a woman alone in an old like that after taking her down there mr hardy and mr gupperduck looked at bindle and then at each other slowly they turned and descended the ladder again for some minutes they could be heard moving about below then mr hardy appeared with mrs bindle's limp form clasped round the waist whilst mr gupperduck pushed from behind for one moment a grin flitted across bindle's features then seeing mrs bindle's pathetic plight his manner changed here millikins get some water he cried your aunt lizzie's fainted between them they half carried half dragged mrs bindle into the parlour where she was laid upon the sofa vacated by mrs hardy her hands were chafed water dabbed upon her forehead and a piece of brown paper burned under her nose by mrs hardy she had not lost consciousness but stared about her in a vague half-dazed fashion mr hardy and mr gupperduck who had retrieved his false teeth seemed thoroughly ashamed of themselves it was mr hearty who suggested that mrs bindle should spend the night with them as she was not in a fit condition to go home as he spoke the all-clear signal rang out joyfully upon the stillness without two long drawn-out notes that told of another twenty-four hours of safety mr gupperduck straightened himself mr hearty seemed to revive and from mrs bindle's eyes fled the expression of fear well i must be orf said bindle look after my missus hearty you come along mr g he inquired of mr gupperduck as followed by millie he left the room it was sweet of you not to laugh at them uncle joe said millie as they stood at the door waiting for mr gupperduck nobody didn't ought to mind saying they're afraid millikins said bindle looking at the serious face before him but i don't like a cove what says he's brave and then turns out to have about as much art as a shillin rabbit come along mr g good night millikins my dear are we downhearted no and bindle went out into the night followed by a meek and chastened mr gupperduck end of chapter three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter four of the adventures of bindle by herbert jenkins this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Four: The Duplication of Mister Hearty. You've never been a real husband to me," burst out Missus Bindle stormily. Bindle did not even raise his eyes from his favorite dish of stewed steak and onions. Cold mutton," he had once remarked to his friend Ginger, "means peace because I don't like it. The mutton, I mean." but stewed steak and onions means an ell of a row mrs b ain't able to see me enjoying myself but what she thinks i'm being rude to god bindle continued his meal in silent expectation look at you continued mrs bindle look at you now bindle still declined to be drawn into a discussion look at mr hearty mrs bindle uttered her challenge with the air of one who plays the ace of trumps with great deliberation bindle wiped the last remaining vestige of gravy from his plate with a piece of bread which he placed in his mouth with a sigh he leaned back in his chair personally myself he remarked calmly i'd rather not rather not what snapped mrs bindle look at arty was the response you might look at worse men than him flashed mrs bindle with rising wrath i might replied bindle and then again i might not look how he's got on challenged mrs bindle after a few moments of silence bindle remarked more to himself than to mrs bindle god made me and god made arty but in one of us he made a bloomer if i'm right arty's wrong if arty's right i'm wrong if they have me in heaven they won't want arty and if arty gets in well they won't look at me mrs bindle proceeded to gather up the plates thank you for that stew said bindle as he tilted back his chair contentedly you should thank god not me was the ungracious retort for a moment bindle appeared to ponder the remark somehow he said at length i don't think i should like to thank god for stewed steak and onions and he drew his pipe from his pocket and began to charge it don't start smoking snapped mrs bindle rising from the chair and going over to the stove bindle looked up with interested inquiry on his features there's an apple pudding continued mrs bindle 
Bindle pocketed his pipe with a happy expression on his features. Lizzie, he said, how could you treat me like this? What's the matter now? demanded Mrs. Bindle. An apple puddin' a waitin' to be eaten, and you let me waste time a talkin' about Artie's looks? It ain't kind of you, Lizzie. It ain't, really. Mrs. Bindle's sole response was a series of bangs as she proceeded to turn out the apple pudding. Bindle ate and ate generously. When he had finished, he pushed the plate from him and once more produced his pipe from his pocket. Mrs. B., he said, you may be a Christian, but you're a damn fine cook. Don't use such language to me, was the response, uttered a little less ungraciously than her previous remarks. It's all right, Mrs. B., don't you worry. They ain't a goin' to charge that there dam up against you. You're too nervous about the devil, you are. Bindle struck a match and sucked at his pipe. He's going to open another shop, said Mrs. Bindle. Oh, the devil? inquired Bindle in surprise. It's going to be in Putney High Street, continued Mrs. Bindle, ignoring Bindle's remark. Bindle looked up at her with genuine puzzlement on his features. Putney High Street used to be a pretty hot place at night before the war, he remarked. It ain't exactly cool now, but I never thought of the devil opening a shop there. I said Mr. Harty, retorted Mrs. Bindle angrily. Oh, Harty, said Bindle contemptuously. Harty'd open anything except his art or a barrel of apples he's sellin' knowin' em to be rotten. What's he want to open another shop for? He's got two already, ain't he? why haven't you got on stormed mrs bindle inconsequently why haven't you got three shops well continued bindle i might have done so but what should i sell in em you never got on you lost every job you ever got you'd have lost me long ago if no remarked bindle with solemn conviction as he rose and took his cap from behind the door you ain't the sort of woman what's lost mrs b you're one of them what's found like the little lamb that old woe and whiskers talked about when i went to chapel with you that night so long the news about mr hearty's third venture in the green grocery trade occupied bindle's mind to the exclusion of all else as he walked in the direction of chelsea to call upon dr richard little whom he had met in connection with the temperance fate fiasco at barton bridge he winked at only three girls and passed two remarks to carmen and one to a bus conductor who was holding on rather unnecessarily to the arm of a pretty girl he found a dick little at home and with him his brother tom and guggers now a captain in the gordons hello here's j b gug gug good cried guggers hurling his fourteen stone towards the diminutive visitor blessed if it ain't old spit and speak in petticoats cried bindle i'm glad to see you sir that i am and he shook guggers warmly by the hand guggers as he was known at oxford on account of his inability to pronounce a g without a preliminary gug gug had taken a prominent part in the oxford rag when bindle posed as the millionaire uncle of an unpopular undergraduate bindle had christened him spit and speak owing to gutter's habit of salivating his words when the men were seated and bindle was puffing furiously at a big cigar he explained the cause of his visit i ain't appy sir he said to dick little and although the im says ere we suffered grief and woe i don't say we got to suffer grief and woe and arty altogether what's up j b inquired dick little well if the truth got to be told sir i got arty in the throat got what inquired tom little grinning arty my brother-in-law arty i ad him thrust down my throat to-night with stewed steak and onions and apple puddin the stewed steak and the puddin slipped down all right but arty stuck what's he been up to now inquired dick little he's going to open another shop in putney high street that's number three arty with two shops give me l but with three shops it'll be l and blazes gug gug gave you hell interrogated guggers mrs b explained bindle laconically then after a pause he added no matter what's wrong at home if the pipes burst through frost or the butcher's late with the meat or if it's a six-penny milkman instead of a five-penny milkman mrs b always seems to think it's through me not being like arty as if any man would be like arty what could be like something else even if it was a conchy no continued bindle something's got to be done that's why i come round this evening can't we gug gug get up a rag inquired guggers 
if i g -g go back to france without a rag we shall never beat the huns for a few minutes the four men continued to smoke dick little meditatively bindle furiously it was bindle who broke the silence you may think i got a down on arty sir he said addressing dick little well perhaps i have but evan's sometimes a little late in punishing people and i ain't above lending an hand arty's afraid of me cause he's afraid of what i might say knowing what i know with this enigmatical utterance bindle buried his face in the tankard that was always kept for him at dick little's flat we might of course celebrate the occasion murmured dick little meditatively good good great scott cried guggers we will good 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 old dick he brought a heavy hand down on dick little's shoulder blade out with it for the next hour the four men conferred together and by the time bindle found it necessary to return to his little grey home in the west the success of mr hearty's third shop was assured that is its advertisement was assured it'll cost an ell of a lot of money said bindle doubtfully as he rose to go 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 get out cried guggers whose income was an affair of five figures for a rag like that i g g give my my not your trousers sir interrupted bindle gazing down at guggers brawny knees remember you gone into short clothes wouldn't do for me to go about like that he added me with my various veins and bindle left dick little's flat rich in the knowledge he possessed of coming events Two anyhow remarked bindle as he stood in front of the looking-glass over the kitchen mantelpiece adjusting his special constable's cap at a suitable angle anyhow arty's got a fine day mrs bindle sniffed and banged a vegetable dish on the dresser she appeared to possess an almost uncanny judgment as to how much banging a utensil would stand without breaking now continued bindle philosophically it's a fine day the sun's shinin people comin out wantin to buy vegetables yet i'll bet my whistle to his old stock that arty ain't happy we're not here to be happy snapped mrs bindle it ain't always easy to see why some of us is here at all remarked bindle as he gave his cap a further twist over to the right in an endeavour to get a real sir david Beatty touch to his appearance we're here to do the lord's work said mrs bindle sententiously but do you mean to tell me that god made arty specially to sell vegetables in with a face like that questioned bindle mrs bindle's reply was in bangs sometimes bindle's literalness was disconcerting did god make me to move furniture he persisted no mrs b he continued it's more than likely that god just puts us down here and lets us sort ourselves out him up there a-watchin to see how we does it you're a child of moloch joseph bindle said mrs bindle a child of what luck inquired bindle who's e oh go along with you don't bother me i'm busy cried mrs bindle i promised mr hearty i'd be round at two o'clock now ain't that just like a woman complained bindle to a fly-catcher hanging from the gas bracket ain't that just like a woman if you're too busy to tell me why i'm a child of old what o'clock why ain't you too busy to tell me that i'm a child of old what o'clock and with this profound inquiry bindle slipped out assuring mrs bindle that he would see her some time during the afternoon as he was to be on duty in putney high street to see that no one ere don't pinch arty's veggies ten minutes later bindle stood in front of mr hearty's new shop aided in his scrutiny by two women and three boys there ain't no denying the fact murmured bindle to himself that arty do do the thing in style if only his art wasn't what it is and if his face was what it might be he'd make a damn fine brother-in-law at that moment mr hearty appeared at the door of the shop bowing out a lady customer obviously someone of importance to judge by the obsequious manner in which he rubbed his hands and bent his head cheerio arty cried bindle mr hearty started and looked around the three errand boys and the two women looked round also and fixed their gaze on bindle mr hearty devoted himself more assiduously to his customer pretending not to have heard i'll run in about six arty and have a look around continued bindle i'm on duty till then i'll see they don't pinch your stock and he walked slowly down the high street in the direction of the bridge followed by the grins and gazes of the errand boys mr hardy's new shop was without doubt the best of the three a study in green paint and brasswork it was capable of holding its own with the best shops in the west end 
in the window was a magnificent array of fruits outside were the vegetables everything was ticketed in plain figures figures that were the envy and despair of other putney green grocers it was mr hearty's hour as bindle promenaded the high street his manner was one of expectancy twice he looked at his watch and when walking in the direction of putney hill he would turn and cast backward glances along the high street during his second perambulation he encountered mrs bindle hurrying in the direction of mr hardy's new shop he accorded her a salute that would have warmed the heart of a chief commissioner of the police meanwhile mr hearty was gazing lovingly at the curved double brass rail that adorned his window looking like a harvest festival decoration mr hearty believed in appearances he would buy persimmons lychees breadfruit and custard apples not because he thought he could sell them but because they gave tone to his shop those who had not heard of persimmons and lychees were impressed because mr hearty was telling them something they did not know those who had heard of possibly eaten them were equally impressed because he was reminding them of regent street in piccadilly as bindle phrased it mr hearty was a damn good greengrocer mr hearty was interrupted in his contemplation of the fruity splendour of his genius by the entry of a customer at least something had come between him and the light of the sun he turned started violently and stared then he blinked his eyes and stared again a man had entered wearing a silk-faced frock-coat of dubious fit and doubtful age a turned-down collar a white tie and trousers that concertinaed over large ill-shaped boots on his head was a black felt hat semi-clerical in type insured against any sudden vagary of the wind by a hat guard mr hearty gazed at the man his eyes dilated in astonishment he stared at the stranger's sunken sallow cheeks at his heavy moustache at his mutton-chop whiskers the man was his double features expression clothes all were the same hello hearty put me down for a cocker nut and an onion bindle who had entered at the moment dug the stranger in the ribs from behind he turned round upon his assailant then bindle saw mr hearty standing in the shadow he looked from him to the stranger and back again with grave intentness both men regarded bindle good afternoon joseph said mr hearty at length in his toneless voice that always seemed to come from somewhere in the woolly distance good afternoon joseph said the stranger in a voice that was a very clever imitation of that of mr hearty bindle fumbled in the breast pocket of his tunic and produced a box of matches going up to mr hearty he struck a match mr hearty started back as if doubtful of his intentions bindle proceeded to examine mr hearty's features by the flickering light of the match then turning to the stranger he went through the same performance with him finally pushing his cap back he scratched his head in perplexity well i'm damned he ejaculated two arties i want a cauliflower please it was the stranger who spoke bindle once more proceeded to regard the stranger critically i suppose you're what they call an alibi he remarked the stranger had no time to reply as at that moment another man entered in garb and appearance he was a replica of the first mr hardy looked as a man might who without previous experience of alcohol has just drunk a whole bottle of whisky bindle whistled grinned then he smacked his leg vigorously my cauliflower please said the first man good afternoon joseph said the new arrival the voice was not so good an imitation at that moment smith mr hardy's right-hand man thrust his head through the flap in the door of the shop that gave access to the potato cellar he caught sight of the trinity of masters he gave one frightened glance ducked his head and let the flap down with a bang just as a third mr hearty entered he was followed almost immediately by a fourth and fifth each greeted bindle with a good afternoon joseph just as the sixth mr hearty entered smith pushed up the flap again this time a few inches only and with dilated eyes looked out the sight of seven masters as he afterwards confessed to billy nips the errand boy shook him up cruel keeping his eyes fixed warily upon the group of men each demanding a cauliflower smith slowly drew himself up and out letting the cellar flap down with a bang as he slipped to the back of the shop away from the group was he drunk or only dreaming i woke up with one brother-in-law now i got seven cried bindle as he walked over and opened the glass door with white lace curtains tied back with blue ribbon at the back of the shop 
martha he shouted martha you're wanted an indistinct sound was heard and a minute later mrs hardy appeared enormously fat and wheezing painfully that you joe she panted as she struck her ample bosom with clenched hand my breath it's that bad to-day for a moment she stood blinking in the sunlight see em martha ejaculated bindle pointing to mr hardy and the alibis seven of em you're a bigamist sure as eggs martha and millie ain't never going to be an orphan as she became accustomed to the glare of the sunlight mrs hardy looked in a dazed way at the group of husbands all gazing in her direction then she suddenly began to shake and wheeze it took very little to make mrs hardy laugh sometimes nothing at all now she sat down suddenly on a sack of potatoes and heaved and shook with silent laughter suddenly mr hardy became galvanized into action how dare you he fumed get out of my shop confound you arty arty protested bindle fancy you a using language like that i'm surprised at you mr hardy looked about him like a caged animal then suddenly he turned to bindle joseph he cried i give these men in charge the men regarded mr hardy with melancholy unconcern give him in charge repeated bindle in surprise what for they're they're like me stammered mr hardy in a rage that with a man of more robust nature must have found vent in physical violence well remarked bindle judicially i can't run a cove in for being like you arty although he added as an afterthought he ought to be in quad it's a scandal stuttered mr hardy it's a uh he broke off words were mild things to express his state of indignation turning to bindle he cried joseph turn them out of my shop in in the name of the law he added melodramatically you air sonnies remarked bindle turning to the passive six op it although he added meditatively as he eyed the six duplicates what i'm to do with you if you won't go only evan knows and evan don't confide in me the six figures themselves settled bindle's problem by marching solemnly out of the shop each with a good afternoon joseph joseph what is the meaning of this demanded mr hearty turning to bindle as the last black-coated figure left the shop what is the meaning of this you may search me arty replied bindle well, i should have called them twins if there hadn't been so many sort of litter wasn't it oh they're all respectable or there'll be trouble for you arty you'd better wear a bit of ribbon round your arm so as we shall know you bindle you're at the bottom of this mrs bindle had come out of the back parlour just as the duplicates were leaving she regarded her husband with a suspicion that amounted to certainty me queried bindle innocently me at the bottom of what you know something about these men it's a shame and this mr hearty's first day look how it's upset him now how do you think i could make six alibis like them bindle's defence was interrupted by the sound of music well i'm blowed he exclaimed if it ain't them alibis the doubles had all produced tin whistles which they were playing as they marched slowly up and down in front of mr hearty's premises five seemed to have selected each his own hymn without consultation with his fellows the sixth probably a secularist had fallen back upon the men of harlech a crowd was already gathering mr hardy looked about him like a hunted rat he rushed to the shop door desperation in his eyes violence in his mind before he had an opportunity of coming to a decision as to his course of action a new situation arose that distracted his thoughts from the unspeakable alibis End of chapter 4 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Chapter 5 of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter 5 The Gathering of the Bands from the direction of putney bridge a large crowd was approaching people were leaning over the sides of omnibuses staring out of the windows of trams boys were whistling and exchanging comments the purport of which mr hardy could not quite catch in this new excitement he forgot the alibis who gradually became absorbed in the growing throng that collected outside the shop mr hardy gazed at the approaching multitude misgiving in his soul he caught a glimpse of what looked like a pineapple walking in the midst of the crowd next he saw a carrot then an orange 
he turned away blinked his eyes and looked again this time he saw moving in his direction an enormous bean followed by a potato yes there was no doubt about it fruit and vegetables were walking up putney high street as he came nearer he saw that each vegetable was leading a donkey on whose back were two boards meeting at the top thus forming a triangle the base of which was strapped to the animal's back people were pointing to the boards and laughing mr hearty could not see what was written on them the sensation was terrific a group of small boys who had run on ahead took up a position near the door of mr hearty's shop that's him cried one that's napoleon no it ain't said another that's caesar mechanically mr hearty waved the boys away they repeated words that to him were meaningless and then pointed to the approaching crowd mr hearty was puzzled and alarmed look governor there they are shouted one of the boys instinctively mr hearty looked at first he beheld only the donkeys the animated fruit and the approaching crowd then he suddenly saw his own name a motor omnibus intervened a moment later the donkeys and their boards came into full view mr hardy gasped on their boards were ingenious exhortations to the public to support the enterprise of alfred hardy greengrocer of putney fulham and wandsworth mr hardy read as one in a dream alfred hardy the napoleon of greengrocers alfred hardy the caesar of fruiterers alfred hardy the prince of potato merchants hardy's two shilling pineapple try it in your bath hardy's jerusalem artichokes general allenby eats them the germans fight for hardy's brussels sprouts as the six animals filed past mr hardy was conscious that hundreds of eyes were gazing in his direction he read one sign after another as if hypnotized then he read them again scarcely had the donkeys passed him when the pineapple swung round leading his donkey the others immediately followed as they came back on the other side of the way that nearest to mr hardy he had the benefit of reading further details about the wonderful properties of the fruit and vegetables he retailed the second set of exhortations to the housewives of putney ran eat hardy's filberts o gilbert the nut nut crackers with every bag hardy's french beans saved verdun try hardy's juicy cabbages they cure baldness the food controller recommends carrots try hardy's i have alfred hardy known as pineapple alf if you don't buy your vegetables from alfred hardy you will be what i am the last named was particularly appreciated everybody being able to see the joke and thinking that no one else had been so clever each took infinite pains to point it out to his neighbor at first mr hearty went very white then realizing that the crowd was laughing at him and that he was being rendered ridiculous he flushed crimson turning round he walked into the shop there was a feeling in his throat and eyes that reminded him of what he had felt as a child after a storm of crying his brain seemed deadened from out the general hum he heard a boy's shrill voice inquiring the whereabouts of his mate and the mate's reply was heard in the distance suddenly a new sensation dwarfed that of the donkeys here's another here's another yelled a shrill voice the crowd looked up the high street towards the bridge with stately lope a camel was pursuing its majestic way on its back was an enormous watermelon through which appeared the head of the driver shaded by leaves a double stock concealing his legs from the shelter of the double brass rail mr hardy watched the camel as if fascinated the donkeys had come to a standstill outside the shop behind him stood mrs bindle and smith the one very grim the other grinning expansively whilst from the gloom behind mrs hearty was heard wheezing and demanding what it was all about with stately and indifferent tread the camel approached with head poised rather like a snake about to strike slung over its back on each side were notices the one hearty first saw read i've got the hump through not buying hardy's vegetables as the beast swung round the other motto presented itself eat hardy's leeks they defy the plumber cheers catcalls loud whistlings and the talk of an eager excited saturday afternoon crowd formed a background to the picture well i'm blowed muttered bindle who had read the notices with keen relish 
well i'm blowed they done it in style the excitement was at its height when the steady pounding of a drum was heard in the distance as it drew nearer the attention of the crowd was attracted from the donkeys and the camel putney was in luck and it looked gratefully in the direction of where mr hardy stood a shadowy form behind his double brass rail bindle recognized the tune the band was playing as that of mr hardy's favourite hymn pull for the shore sailor as the band entered the high street another was heard in the opposite direction bindle turned into the shop and walked up to his brother-in-law who still stood staring at the strange and curious beasts that were advertising his wares look here arty he said in his most official manner this may be all very well in the way of business but you're blocking the old bloomin high street mr hardy gazed at bindle with unseeing eyes these bands yours too arty bindle inquired mr hardy shook his head in hopeless negation nothing was his not even the power to move and rout this scandalous zoological botanical exhibition well what are they a-playin hymns for demanded bindle hymns inquired mr hearty in a toneless voice yes can't you hear em bindle gazed at his brother-in-law curiously enough to blow your head orf the first band was now blaring out its pull for the shore sailor with full force at its head walked a man carrying a representation of a cabbage on which was painted hearty for cabbages the bandsmen wore strangely nondescript clothes with one exception they all seemed to possess the uniform cap that exception was a man in khaki four of them had caps without tunics only one had the full regulation uniform but he was wearing odd boots the bandmaster in a braided frock coat which reached well below his knees was spasmodically putting in bits on a cornet he was short of stature with a constricted wind and the pace was fast the second band approached the man at its head bearing a carrot with a similar legend as that of the rival concern but in relation to carrots onward christian soldiers was its melody the noise became diabolical the second band had uniform caps only and two of its members had taken off their coats and hung them over their shoulders it was a hot and tiring day at the moment when the second band was within a hundred yards of the shop the camel raised its head and gave vent to its terrifying roar a rather indifferent attempt to imitate that of a lion the onward christian soldiers band was the first to reach the shop having a shorter distance to traverse its leader was a tall man with a weary face and a still more weary moustache his waistcoat was unbuttoned and his face dripping with perspiration as he blew out what brains he possessed upon a silver cornet he marched straight up to the door of the shop blowing vigorously suddenly a double beat of the drum gave the signal to stop taking off his cap with the back of his hand he wiped the sweat from his brow pushing past mr hearty he entered a moment after followed by his eleven confreres for a moment mr hearty stared then he retreated backwards before the avalanche of musicians what do you want he demanded feebly this way upstairs governor inquired the tall man upstairs interrogated mr hearty yes upstairs like me to say it again queried the man who was tired and short-tempered but what began mr hearty oh go and roast yourself responded the man come along boys and they tramped through the back parlour mr hearty heard them pounding up the stairs the drum however refused to go through the narrow door the drummer tried it at every conceivable angle at last he recognized that he had met his waterloo yi charlie he yelled hello that you ted came the reply from above ruddy drum stuck yelled the drummer equally hot and exasperated what bawled charlie ruddy drum won't go up cried ted all right you stay down there you can hear us and keep time was the response the drummer subsided on to a sack of potatoes mr hearty approached him what are you doing here you're not my band he said eyeing the man apprehensively the drummer looked up with the insolence of a man who sees before him indecision. "'Oh, the blinkin' buttercup said we was,' he demanded. "'But what are you doing here?' persisted Mr. Hardy. "'Oh,' responded the man with elaborate civility, "'we come to play forfeits. What you think?' At that moment, from the room above the shop, the band broke into full blast with, "'Shall we gather at the river?' The drummer made a grab at his sticks, but was late and for the rest of the piece was a beat behind in all his bangs mr hardy looked helplessly about him 
Another cheer from without caused him to walk to the door. Outside, the pull for the shore sailor faction was performing valiantly. Their blood was up, and they were determined that no one should gather at the river if they could prevent it. In the distance, several more bands were heard, and the pounding became terrific. All traffic had been stopped, and an inspector of police was pushing his way through the crowd in the direction of Mr. Hardy. Bindle joined the inspector, saluting him elaborately. The inspector eyed Mr. Hardy with official disapproval. "'You must send these men away, sir,' he said with decision. "'But, but,' said Mr. Hardy, "'I can't.' "'But you must,' said the inspector. "'There will be a summons, of course,' he added warningly. "'But why?' protested Mr. Hardy. The inspector looked at Mr. Hardy, and then gazed up and down Putney High Street. He was annoyed. "'You have blocked the whole place, sir. We've had to stop the trams coming round the Putney Bridge Road.' hi he shouted to the drummer who was conscientiously earning his salary stop that confounded row there the man did not hear stop it i say shouted the inspector the drummer stopped what's the matter he inquired you're causing an obstruction said the inspector warningly ted yelled the voice of the leader at the top of the house who was gathering at the river upon the cornet in a fine frenzy what the hell are you stopping for it's the police yelled back ted informatively the cheese bawled back charlie shouldn't eat it it always makes you ill go ahead and bang that ruddy drum the leader was evidently determined not to bandy words with his subordinate he could be heard pounding down the stairs two at a time still doing his utmost to interpret the pleasures awaiting putney in the hereafter the cornet could be heard approaching nearer and nearer becoming brassier and brassier the leader was a note behind the rest by the time he had got to the bottom of the stairs arrived in the shop he stopped suddenly at the sight of the inspector tell them to stop that infernal row ordered the officer he who had been addressed as charlie looked from mr hearty to the inspector there ain't no law that can stop me he said with decision i'm on the enclosed premises go ahead ted he commanded turning to the drummer take it out of her and resuming his cornet charlie picked up the tune and raced up the stairs again leaving ted taking it out of her in a way that more than made up for the time he had lost the inspector bit his lip turning to mr hearty he said you will be charged with causing obstruction with all this tomfoolery but but it isn't mine protested mr hearty weakly i know nothing about it nonsense said the inspector look at those animals out there Mr. Hardy looked, and then looked back at the inspector, who said something, but Mr. Hardy could only see the movement of his lips. The babble became almost incredible. Three more bands had arrived, making five altogether, and there was a sound in the distance that indicated the approach of others. For the first time in his life, Ted was experiencing the sweets of being able legally to defy the law, and he was enjoying to the full a novel experience at that moment mrs bindle pushed her way into the shop she had been out to get a better view of what was taking place she stopped and stared from mr hearty to the inspector and then back to mr hearty i i don't know what it means he stammered feeling that something was required of him but no one heard him bindle who had hitherto been quiet in the presence of his superior officer now took a hand in matters look here hearty he shouted during a lull in the proceedings advertisement's advertisement and very nice too but this here's obstruction ain't that right sir he said addressing the inspector but the inspector did not hear him it was doubtful if mr hardy heard for at that moment there had turned into the high street from wandsworth bridge road a double drummed band playing something with a slight resemblance to gospel bells a melody that gives a wonderful opportunity for the trombones there were now one band upstairs and five in the high street as near to the shop as they could muster and a seventh approaching all were striving to interpret moody and sankey as moody and sankey had never been interpreted before the inspector walked out on to the pavement and vainly strove to signal to two of his men whose helmets could be seen among the crowd mr hardy's eyes followed the officer but soon he became absorbed in other things from the wimbledon end of high street he saw bobbing about in the crowd a number of brilliant green caps with yellow braid upon them the glint of brass in their neighbourhood forewarned him that another band was approaching 
from the bobbing movement of the caps it was obvious that the men were fighting their way in the direction of his mr hardy's shop glancing in the other direction mr hearty saw a second stream of dark green and red caps likewise making for him when the leader of the green and yellow caps a good-natured little man carrying a cornet burst through the crowd it was like spring breaking in upon winter the brilliant green tunic with its yellow braid was dazzling in the sunlight and mr hearty blinked his eyes several times at day sir said the little man genially as he took off his cap and with the edge of his forefinger removed the sweat from his brow giving it a flick that sent some of the moisture on to mr hardy causing him to start back suddenly sorry sir said the man apologetically afraid i splashed you i suppose we go right through and up come along razor he yelled to the last of his bandsmen a thin weedy youth who was still vainly endeavouring to cut his way through the crowd suddenly the little man saw the first drummer banging away vigorously hello got another little lot inside you don't know f how to advertise mister he said admiringly this reminded mr hearty that he possessed a voice there is some mistake i have not ordered any band he shouted in the little man's ear what shouted the little man mr hearty repeated his assurance not ordered any band seem to have ordered all the bands in london as far as i can see he remarked looking at the rival concerns sort of crystal palace affair you ordered us anyhow he added but i didn't persisted mr hearty this is all a mistake oh ring orf said the leader people don't pay in advance for what they don't want come along boys he cried and pushing his way along the shop he passed through the parlour door and was heard thumping upstairs you can't get through shouted ted to the second drummer a mournful-looking man with black whiskers what he bawled dully can't get through yelled ted why roared the whiskered man ruddy drum won't go up shouted ted oh said the second drummer and without testing the accuracy of ted's words he seated himself upon a barrel of apples his drum still in position there was a sound of loud altercations from above after a minute they subsided and the volume of tone increased showing that charlie had found expression in his cornet where's striker came the cry striker yelled several voices hello howled striker in a muffled voice we're all ready what the hell are you doing striker came the response rum won't come up bawled striker what rum won't come up too big right oh you can pick us up came the leader's reply a moment later onward christian soldiers broke out in brassy rivalry to shall we gather at the river mrs hearty and mrs bindle fled into the parlour it is obvious that whatever phenomenon eternity may have to discover to man it will not be christian soldiers gathering at the river the noise was stupendous the stream of brassy discord that descended from above was equalled only by the pounding of the two drums that rose from below ted had made some reflections upon the whiskers of the second drummer with the result that forgetting their respective bands they were now engaged in a personal contest thumping and pounding against each other with both sticks the sweat poured down their faces and their mouths were working each expressing opinions which however the other could not hear at that moment the dark green caps with red braid began to trickle into the shop bindle who had been a delighted spectator of the arrival of band after band suggested to the leader of the eighth band in a roar that just penetrated to the drum of his ear hadn't you better start here there ain't no room upstairs the man gave a comprehensive look around then by signs indicated to his men that they were to start then and there they promptly broke out into the last noel bindle ran from the shop his fingers in his ears oh my god they'll bring the old bloomin house down he muttered i hope they don't play ims in evan them drums mr hearty who had been pushed into a corner behind an apple barrel stood and gazed about him there was a dazed look in his eyes as of one who does not comprehend what is taking place he looked as if at any moment he might become a gibbering lunatic a wild cheer from the crowd attracted his attention he looked out pushing their way toward the shop was a number of vegetables a carrot a turnip a cabbage a tomato a cucumber a potato a marrow to name only a few each seemed to be on legs and was playing an instrument of some description was he mad could that really be a melon playing the drum 
did bananas play cornets could cucumbers draw music from piccolos mr hardy blinked his eyes here indeed was a dream a nightmare he saw bindle with an inspector and a constable turn the vegetables back obviously denying them admission he watched as one who has no personal interest in the affair he saw the inspector enter with three constables he saw the green and red band ejected ted and the whiskered man silenced charlie and the short genial man brought down protesting from upstairs he saw the inspector's busy pencil fly from side to side of his notebook he saw bindle grinning cheerfully as he exchanged remarks with the bandsmen he saw what looked like a never-ending procession of bandsmen stream past him he saw everything he believed nothing perhaps it was brain fever he had worked very hard over his new shop if he were to die smith could never carry on the three businesses what would become of them he further knew that his afternoon trade was ruined that he would probably be summoned for something that he had not done and tears came to his eyes in mr hardy's soul was nothing of the patience and long-suffering of the martyr behind him above him and in front of him he still seemed to hear the indescribable blare of brass outside were the cheers of the crowd and the vain endeavours of the police to grapple with the enormous problem that had been set them what could it all mean in the kitchen behind the parlour sat mrs hearty wheezing painfully opposite to her stood mrs bindle tight-lipped and grim that bindle's done this she muttered to herself it'll kill mr hearty end of chapter five read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com chapter six of the adventures of bindle by herbert jenkins this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter six mr gupperduck's mishap i've been out all day waiting in queues remarked mrs bindle complainingly and all i got was two candles and a quarter of a pound of margarine and which are we going to have for breakfast to-morrow inquired bindle cheerfully yes a lot you care retorted mrs bindle coming home regular to your meals and expecting them to be ready and then sitting down and eating a lot you care she repeated what you want to take a lodger for demanded bindle if you can't get food enough for you and me doesn't his money help us pay our way demanded mrs bindle but what's the good of avin more money mrs b if you can't get enough food to go round that's right go on stormed mrs bindle a lot of sympathy i get from you a lot you care about me walking myself off my feet so long as your stomach's full bindle scratched his head in perplexity but forbore to retort instead he hummed mrs bindle's favourite hymn gospel bells look what you done to mr hearty that saturday cried mrs bindle me said bindle cursing himself for reminding her by humming the hymn yes you was the reply he had to go to the police court well it's made his fortune and he got orf replied bindle yes but it might have ruined him you wouldn't have cared and in war time too mrs bindle added well well the war'll be over some day said bindle cheerfully that's what you always say why don't they make peace demanded mrs bindle as if bindle himself were the sole obstacle to the tranquillization of the world mrs bindle sat down with a decisiveness that characterized all of her movements sometimes i wish i was dead she remarked there's nothing but inching and pinching and slaving my fingers to the bone trying to make a shilling go further than it will and yet they won't make peace mrs b remarked bindle you best keep to cookin you're a dab at that and leave politics to them what understands them you can't catch a mad dog by putting salt on his tail i wonder where old guppy is he continued glancing at the kitchen clock which pointed to half past nine it ain't often he lets prayin get in the way of his meals i hope nothing has happened to him remarked mrs bindle a little anxiously no fear of that replied bindle regretfully things don't happen to men like gupperduck still it's funny him missin a meal he said at a quarter to ten mrs bindle reluctantly acquiesced in bindle's demand for supper 
she was clearly anxious listening intently for the familiar sound of mr gupperduck's key in the outer door i wonder what could have happened she said as the clock indicated a quarter past ten and she rose to clear away perhaps he's been took up to evan like that cove what artie was talking about the other night suggested bindle mrs bindle's sniff intimated that she considered such a remark unworthy of her attention Ah, oh, king richard is hisself again remarked bindle pushing his plate from him throwing himself back in his chair and proceeding to fill his pipe indifferent as to what happened to the lodger mrs bindle busied herself in putting mr gupperduck's supper in the oven to keep warm funny sort of job for a man to take up remarked bindle conversationally as he lighted his pipe preaching at people what only laughs back oh you think so do you snapped mrs bindle i was listening to em one afternoon in regent's park remarked bindle silly sort of lot they seem to me you're nothing but a heathen yourself accused mrs bindle as long as a cove keeps his religion to himself i don't see it matters to nobody what he thinks any more than whether he wears blue or pink pants under his trousers don't be disgusting bindle snapped mrs bindle disgusting what's disgusting talking of what you talked of replied mrs bindle with asperity well i'm blowed said bindle there you angs em on the line and mondays for everybody to see and yet you mustn't talk about em well i'm blowed he repeated what do they say in the park questioned mrs bindle curiously oh they says a lot of things replied bindle personally myself i think the atheists is the funniest there was one cove there what was very thin and very anxious looking said he wouldn't insult his intelligence by believing the things what preachers said so i put a question to him what did you say inquired mrs bindle i asks him if he was quite sure he had any intelligence to insult and that made him laugh mrs bindle nodded her head in approval bindle regarded her in wide-eyed amazement never before in the whole of his experience had he known her approve word or action of his did he say anything else queried mrs bindle no he soon got down and another cove got up then they started a christian meeting next door and there was them two lots of people shouting all sorts of things at each other what god must have thought of it all does me why can't they stay at home and pray if they feel as bad as all that a day a month at home to blow orf instead of going into regent's park a kicking up a row so as you can't ear the birds sing makes you feel ashamed to being a man it does one chap got up and said he was going to prove there wasn't no god and what did he say asked mrs bindle with interest all he could say was that him and his friends had searched everywhere through what they called the whole physical world and they hadn't found him therefore there wasn't no god they didn't ought to allow it commented mrs bindle indignantly then another cove got up and said he hoped that his friend what had just got down had proved to the whole park that there wasn't no god and if there was any thinking different would they hold up their hands did anybody hold up their hands asked mrs bindle yes up went my little and like a whiz bang announced bindle mrs bindle gave bindle a look that she usually reserved for mr hearty well sir says he looking at me what is your question well says i will you and your pals come round with me to-morrow morning and try and enlist there was a rare lot of khaki boys round there and didn't they raise a yell that was the end of that meeting every time anyone tried to get up and speak them khaki boys started a ootin and a callin out and avin a rare old time there was one cove what made us laugh fit to die every time one of the atheists started talking he said in a high-pitched voice oh cuthbert don't as if it was a gal what was being squeezed mrs bindle had listened to bindle with the nearest approach to approval that she had ever shown there was another cove there continued bindle warming to his subject funny little feller he was too all cap and overcoat talking about the judgment day awful things he promised us he did made out as if god was worse than an un he said he'd be standing beside god when all the people was judged and he'd tell em how he'd been in regent's park a warnin people what was going to happen and no one wouldn't take no notice then we was all going to be sent into a sort of mixed grill and burnt forever nice comfortin little cove he was pleasant to live with added bindle dryly 
why religion can't make you happy without you a tryin to make other people unhappy is what does me when i got a good cigar i don't go wavin it in the face of every cove i meet sayin ah oh, you ain't got a cigar like this you only got a woodbine don't seem good natured it don't we've got to save souls remarked mrs bindle with grim decision but didn't a man ought to be good because he wants to be good and not because he's afraid of being bad demanded bindle mrs bindle pondered over this remark for a moment but finding it too deep for her replied you always was a doubter bindle i'd been a happier woman if you hadn't been but continued bindle do you think god wants to have a man in chapel what wants to be at the empire only doesn't go cause he's afraid i wouldn't if i was god he added shaking his head with decision look at artie's horse on saturday nights can't ardly drag itself to the stables it can't yet ardy's as sure of heaven as i am of you mrs b mrs bindle was silent her manner was distrait she was listening for the sound of mr gupperduck's return i'd give my sugar ration to know what we're all a-goin to do in heaven remarked bindle meditatively fancy ardy there what will he do they won't let him sell vegetables and they'll soon stop him singing we shall all have our occupations remarked mrs bindle oracularly yes but what demanded bindle there ain't no furniture to move and no vegetables to sell all i can do is watch artie and see he doesn't go round pinchin angels meat tickets for once mrs bindle allowed a remark to pass without the inevitable accusation of blasphemy no remarked bindle if i dies and they sends me up to heaven i shall knock at the door and i shall say is artie here artie the fulham and putney greengrocer you know if they says yes then it's a smoker for me and bindle proceeded to recharge his pipe i often thought bindle was interrupted by a loud knocking at the outer door with a swift movement mrs bindle rose and passed out of the kitchen bindle listened there was a sound of men's voices in the outer passage with the short sharper tones of mrs bindle a moment later the door opened and two men entered supporting the limp form of mr gupperduck holy angels cried bindle starting up holy angels someone's been a tryin to alter him he bent forward to get a better view done it pretty well too he muttered as he gazed at the unprepossessing features of mr gupperduck now accentuated by a black eye a broken lip a contusion on the right cheekbone and one ear covered with blood his collar had disappeared also his hat and spectacles his waistcoat was torn open and various portions were missing from his coat what's he been doin inquired bindle of a weedy-looking man with long hair a sandy pointed beard and a cloth cap three sizes too large for him which rested on the tops of his ears what's he been up to he's been addressing a meeting replied the man in a mournful voice bindle turned once more to mr gupperduck and examined him closely looks as if the meetin's been addressing him don't it he remarked it was not a very successful meeting remarked the other supporter of mr gupperduck a very little man with a very long beard it wasn't a very successful meeting he repeated with conviction well i never seen a meetin make such alterations in a man in all my puff remarked bindle mrs bindle had busied herself in preparing a basin of hot water with which to wash the mud and blood from the victim's pallid face with closed eyes mr gupperduck continued to breathe heavily bindle with practical samaritanism went into the parlour and returned with a half quartern bottle pouring some of the contents into a glass he held it to mr gupperduck's lips without the least resistance the liquid was swallowed took that down pretty clean said bindle looking up at the man with the sandy beard don't do that cried mrs bindle turning suddenly her nostrils detecting the smell of alcohol do what inquired bindle from where he knelt beside the damaged mr gupperduck give him that said mrs bindle he's temperance well he ain't now remarked bindle with calm conviction oh you villain the vindictiveness of mrs bindle's tone caused the three listeners to look up and even mr gupperduck's eyelids after a preliminary flutter raised themselves as he gazed about him wonderingly where am i he moaned you're all right said mrs bindle taking bindle's place by mr gupperduck's side you're safe now mr gupperduck closed his eyes again and mrs bindle proceeded to wipe his face with a piece of flannel dipped in water poor old guppy murmured bindle they done it in style anyhow i wonder what he's been up to must have been saying things what they didn't like 
what was he talking about old sport bindle turned to the man with a sandy beard who was sitting on a chair leaning forward with one hand on each knee much as if he were watching a cockfight it was a peace meeting replied the man mournfully bindle gave vent to a prolonged whistle of understanding oh guppy guppy he cried why couldn't you have kept to the next world without getting mixed up with this it was wounded soldiers volunteered the man with the sandy beard wounded soldiers exclaimed bindle yes continued the man mournfully he appealed to them as sufferers under this terrible armageddon to pass a resolution condemning the continuance of the war and and they passed their resolution on his face suggested bindle the man nodded it was terrible he said terrible we were afraid they would kill him and where was you while all this was happening oh said the man i was fortunate enough to find a tree bindle looked him up and down with elaborate intentness then having satisfied himself as to every detail of his appearance and apparel he remarked ain't it wonderful what luck some coves do have i regard it as the direct interposition of providence said the man and i suppose you shinned up that tree like giddy o suggested bindle yes said the man i was brought up in the country was you now said bindle well it was lucky for you wasn't it the hand of god was the reply clearly the hand of god sort of boosted you up the tree from behind so as when they'd all gone you could come down and pick up what was left of him that it inquired bindle that's exactly what happened to my friend replied the man with the sandy beard and where did all this happen asked bindle it took place in hyde park replied the man a very rough meeting an extremely rough meeting and he was speaking so well so convincingly he added bindle looked at the man curiously to see if he were really serious but there was no vestige of a smile upon his face it's wonderful what a man can do with a crowd remarked bindle oracularly but turning to the inert figure of mr gupperduck it's still more wonderful what a crowd can do with a man bindle mrs bindle's voice rang out authoritatively here am i replied bindle obediently help us lift mr gupperduck on a chair with elaborate care they raised the inert form of mr gupperduck on to a chair his arms fell down limply beside him once he opened his eyes and looked round the room then sighing as if in thankfulness at being amongst friends he closed them again the lord hath given me rest from mine enemies he quoted mrs bindle and the two friends regarded mr gupperduck admiringly seeing that their friend and brother was now in safe hands mr gupperduck's two supporters prepared to withdraw mrs bindle pressed them to have something to eat but this they refused now ain't women funny muttered bindle as mrs bindle left the room to show her visitors to the door she was just complaining that she could only get two candles and a quarter of a pound of margarine and yet she wants them two coves to stay to supper hungry looking pair they was too i suppose it's what she calls hospitality he added seems to me damn silly like a hen fussing over a damaged chick mrs bindle ministered to the requirements of mr gupperduck she fed him with a spoon crooned over and sympathized with him in his misfortune whilst in her heart there was a great anger against those who had raised their hands against so godly a man when he had eventually been half led half carried upstairs by bindle and bindle himself had returned to the kitchen mrs bindle expressed her unambiguous opinion of a country that permitted such an outrage she likened mr gupperduck to those in the scriptures who had been stoned by the multitude she indicated that in the next world there would be a terrible retribution upon those who were responsible for the assault upon mr gupperduck she attacked the coalition government for not providing a more effective police force but protested bindle at length he was asking for it why can't he keep his opinions to himself and not go a-shovin em down other people's throats when they don't like the taste of em if you go trying to shove tripe down the throat of a cove what don't like tripe you're sure to get one in the eye that is if he's bigger than what you are if he's smaller he'll just be sick yet here are you a complainin because guppy gets himself hurt i don't understand because you haven't got a soul interrupted mrs bindle with conviction well remarked bindle philosophically i'd sooner have a flea than a soul there is flea powder but there ain't no soul powder what i've been able to find 
and bindle rose yawned and made towards the door end of chapter six read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter seven of the adventures of bindle by herbert jenkins this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter seven the courting of the reverend andrew mcfee mr hardy had never reconciled himself to the understanding that existed between his daughter millie and charlie dixon he resented bindle's share in the romance still more he resented the spirit of independence that it had developed in millie he had however been forced to bow to the storm every one was against him and millie herself had left home refusing to return until he had apologized to her for the most unseemly suggestion he had made as to her relations with charlie dixon sergeant charles dixon of the one hundred tenth service battalion london regiment had gone to the front and millie sad-eyed but grave looked forward to the time when he would return a v c well millikins bindle would cry ow's his nibs and millie would blush and tell of the latest news she had received from her lover uncle joe she would say i can't stand it but for you and there would be that in her voice which would cause bindle to turn his head aside and admonish himself as an old fool it's all right millikins bindle would say charlie's going to win the war and we're all going to be proud of him and millie would smile at her uncle with moist eyes and give that affectionate squeeze to his arm that bindle would not have parted with for the rubies of india you know uncle joe she said bravely on one occasion we women have to give up those we love bindle had not seen the plaintive humour of her remark but had suddenly become noisily engrossed in the use of his handkerchief mr hearty was almost cordial to charlie dixon on the eve of his going to france once this young man could be removed from millie's path the way would be clear for a match such as he had in mind he did not know exactly what sort of man he desired for his daughter but he was very definite as to the position in the world that his future son-in-law must occupy he would have preferred someone who had made his mark men of more mature years he had noticed were frequently favourably disposed towards young girls as wives and mr hardy was determined that he would be proud of his son-in-law that is to say his son-in-law was to be a man of whom any one might feel proud it would not behoove a christian such as mr hardy to wish a fellow being dead but he could not disguise himself from the fact that our casualties on the western front were heavy particularly during the period of offensives since the occasion when millie had asserted her independence and had declined to order her affections in accordance with mr hearty's wishes there had been something of an armed neutrality existing between father and daughter in this she had been supported not only by bindle and mrs hearty but by a strange freak of fate to a certain extent by mrs bindle herself mr hearty had never quite understood how it was that his sister-in-law had turned against him she had said nothing whatever as to where her sympathies lay but mr hardy instinctively felt that she had ranged herself on the side of the enemy but the fates were playing for mr hardy when the reverend mr sopley of the alton road chapel had decided to retire on account of failing health lady knob carrick determined to bring up from barton ridge her country residence the reverend andrew mcfee she had forgiven him his participation in the temperance fate fiasco accepting his explanation that he had been drugged by the disciples of the devil a view that would have been entirely endorsed by mrs bindle had she known that bindle was responsible for the mixing of alcohol with the lemonade the barton bridge temperance fate fiasco had proved the greatest sensation that the county had ever known the mixing of crude alcohol and distilled mead with the lemonade whereby the participants in the rustic fate had been intoxicated thus causing it to develop into a wild orgy of violence resulting in assaults upon lady knob carrick and the police had been a nine days wonder a number of arrests had been made but when the true facts came to the knowledge of the police the prisoners had been quietly released and officially nothing more was heard of the affair it was a long time before lady knob carrick could be persuaded to see in the rev andrew mcfee the minister of her chapel an innocent victim of a deep-laid plot it was he who had seized the hose that washed her out of her carriage 
it was he who had led the assault on the police it was he who had said things that had been the common talk of all the public house bars for miles around after mr mcfee's eloquent sermon upon the gadarene swine lady knob carrick had eventually come around and a peace had been patched up between them from that day it required more courage to whisper the words temperance fate in barton ridge than to charge across no man's land in france and so it was that the rev andrew mcfee transferred his activities from barton ridge to fulham he was grateful to providence for this sign of beneficent approval of his labours and relieved to know that barton ridge would in the future be but a memory there he had made history for in the bars of the two-faced earl and the blue fox the unbeliever drinks with gusto and a wink of superior knowledge a beverage known as lemon and a mac a compound of lemonade and gin which owes its origin to the part played in the historic temperance fate by the rev andrew mcfee one evening shortly after the departure of charlie dixon mrs bindle was busily engaged in laying the table for supper mrs bindle's kitchen was a model of what a kitchen should be everything was clean orderly neat the utensils over the mantelpiece shone like miniature moons the oilcloth was spotless the dresser scrubbed to a whiteness almost incredible in london the saucepans almost as clean outside as in the rug before the stove neatly pinned down at the corners it was obviously the kitchen of a woman to whom cleanliness and order were fetishes as bindle had once remarked there's only one spot in my missus kitchen and that's when i'm there as she proceeded with her work she hummed her favourite hymn it rose and fell sometimes dying away altogether she banged the various articles on the table as if to emphasize her thoughts her task completed she went to the sink as she was washing her hands there was a knock at the door taking no notice she proceeded to dry her hands the knock was repeated oh don't stand there playing the fool bindle she snapped i haven't time to the door opened slowly and admitted the tall lanky form of the reverend andrew mcfee it's me mrs bindle he said as he entered the room the outer door was open so i just came in oh i'm sorry sir said mrs bindle i thought it was bindle her whole manner underwent a change her uncompromising attitude of disapproval giving place to one of almost servile anxiety to make a good impression she hurriedly removed and folded her apron slipping it into the dresser drawer won't you come into the parlour sir she said it's very kind of you to call na na mrs bindle replied mr mcfee i just come in to to he hesitated but won't you sit down sir mrs bindle indicated a chair by the side of the table mr mcfee drew the chair towards him sitting bolt upright holding his soft felt hat upon his knees mrs bindle drew another chair from under the opposite side of the table and seated herself primly upon it with folded hands she waited for the minister to speak mr mcfee was obviously ill at ease he'll be comin' to the service the next mrs bindle he began oh yes sir responded mrs bindle moving her head back on her shoulders depressing her chin and drawing in her lips with a simper i wouldn't miss your address ay said mr mcfee gazing into the vacancy as if in search of inspiration finding none he repeated ay mr mcfee's expression was one of persistent gloom no smile was ever permitted to wanton across his sandy features after a few moments silence he made another effort i'm sair concerned mrs bindle he stopped wordless yes sir responded mrs bindle encouragingly i'm sair concerned no to see the wee lassie mort at the kirk who sir millie inquired mrs bindle in surprise ay responded mr mcfee the call of mammon is like the blast of a great trumpet and to the unbelieving it is as sweet music it is the call of satan mrs bindle the call of satan he repeated as if pleased with the phrase i'd na like the wee lassie to to i'll speak to mr hearty sir said mrs bindle compressing her lips it's very good of you sir i'm sure to na na interrupted mr mcfee hastily na na mrs bindle my duty it is the blessed duty of the shepherd to be concerned for the welfare he stopped suddenly the outer door had banged and there was the sound of steps coming along the passage bindle's voice was heard singing cheerily i'd rather kiss the mistress than the maid he opened the door and stopped singing suddenly for a moment he stood looking at the pair with keen enjoyment 
both mrs bindle and mr mcfee appeared self-conscious as they gazed obliquely at the interrupter hullo caught you said bindle jocosely bindle there was horror and anger in mrs bindle's voice mr mcfee merely looked uncomfortable he rose hastily i must be going mrs bindle he said then turning to bindle remarked i just come to inquire if mrs bindle was coming to chapel the nicht don't you fret about that sir said bindle genially she wouldn't miss a chance to pray and may we expect you mr bindle inquired mr mcfee by way of making conversation and preventing an embarrassing silence i ain't much on religion sir replied bindle hastily mrs b s the one for that lemonade and religion are things sir what i can be trusted with i don't touch neither then as mr mcfee moved towards the door he added must you go sir you won't stay and have a bit of supper na na replied mr mcfee hastily i hey the lord's work to do mr bindle the lord's work to do he repeated as he shook hands with mrs bindle and then with bindle the lord's work to do he repeated for a third time as followed by mrs bindle he left the room funny thing that the lord's work should make him look like that remarked bindle meditatively as he drew a tin of salmon from his pocket when mrs bindle returned to the kitchen it was obvious that she was seriously displeased the bangs that punctuated the process of dishing up were good fortissimo bangs bindle continued to read his paper imperturbably in his nostrils was the scent of a favourite stew he lifted his head like a hound appreciatively sniffing the air a look of contentment overspreading his features having poured out the contents of the saucepan mrs bindle went to the sink and filled the vessel with water carrying it across the kitchen she banged it down on the stove opening the front and picking up the poker she gave the fire several unnecessary jabs what did sandy want inquired bindle as he got to work upon his supper don't talk to me snapped mrs bindle you'd try a saint you would insulting the minister in that way insultin me cried bindle in surprise why i only cheer old him you'll never learn how to behave stormed mrs bindle losing her temper and her h's look at you now all dressed up and leaving me alone bindle was wearing his best clothes for some reason known only to himself any one would think you was going to a wedding continued mrs bindle not again said bindle cheerfully what was old scotch and soda after he inquired when you ask me a proper question i'll give you a proper answer announced mrs bindle oh lord said bindle with mock resignation well what did the reverend macandrew want he came to inquire why milly was so often absent from chapel i shall have to speak to mr hearty said mrs bindle bindle's reply was a prolonged whistle e's after millikins is he he muttered that is how both bindle and mrs bindle first learned that the reverend andrew mcfee was interested in their pretty niece milly hearty mrs bindle mentioned the fact of mr mcfee's call to mr hearty and from that moment he had seen in the minister a potential son-in-law the angular piety of mr mcfee rendered him an awkward not to say a clumsy lover i likes to see old mac a angin around millikins remarked bindle to mrs bindle one evening over supper it's like an hippopotamus a givin that glad eye to a canary heathen was mrs bindle's sole comment milly hearty herself had been much troubled by mr mcfee's ponderous attentions at first she had regarded them merely as the friendly interest of a pastor and a member of his flock but soon they became too obvious for misinterpretation millikins said bindle one evening as he and milly were walking home from the pictures you ain't a going to forget charlie are you uncle joe there was reproach in milly's voice as she withdrew her arm from bindle's all right millikins said bindle capturing her hand and placing it through his arm don't get uffy old max been making such a dead set at you that i wanted to know how things stood bindle's remarks had opened the floodgates of milly's confidence she told him that she had not liked to speak of it before because nothing had been said although there had been some very obvious hints from mr hearty i hate him uncle joe he's always always she paused blushing a given of you the glad eye suggested bindle oh, i seen him oh he's horrible uncle joe i'm sure he's a wicked man course he is replied bindle with conviction or he wouldn't be a parson bindle had spoken to mr hearty about the matter look here hearty you ain't going back on them two lovebirds are you he inquired 
Mr. Hearty had regarded his brother-in-law with what he conceived to be reproving dignity. "'I do not understand, Joseph,' he remarked in hollow, woolly tones. "'Well, there's old Mac, always a given the glad eye to Millikins,' explained Bindle. "'If you wish to speak of our minister, Joseph, you must do so respectfully, and I cannot listen to such vulgar suggestions.' "'Oh, come orf it, Arty. You're only a greengrocer, and greengrocers don't talk like that ear, whatever they may do in heaven. If you're a-goin' to have any anky-panky with Millikins over that sandy-aired son of a tub-thumper, then you're up against the biggest thing in your life, and don't you forget it.' Bindle was angry. "'Of late, Joseph,' Mr. Hearty replied, "'you have shown too much desire to interfere in my private affairs, and I cannot permit it.' "'Oh, you can't, can't you?' said Bindle that if it hadn't been for me oldin my tongue you would have had no bloomin affairs for me to mix up in mr hearty paled and fumbled with the right lapel of his coat anyhow said bindle millikins is going to marry charlie dixon and if you're going to try any of your dirty tricks over old skin and oatmeal then you're going to be up against j b there are times muttered bindle as he walked away from the hearty's house when arty gets my goat and he started whistling shrilly to cheer himself up Bindle was still troubled in his mind about Mr. Hearty's scheme for Millie's future, and one Sunday evening he determined to forego the night club in order to call upon the Hearties with the object of conveying to Mr. McPhee in the course of conversation that Millie was irrevocably pledged to Charlie Dixon. Mr. McPhee had formed the habit of supping with the Hearties after evening service, and frequently Mrs. Bindle was of the party. Bindle's Sunday evening engagements at the night club had been a cause of great relief to Mrs. Bindle. For some time previously, Mr. Hardy's invitations to the Bindles to take supper on Sunday evenings had been growing less and less frequent. It did not require a very great effort of the imagination to discover the cause. Bindle's racy speech and unconventional views upon religion were to Mr. Hardy anathema, and whilst they amused Mrs. Hardy, who, having trouble with her breath, did not seem to consider that religion was meant for her, they caused mr hearty intense anguish he felt safe however in asking mr mcfee to supper on sundays because mrs bindle had confided to him that bindle was always engaged upon the sabbath night she did not mention the nature of the engagement when bindle entered the drawing-room mr hearty mr mcfee mr gupperduck and mrs bindle were gathered round the harmonium mrs hearty sat in her customary place upon the sofa waiting for someone to address her that she might confide in them upon the all-absorbing subject of her breath mr gupperduck was seated on a chair endeavouring to discipline his accordion into not sounding e sharp continuously through each hymn the others were awaiting with keen interest the outcome of the struggle got a pain ain't it inquired bindle having greeted everybody as he stood puffing volumes of smoke from one of sprague's fulham whiffs a smoke he still affected when lord windover was not present to correct his taste in tobacco well what's the joke he went on looking from the lugubrious countenance of mr mcfee to the melancholy foreboding depicted on that of mr hearty turning to mrs hearty bindle pointed his cigar at her accusingly you been tellin naughty stories martha he said i can see it look at them coves over there he turned his cigar towards mr gupperduck and mr mcfee oh martha martha and he wagged his head solemnly at mrs hearty who was already in a state of helpless laughter ain't you jest the limit and i'm a parson too millie hearty entered the room at this moment and ran up to her uncle greeting him affectionately oh uncle joe i'm so glad you've come she cried you never come to see us now well well millikins it can't be helped it's the war you know that cove llewellyn john is always wantin me round to give him advice then i have to run over and give haig an int or two ain't the kaiser jest mad when he ears i ben over because it means another push why would you believe it sir he turned to mr mcfee the reason they didn't make old indenburg a prince last birthday was because he adn't been able to land me get me joe bindle dead or alive said the kaiser to indy and i'll make you a prince and ain't old indenburg ratty bindle nodded his head knowingly millie laughed you mustn't tell such wicked fibs on sunday uncle joe she cried it's very naughty of you bindle pulled her down upon his knee and kissed her you ain't goin agin your old uncle are you millikins he cried then suddenly turning to mr hearty he inquired ain't we goin to have any ims, hearty here i say can't you stop wheezy willie doin that old sport 
this to mr gupperduck who was still struggling to silence the mutinous e-sharp sets my teeth on edge it does i'm in a rare voice to-night bought some acid drops i did as i come along and add two raw eggs in the private bar of the yellow ostrich bindle ran up a dubious scale to prove his words oh do be quiet uncle joe laughed millie you'll frighten mr mcfee away bindle turned and regarded the solemn visage of mr mcfee his long immobile upper lip his sandy hair parted in the middle and brushed smoothly down upon his head now millikins he said with conviction there ain't nothing what'll frighten a scotchman out of england they know what's what they do ain't that so sir he inquired of mr mcfee mr mcfee regarded bindle as if he were talking in a foreign tongue mr gupperduck laid his accordion on a chair giving up the unequal struggle the others taking this as a signal that music was over for the evening seated themselves in various parts of the room i'm glad you're here sir said bindle to mr mcfee i wanted your advice on something in the bible now then millikins you got to sit down beside me can't sit on your uncle's knee when you're talking about the bible what'll charlie say then turning to mr mcfee with what he imagined to be great subtlety and tact bindle inquired you ain't met charlie dixon have you sir mr mcfee shook a mournful head in negation he's going to marry millikins ain't he millikins millie cast her eyes down and with heightened colour bowed her head in affirmation of bindle's statement pretty pair they'll make too said bindle with conviction i hope you'll be marrying em sir mr mcfee looked uncomfortable but that ain't what i wanted to talk to you about continued bindle i happened to pick up the bible to-day mrs bindle looked sharply at him and it sort of opened at a place where there was a yarn about war so i read it it was about a cove called urier and a king named david uriah the hittite murmured mr hearty urier had got a smart bird that's a gal sir bindle explained to mr mcfee and david had sort of taken a liking to her so what does david do but send urier to the front so as he might get killed and then david pinches his gal now what i want to know sir said bindle addressing mr mcfee is what god did cause as far as i can see he was sort of fond of david now if i'd been god and david had done a thing like that i'd a raised a pretty big blister on his nose no one spoke mr hardy glanced covertly at mr mcfee who looked as if he would have given much to be elsewhere mrs bindle's lips had entirely disappeared mr hardy gasped and heaved whilst minnie blushed bindle cried mrs bindle at last bindle you forget yourself not me mrs b i come here to get what you and artie calls light now sir turning to mr mcfee what do you think god did and what do you think of that blighter david mr bindle said mr mcfee at last we must leave to providence the things that belong to providence i thought you'd agree sir you're a sport you are of course david ought to have left old urrier what belonged to urrier and not pinch his gal you wouldn't do a thing like that sir would you he inquired i wonder what the gal thought eh millikins he inquired turning to his niece if i had been her said millie i should have killed david millie gasped mr hearty oh how dare you say such a thing i should father replied millie quietly mr mcfee coughed mr hearty looked about him as if for something at which to clutch then with sudden inspiration he said millie we will have a hymn here let me get out cried bindle in mock alarm i can't stand wheezy willie again too much of one note good night martha my ain't you getting fat he remarked as he stood looking down at mrs hearty whereat she went off into wheezes and heavings of laughter so long arty i hope the allotments won't ruin you and bindle took his departure millie went down to the door to see him out uncle joe she whispered as she bade him good night i understood oh you did did you said bindle ain't we getting a wise little puss millikins and bindle walked home whistling the long long trail end of chapter seven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter eight of the adventures of bindle by herbert jenkins this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter eight the chapel conversazione lady knob carrick's nomination of the reverend andrew mcfee to the vacant pastorate 
at the alton road chapel was her way of showing that an amnesty had been arranged between them and that mr mcfee had accepted it with the nearest approach to pleasure that he ever permitted himself miss mcfee his sister and housekeeper had sniffed but it was always difficult to discriminate between miss mcfee's physical and mental sniffs during the winter she seemed to suffer from a perpetual cold in the head it sometimes attacked her in the spring and autumn so that only during the months of june july and august could one say with any degree of certainty that miss mcfee's sniffs meant indignation and not an inflamed membrane in commemoration of his long ministry at the alton road chapel the rev mr sopley was to receive an illuminated address a purse of fifty pounds and a silver mounted hot water bottle for reasons of economy the presentation was to be made on the same occasion as the conversazione inaugurating the pastorate of mr mcfee this conversazione had been delayed for some months as miss mcfee had been forced to remain behind at barton bridge in order to recover from a particularly severe chill and also to arrange for the letting of the house in the meantime mr mcfee had taken lodgings in fulham thus freeing mr sopley whose health for some time past had not been good it had been arranged however that the retiring shepherd should be present at the celebration in order to receive the address the purse and the silver mounted hot water bottle lady knob carrick had consented herself to make the presentation and a glee party had been arranged for to entertain the guests it had first been suggested that the services should be engaged of a man who produced rabbits out of top hats and omelettes from ladies shoes but it had been decided that such things were too secular for the occasion lady knob carrick had insisted that the words of the glee should first be submitted to her and a lengthy correspondence had taken place between her and the leader of the glee party the first list had been vetoed in its entirety one item entitled oh hush thee my baby was considered by lady knob carrick as not quite nice it might make the young girls feel self-conscious another one of a slightly humorous nature referred to a man's bleeding nose lady knob carrick had written to the leader of the glee party in uncompromising terms upon the indelicacy of submitting to her so coarse a composition after a brisk interchange of letters a programme was eventually decided upon the conversazione was held in the chapel schoolroom a considerable portion of mr hearty's drawing-room furniture had been requisitioned in order to give the place an appearance of hominess and comfort mr hearty's clock and lustres were upon the mantelpiece and mr hearty's pink candles were in the lustres chains of coloured paper to mr hearty the extreme evidences of festivity stretched from the corners of the room to the central gas bracket on which had been placed opaque pink globes nothing however could mitigate the hardness of the scriptural texts in oak oxford frames that garnished the walls prepare to meet thy god even when in gold letters entwined with apple blossoms seemed scarcely the greeting for those who had been invited to revel the wages of sin is death with violets coquetting in and out the letters is sound theology but not a convincing invitation to merry-making and so shall ye all likewise perish with primroses that seemed to have paled through long association with so terrible a menace threw out its uncompromising warning from immediately above the refreshment table on the table itself was everything that a little money could buy from fish paste sandwiches to homemade three-cornered tarts with raspberry jam baked hard peeping out at the joins as if to advertise that there was no deception millie hearty had striven to mitigate the uncompromising gloom of the text by placing evergreens about the frames but with no very pronounced success mr hearty had supplied the fruit and mr black the groceries at cost price that is to say mr hardy had taken off a halfpenny a pound from his tenpenny apples and mr black three farthings a bottle from his one and ninepenny lemon squash on the night of the conversazione mr hardy and mrs bindle arrived early in order to put finishing touches to everything mrs bindle was wearing a new dress of puce-coloured merino and mr hardy had donned a white tie in honour of the occasion his trousers still concertinaed mournfully down his legs until they disparately met his large and shapeless boots millie hearty was also an early arrival in her white frock she looked strangely out of place associated with her father and aunt mr hearty fidgeted about from place to place in a state of acute nervousness 
his eyes roving round in search of some defect in the arrangements fixed themselves upon the gas fetching a chair he mounted it and lowered in turn each burner then replacing the chair against the wall he stepped some distance back to see the effect the result was that he once more mounted the chair and readjusted the flames to the same height as before mrs bindle also moved about but always with a set purpose putting finishing touches to everything alice the hardy's maid seemed to be engaged in a game of in and out banging the door at each entry and exit in spite of the frequency with which this was done it caused mr hearty each time to look round expectantly is joseph coming he inquired of mrs bindle yes she replied but i've warned him there was a grimness in her voice that carried conviction to mr hearty thank you elizabeth thank you i was very upset the other night very he suddenly rushed away to the harmonium where one of the candles was burning smokily mr gupperduck can't come said mrs bindle as she arranged the fish paste sandwiches he's got a meeting at hoxton mr hardy made some murmur of response as she dashed across the room to adjust three chairs that lacked symmetry i wish they'd all come alf wheezed mrs hardy hitting the front of a bright green bodice sartorially mrs hardy always ran to brilliancy i hope mr mcfee will not be late said mr hardy in a tone of gloom foreboding mr mcfee's arrival at that moment accompanied by miss mcfee put an end to this anxiety miss mcfee was a tall flat-chested angular woman of about forty with high cheekbones and almost white eyebrows and eyelashes she greeted mr hardy and the others without emotion mr mcfee had eyes for no one but milly the next arrival was the rev mr sopley all woven whiskers as bindle had once described him mournfully he shook hands with all and seating himself on the first available chair cast his eyes up towards the ceiling his habitual attitude alice sidled up to mrs bindle and in a whisper audible to all inquired am i to call out the names mum certainly alice replied mrs bindle as each guest arrives you will announce the names clearly then turning to mr hearty she said i think that you and mr mcfee ought to receive the guests at the door certainly elizabeth certainly said mr hearty there was unaccustomed decision in his voice he was glad of something definite to do striding over to mr mcfee he whispered to him and practically dragged him away from milly the two of them took up their positions near the door where they stood staring at each other as if wondering what was to happen next mrs hardy from time to time beat her chest it's me breath she confided to mr sopley then subsided into wheezing ah mr sopley changed the angle of his gaze whenever spoken to he invariably opened his mouth with a jerk as if he had been suddenly brought back from another world by someone hitting him in the wind as often as not he reclosed his mouth without further sound it was obvious to the most casual observer that he was here on earth because providence had decreed it and not from any wish of his own suddenly alice threw open the outer door mr payne and his wife mum she announced mr mcfee and mr hearty became instantly galvanized into activity not his wife corrected mrs bindle in a whisper but she is his wife protested alice indignantly ain't you mum she inquired of mrs payne mrs payne simpered her acquiescence as she turned to mr mcfee and mr hearty who had raced towards her you should say mr and mrs payne alice said mrs bindle with quiet forbearance sorry remarked alice turning to go i ain't used to this ere why can't they come in without all this yelling out of names she muttered they ain't trains mr payne a small man with a bald head and a tuft of black hair in the centre of a protruding forehead shook hands joyfully with mr mcfee and mr hearty he was wearing a black frock coat and light brown tweed trousers a white waistcoat and a royal blue tie mrs payne was a tall thin woman garbed in a narrow brown skirt with a cream-coloured bodice over elaborated with lace the sleeves of her blouse reached only just below the elbows and the cream gloves on her hands failed to form a liaison with the blouse round her neck was flung a locket suspended by a massive gold chain both she and mr payne were violent in their greetings after which they proceeded over to two chairs by the wall where they seated themselves and proceeded to converse in undertones mr payne drawing on a pair of black kid gloves mr and mrs withers bawled alice mrs bindle nodded approval and mr and mrs withers shook hands with mr hearty and mr mcfee much as mr and mrs payne had done 
mr withers carried a small sandy head on one side and a frock coat tightly buttoned over his narrow chest his smallness was emphasized by the vastness of mrs withers whose white silk bodice cut low at the neck and black skirt fitted her amorously as if the wearer's intention were to diminish her size for some time alice carried out her duties with marked success and mr mcfee and mr hardy were kept as busy as an american president at election time an unfortunate episode occurred in connection with two of the most important members of mr mcfee's flock mr tuddenham and mr musket mr tuddenham was a stout self-important little man with a red face and a don't you dare to argue with me sir air mr musket on the other hand was tall and lean with lantern jaws a sallow complexion and a white beard mr tuddenham's clothes fitted him like a glove mr musket's hung in despairing folds about his person mr tuddenham wore a high collar which cut viciously into his red neck mr musket's neckwear was nonconformist and cut mr tuddenham glared at the world through fierce bloodshot eyes mr musket gazed weakly over the top of a pair of pince-nez that hung at one side mr musket's voice was an overpowering boom contrasting oddly with the thin high-pitched tones of mr tuddenham mr tuddenham was as upright as a bantam mr musket drooped like a wilted lily no one had ever seen mr musket without mr tuddenham or mr tuddenham without mr musket alice appeared to have considerable difficulty over their names during which mr mcfee and mr hearty stood pretending not to be aware of the presence of the new arrivals eventually alice nodded reassuringly and taking a step into the room announced mr muddenham and mr tuskett tuddenham girl tuddenham shrieked mr tuddenham musket i said musket boomed mr musket for a moment alice regarded them with some apprehension then her face broke into a smile and with a sidewise nod of her head in the direction of the new guests and a jerk of her thumb she turned laughing to the door giving a backward kick of mirth as she went out the guests now began to arrive thick and fast miss torkington brought her tow-coloured hair and pince-nez in a manner that seemed to shout virtue and chastity she was all action and vivacity and nothing could damn the flow of her words just as none could have convinced her that in her pale blue princess robe with its high collar she was not the demure crier mrs bindle had taken up her position near the door so that she might correct alice should occasion arise the butcher and his missus announced alice 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 protested mrs bindle in a loud whisper you mustn't announce people like that you should say mr and mrs gash i asked him mum protested alice and that's what he said mrs bindle looked anxiously from mr gash in a check suit and red tie to his wife in a royal blue short skirt a pink blouse and white boots with tassels they smiled good-humouredly mrs bindle sighed her relief mrs bindle decided that it would be wise to leave alice to her own devices she knew something of the temper of the outraged domestic in consequence alice announced without rebuke mr hippet as mr pip pip and mrs muspratt as miss muskrat presently her voice was heard without raised in angry reproaches what's your name she was heard to demand i got to call it out no you don't ruthie dear was the reply mr hearty and mrs bindle exchanged glances they recognized that voice you let go i ain't one of them sort said the voice of bindle you ain't goin in till you give me your name so there was alice's retort the guests focused their attention upon the door suddenly it opened a foot and then crashed to again ah oh, thought you'd got through didn't you they heard alice cry triumphantly suddenly the door opened again and bindle entered with alice striving to restrain him now ruthie i'm married if i wasn't well anything might happen look here's my coat and at so don't say i haven't trusted you here le go bindle made an impressive figure in his evening clothes patent boots a large diamond stud in the centre of his shirt a geranium in his buttonhole and a red silk handkerchief tucked in the opening of his waistcoat hello arty he cried genially ere call her arf indicating alice with a jerk of his thumb seems to have taken a fancy to me and she ain't the first neither he added mrs bindle motioned to alice to free bindle which she did reluctantly bindle looked round the room with interest 
this the little lot arty he inquired in a hoarse whisper audible to all don't look very cheer old crowd do they the idea of going to heaven seems to make em low spirited bindle regarded mr mcfee intently then turning to mr muskett who happened to be standing near him he remarked can't you see him in nightshirt with wings and an arp a flutterin about like a little canary wonderful place heaven sir said bindle looking up at mr muskett sir boomed mr muskett bindle started back then recovering himself and leaning forward slightly he said do you mind doing that again sir just to see if i can stand it without jumping mr muskett glared at him swung round on his heel and joined mr tuddenham at the other end of the room seemed to have trod on his toes muttered bindle as he watched mr muskett obviously explaining to mr tuddenham the insult to which he had just been subjected bindle looked about him with interest the only guest who seemed thoroughly comfortable and at home suddenly his eye caught sight of the text above the refreshment table and he grinned broadly looking about him for someone to share the joke he took a step towards his nearest neighbour miss torkington ain't he a knockout he remarked nudging her with his elbow i beg your pardon said miss torkington lifting her chin and folding her hands before her im arty said bindle ain't he a knockout look at that so shall ye all likewise perish he read fancy sticking that up over the grub miss torkington her hands still folded before her with head in the air wheeled round and walked away in what she conceived to be a dignified manner bindle slowly turned and watched her quaint old bird he muttered i wonder what i said to hurt her feelings the glee party of four had formed up near the harmonium mr hardy was in earnest conversation with the leader he wished to see lady knob carrick's arrival heralded with appropriate music the leader of the singers was a man whose serious visage convinced mr hardy that to him might safely be left the selection of the extra that was to welcome the patroness of the occasion mr hardy was unaware that in the leader's heart was a smouldering anger against lady knob carrick on account of her rudeness in the recent correspondence that had taken place furthermore he had already received his fee hi arty bindle called to mr hearty as he left the leader of the glee party when's the old bird comin mr hearty turned the old bird he interrogated with lifted eyebrows lady knob carrick bawled alice throwing open the door with a flourish lady knob carrick sailed into the room her head held high in supercilious superiority following her came her companion miss strint who had carried her self-suppression and toadyism to the point of inspiration immediately behind came john lady knob carrick's footman bearing before him the illuminated address the purse containing fifty treasury pound notes and the silver mounted hot water bottle bindle started clapping vigorously two or three other guests followed suit but the look lady knob carrick cast about her proved to them conclusively that bindle had done the wrong thing as most kind of your ladyship to come mr hardy fussed about lady knob carrick walking deprecatingly upon his toes she appeared entirely oblivious of his presence he turned towards the harmonium and made frantic signals to the leader of the glee party suddenly the quartet broke into song every word ringing out clearly and distinctly there's the blue eye and the brown eye the grave eye and the sad there's the pink eye and the green eye and the eye that's rolling mad but of all the eyes that i may be the merciful or bad the eye that i would choose is what they call the glad the glad eye the last line was rolled out sonorously by the bass the company looked at one another in amazement lady knob carrick scarlet with rage glared through her lorgnettes at the singers and then at mr hearty who from where he stood petrified gazed wonderingly at the glee party mrs bindle with great presence of mind moved swiftly across the room and caught the falsetto by the lapel of the coat just as he had opened his mouth to begin his solo verse dealing with the knowledge acquired by a flapper from the country in the course of a fortnight's holiday in london mrs bindle made it clear to the leader that as far as the alton road chapel was concerned he was indulging in an optical delusion we're all deeply honoured by your ladyship's presence this evening said mr mcfee throwing himself into the breach it is 
get me a chair demanded lady knob carrick still glaring in the direction of the glee singers bindle rushed at her with a frail-looking hemp-seated chair which he proceeded to flick with his red silk pocket handkerchief won't be enough mum he inquired solicitously lady knob carrick regarded him through her lorgnettes mr sopley had been detached from his contemplation of the ceiling and was now led up to lady knob carrick ah oh, he exclaimed we are indeed greatly honoured ear ear broke in bindle attracting to himself the attention of the whole assembly will your ladyship make the presentation now inquired mr hearty or no was lady knob carrick's uncompromising reply as she seated herself fetch a table please she added indicating with an inclination of her head her footman who stood with what bindle called the prizes mr hearty and mr gash trotted off to fetch a small table from the corner of the room this was placed in front of lady knob carrick and on it john deposited the illuminated address the bag containing the notes and the silver mounted hot water bottle a hush of expectancy fell upon the assembly lady knob carrick rose and was greeted by respectful applause her manner was that of a peacock deigning to acknowledge the existence of a group of sparrows from a dorothy bag she drew a typewritten paper which she proceeded to read i have been asked to present to the rev james sopley as a mark of the esteem in which he is held by his flock an illuminated address a purse of fifty pounds and a silver mounted hot water bottle she paused for a moment a trifle that shall remind him of the loving hearts he has left behind murmurs of respectful appreciation mr sopley has fought the good fight in fulham for upwards of twenty-five years and he is now about to retire to enjoy the rest that he has so well and thoroughly earned ear ear from bindle i trust and hope that the lord will spare him for many years to come i'm sure that i would if i was god whispered bindle to mr tuddenham who only glared at him we have no among us continued lady knob carrick a new pastor a man of sterling worth and sound religious principles that's you said bindle in a hoarse whisper nudging mr mcfee who stood next to him i have proceeded lady knob carrick sat under him oh naughty naughty whispered bindle lady knob carrick glared at him sat sat under him for a number of years at barton bridge where he will always be remembered as a man devoted to temperance fates interpolated bindle the result of the interruption was electrical lady knob carrick dropped her lorgnettes and lost her place mr mcfee's adam's apple moved up and down with alarming rapidity testifying to the great emotional ordeal through which he was passing mr hearty looked at mrs bindle mrs bindle looked at bindle everybody looked at everybody else because everyone had heard of the temperance fate fiasco lady knob carrick resumed her seat suddenly then it was that mr hearty had an inspiration with a swift movement that precipitated him on the foot of miss torkington whose anguished expression caused bindle to mutter fancy her being able to do that with her face he landed beside mr sopley he managed to detach his eyes from their contemplation of the ceiling and impress on him that he had better make a reply as he walked the few steps necessary to reach the table bindle once more started clapping vigorously a greeting that was taken up by several of the other guests but in a more modified manner in a mournful and foreboding voice thoroughly appropriate to an hour of national disaster mr sopley thanked lady knob carrick for her words and the others for their notes he referred to the shepherd dragged in the sheep scooped up the righteous cast out the sinners in short he said all the most obvious things in the most obvious manner he promised the alton rotors harps and halos and threw the rest of fulham into the bottomless pit with some dexterity he linked up sin and the taxicab saw in the motor omnibus the cause of the weakening moral fibre of the working classes expressed it as his conviction that europe was being drenched in blood because fulham thought less of faith than of football he was frankly pessimistic about the future of the district an attitude of mind that appeared to have been induced by the garments of the local maidens fire and flood he promised fulham but made no mention of hammersmith or putney and a voice that throbbed with emotion he took his official leave having convinced everybody that only his intercessionary powers with heaven had stalled off for so long the impending fate he outlined taking up from the table the bag of fifty pounds he put it in his pocket and with bowed head walked towards the nearest chair 
here you've forgotten your bed feller sir cried bindle picking up the silver mounted hot water bottle and the framed address and carrying them over to mr sopley mr mcfee prepared himself for the ordeal before him standing in front of lady knob carrick as if she had been an altar he bowed low before her your ladyship a pause of veneration my friends he continued few ministers of the gospel have the privilege that has been extended to me this evening it is the will of the almighty that i succeed a most saintly man murmurs of approval in the person of mr sopley it will be a difficult position for me to feel mr sopley wagged his head from side to side in her brilliant oration her ladyship has emphasized some of the attributes of a man whose godliness she can all testify you shan't keep me out you baggage can't i hear his dear voice my andrew oh andy andy and they want to keep me away from you the interruption came from the door where alice was vainly endeavouring to keep out a dishevelled looking creature who finally broke through and walked unsteadily towards the table lady knob carrick turned and stared at the apparition through her lorgnettes mr mcfee's jaw dropped mr sopley for the first time that evening seemed to forget heaven and devoted himself to terrestrial things everybody was gazing with wide-eyed wonder at the cause of the interruption oh my andrew my little andy cried the woman in hoarse maudlin tones her hair to which was attached a black toque with a brilliant oval of embroidery in front hung over her left ear her clothes ill-fitting and much stained hung upon her as if they had been thrown rather than put on her face intended by providence to be pretty was tear-stained and dirty her blouse was open at the neck and her boots mud-stained and shapeless What? what is the meaning of this demanded lady knob carrick of mr mcfee as she rose from her chair a veritable radamanthus the girl who was now hanging to mr mcfee's arm turned and regarded lady knob carrick over her shoulder he's my boy she sputtered then closing her eyes her head wobbled from side to side as if her neck were unable to support it you're what thundered lady knob carrick my my boy drawled the girl husband oh andy andy and she clung to mr mcfee the more closely in spite of his frantic efforts to shake himself free mr mcfee what is the meaning of this demanded lady knob carrick i i've never seen her before stammered mr mcfee looking as if he had been grabbed by an octopus on my oath your ladyship before my god andy andy don't say such awful things protested the girl you know you married me secret because you said helen wouldn't let you and she sagged away again half supporting herself on mr mcfee's arm do you know anything of this woman demanded lady knob carrick of miss mcfee miss mcfee shook her head as if the question were an insult then it was a secret marriage lady knob carrick remembered what she had heard of mr mcfee's conduct at the temperance fete mr mcfee you have you have disgraced your ladyship on my honour i swear don't andy don't said the girl striving to put her hand over his mouth don't god may strike you dead he did it once didn't he oh i've learnt the bible she added in a maudlin tone i can sing hymns i can she began to croon something in a wheezy voice mr mcfee made a desperate effort to free himself from her clutches but succeeded only in bringing her to her knees look at him look at him shrieked the girl knocking me about what he swore to love honour and obey oh you devil andy how you used to behave and now and now i swear it's all a damn lie it's my enemy my enemy woman i know thee not thou art the scarlet woman of babylon get thee from me i curse thee mr mcfee's gaelic blood was up go to it sir said bindle go it you have come as the ravening wolf upon the sheepfold at night to destroy the lamb mr mcfee waved his disengaged arm you being the lamb sir go it i'll have the law on ye, woman i'll have the law on ye, ye impostor ye harlot ye daughter of belial he flung his arm about and his eyes rolled with almost maniacal fury my god my god why persecutest thou me he cried lifting his eyes to the ceiling then with a sudden drop to earthly things he appealed to lady knob carrick your ladyship your ladyship do not believe this woman she lies she will ruin me i will have her arrested fetch the police i demand the police lady knob carrick turned towards the door at the entrance of which stood her footman john blow your police whistle she ordered practical in all things john disappeared a moment later the raucous sound of a police whistle was heard in continuous blast 
that's right shouted the woman that's right blow your police whistle blow your pinkish brains out then with a sudden change she turned to mr mcfee oh andy andy you never was the same after you had that drink in you down in the country at the temperance fete don't you remember how you laughed with me about that old bird being washed out of her courage it's a lay it's a lay a damnable lay shrieked mr mcfee mr mcfee was interrupted in his protestations by a sudden rush of feet and the hall began to fill with a wild-eyed dishevelled crowd mothers carrying their babies or pulling along little children everyone inviting everyone else to come in one woman was in hysterics lady knob carrick stared at them in wonder what is the meaning of this she demanded of no one in particular it's a raid mum a raid it's a raid sobbed a woman leading two little children with the hand and holding a baby in her disengaged arm lady knob carrick paled a raid she faltered yes mum can't you hear the police whistles well i'm damned broke in bindle slapping his leg in ecstasy then a moment after seeing the terror in the women's faces he cried out it's all right there ain't no raid don't be frightened it's old calves with that balloon police whistle tell that fellow to stop cried lady knob carrick a special constable pushed his way through the crowd what is all this about please he demanded there's a raid sir cried several voices i give this woman in charge cried mr mcfee dramatically pointing at her who claimed to be his wife with alacrity the special pulled his notebook out of his pocket the charge sir he inquired she says she's my wife the special looked up from his notebook that is not an indictable offence sir i'm afraid but she's now my wife protested mr mcfee another rush of people seeking shelter swept the constable on one side and when he once more strove to take up the thread the woman had disappeared the results of john's vigour with the police whistle were far-reaching omnibuses had drawn up to the curb and had been promptly deserted by passengers and crew the trains on the district railway were plunged in darkness and the authorities at putney bridge station and east putney telephoned through that there was a big air raid although nothing had been heard at headquarters it was deemed advisable to take precautions special constables nurses and ambulances were called out anti-aircraft stations warned and tens of thousands of people sent scuttling home bindle was one of the first to leave the schoolroom and he made his way over to dick little's flat at chelsea ah cried dick little as he opened the door nancy's back this way he added walking towards the bedroom in front of the dressing-table stood private nancy dane the far-famed pirouette of the passchendaele perrault's he was in the act of removing from his closely cropped head a dark wig to which was attached a black toque with an oval of vivid coloured embroidery well what's that he remarked as he laid it on the table hello bindle he cried all clear all clear replied bindle as he seated himself upon a chair and proceeded to light the big cigar that dick little handed him dick little threw himself upon the bed you done it fine remarked bindle approvingly as he watched dane slowly transform himself into a private of the line poor old mac he added he got the wind up proper good show what queried dick little as he lazily pulled at his pipe tired after a long day's work in the hospital seemed a bit cruel to me said dane as he struggled out of a pair of hefty-looking corsets cruel cried bindle indignantly as he sat up straight in his chair cruel with him a tryin to take the gal away from one of the boys what's fightin at the front cruel it wouldn't be cruel mr nancy if he was cut up and salted and given to the uns as a meat ration and with this ferocious pronouncement bindle sank back again in his chair and puffed away at his cigar sorry said dane laboriously pulling off a stocking right o said bindle cheerfully then after a pause he added i got to thank old amlet for that little idea and you sir for finding mr nancy did it wonderful well he did still remarked bindle meditatively i wish they adn't blown that police whistle them poor women and kids was that scared made me feel i didn't ought to have done it but then how was i to know that the old bird was going to anky panky like that with the calves took her name they did that's something anyhow old mac won't go angin round millikins again for many a long day if he does i'll punch his bloomin ed
the next day lady knob carrick and john were summoned for causing to be blown to the public confusion a police whistle and although the summonses were dismissed the magistrate said some very caustic things about the insensate folly of excitable women he furthermore made it clear that if anybody blew a police whistle in the southwestern district because somebody else's wife had come back unexpectedly he would without hesitation pass a sentence that would discourage any repetition of so unscrupulous and unpardonable an act mr mcfee cleared his character to some extent by a sermon on the following sunday upon the ninth commandment and by inserting an advertisement in the principal papers offering twenty pounds to any one who would give information as to the identity of the woman who on the night of the twenty eighth had created a disturbance in the alton road school room end of chapter eight read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Chapter Nine of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Nine, The Letting of Number Six, One. And what am I to do if there's an air raid? Demanded Mrs. Bindle. Bindle deliberately emptied his coffee cup, replaced it in its saucer, sat back further in his chair as a sign of repletion then turned to mrs bindle who had been watching him with angry eyes well there's always god and mr gupperduck mrs b he remarked with the air of a man suggesting an unfailing source of inspiration you always was a scoffer you with your black art mrs bindle's ire was rising and her diction in consequence losing something of its customary precision you know i ain't strong and and ow them guns and bombs frighten me there was in mrs bindle's voice a note of entreaty a daughter of the lord didn't ought to be afraid of a nun besides you can go round and old arty's and he's a rare old hero when there's guns going off i knew i shouldn't get any sympathy from you complained mrs bindle rising and proceeding to bang away the breakfast things when mrs bindle was suffering from any great stress of emotion she expressed her feelings by the noise she made ironing gave her the greatest opportunities she could bang the iron on the ironing board back again to the stand and finally on to the stove i gotta earn a living remarked bindle philosophically as he proceeded to light his pipe it's war time too and nobody can't afford to move so poor old joe has to take any old job he can get old of you lost your last job a purpose snapped mrs bindle bindle looked at her sharply sometimes mrs bindle's accuracy in things where she could not possibly possess knowledge was startling bindle had temporarily relinquished his situation in the removal department of harridge's stores in order to become caretaker at fulham square mansions whilst his intimate charlie hart had a fortnight's holiday mrs hart had been ill and the doctor said that change of air and scene were essential to her recovery she could not go alone and if mr hart went with her and a substitute were obtained he would in all probability as charlie put it pinch my bloomin job bindle he knew he could trust and so it came about that for a fortnight bindle was to sleep out well you see bindle explained i couldn't disappoint old charlie and what about me demanded mrs bindle looking round from a fierce attack upon the kitchen stove with the poker well said bindle slowly you're a disappointed woman as it is mrs b so you ain't hurt mrs bindle resumed her attack upon the fire with increased vigour you always was a selfish beast bindle she retorted you'll be sorry when i'm dead any reference by mrs bindle to the remorse that he would suffer after her death bindle always regarded as a sort of take cover signal mrs bindle was hysterical and bindle liked to be well out of the way before the storm broke he had heard but had never had an opportunity of testing the statement that without an audience dogs will not fight and women will never have hysterics when therefore mrs bindle referred to what bindle widower would suffer on account of what bindle benedict had neglected to do he rose picking up the faded blue and white cricket cap he invariably wore and walked towards the door there'll be a lot of tips old charlie says he remarked and i'll buy you something 
i'll run in every day to see you ain't gone off with guppy you're a dirty-minded beast bindle raged mrs bindle but her words beat up against the back door through which bindle had vanished he had become a master of strategical retreat whistling shrilly he proceeded along the fulham road in the direction of fulham square mansions bindle was in a happy frame of mind it would be strange if a fortnight as porter at fulham square mansions did not produce something in the way of a diversion cheero uncle the remark came from a brazen-faced girl waiting for a bus bindle frowned as he looked her up and down from the low-cut transparent blouse to the short skirt reaching little below her knees if i was your uncle young woman he remarked i'd slap you into becoming decent the girl jumped on to a bus that had just drawn up and with a swirl of skirt and wealth of limb waved her hand as she climbed the stairs so long old dear she cried got enough powder on her face to whitewash her feet remarked a workman to bindle as he resumed his walk women is funny things responded bindle they never seems to be wearing so little but what they can't leave orf a bit more you're right there mate replied the man when he had digested the remark if i was the police i'd run em in well said bindle philosophically there is some what likes to see all the goods in the window so long and he turned off the fulham road leaving the workman to pursue his journey puzzling over bindle's enigmatic utterance hello charlie greeted bindle as he entered the porter's lodge of fulham square mansions here i am come to take care of all the little birds in the nest what you're a leaving behind charlie hart was a big man with a heavy moustache a brow whereon the creases of worry had a perpetual abiding place and an indeterminate chin charlie ought to wear a beard was bindle's verdict glad you come joe i'll have to go over things again train don't go till four during the next few hours bindle was once more taken over the salient features of the life of a porter at a block of residential flats charlie hart had no system or order in conveying his instructions and bindle saw that he would have to depend upon his own wits to meet such crises as arose mrs sedge mrs hart's mother would look after those tenants who did not possess servants she's all right when she ain't after royal richard explained charlie hart and who's royal richard inquired bindle with interest gin was charlie hart's laconic response charlie enumerated the numbers of the flats the occupants of which were to be done for one thing he particularly emphasized number six was temporarily vacant the owner was away but it was let furnished from the following monday to miss sissy boy who was one of those to be done for bindle was particularly cautioned to see that there were no carryings on whereat he winked reassuringly mrs sedge was a stolid matron whose outlook on life had reached the dregs of pessimism oh don't ask me was the phrase with which she warded off any attempt at conversation hers was a soul dedicated to royal richard and silence cheery little thing was bindle's summing up of the gloomy mrs sedge bindle had not been in charge an hour before number seven began to get troublesome he was a choleric ex-indian civil servant where's that dumb fellow hart he roared thrusting his head into the porter's lodge he's gone to the damned seaside replied bindle imperturbably as he proceeded to light his pipe with elaborate calm taking his damned wife with him he added number seven gasped and who the devil are you he demanded well replied bindle with a grin on the alls i'm little titch but ere i calls myself joe bindle known only as holy joe for a moment number seven his customary redness of face transformed to purple stood regarding bindle fiercely den be damned to you he burst out and turning on his heel dashed upstairs i ain't lived with mrs b nineteen years without learning how to handle explosives remarked bindle as he settled down to read an evening newspaper he had discovered in the letter-box bindle soon discovered that the life of a porter at residential flats is strangely lacking in repose everybody seemed either to want something sent up or came to complain that their instructions had not been carried out the day passed with amazing rapidity at eight o'clock bindle stepped round to the ancient earl for a glass of beer when he returned at nine thirty he found his room in a state of siege oh here he is said someone bindle smiled happily 
where the devil have you been demanded number seven angrily bindle looked at him steadily having apparently established number seven's identity to his entire satisfaction he spoke now look here sir this is the second time to-day i've ad to speak to you about your language this ain't a peace meetin you speakin like that before ladies too i'm surprised at you oh, i am really now up it and learn some nice words and then come back and beg prettily and p'raps i'll give you a bit of cake you damned insolent fellow thundered number seven i'll report you i'll look here remarked bindle tranquilly if you ain't gone by the time i've finished lightin this pipe he struck a match deliberately i'll oof it myself and then who'll fetch up all the coals in the mornin this master stroke of strategy turned public opinion dead against number seven who retired amidst a murmur of disapproving voices it's ard if i can't go out to see a dyin wife and child without im a comin usin ot words like that grumbled bindle as he proceeded to investigate the cases of the other tenants and their minions number one was expecting a parcel had it arrived no it had not but bindle would not rest until it did number twelve a tall melancholy visaged man had lost fluffles where did bindle think she was perhaps she's taken up with another cove sir suggested bindle sympathetically you never knows where you are with women the maid from number fifteen giggled number twelve explained in a weary tone that fluffles was a pekinese spaniel a dog you say sir cried bindle why didn't you say so before i might have advertised for well well i'll keep a lookout what's that he inquired of the maid from number eight no coal can't fetch coal up after six o'clock that's the rules he added with decision but we must have some we can't go to bed without coal snapped the girl an undersized shrewish little creature well queenie responded bindle imperturbably you'll have to take some firewood to bed with you if you wants company coal you don't get to-night what about a log my name's not queenie snapped the girl ain't it now remarked bindle shows your father and mother adn't an eye for the right thing didn't it i tell you we must have coal persisted the girl now look ere queenie my dear a gal as wants to take coal to bed with her ain't well she ain't respectable now orf you goes like a good gal i'll get even with you yet you red-nosed little bounder i'll pay you funny where they learns it all remarked bindle to number eleven a quiet little old lady who wanted a postage stamp the little lady smiled she won't be wantin coal in the next world if she goes on like that will she mum said bindle as he handed her the stamp her mistress has a weak heart ventured number eleven and during the raids she shivers so now ain't that just like a woman beggin your pardon mum why didn't queenie say that instead of showin how bad she's been brought up right o i'll take her up some coal ten minutes later bindle surprised queenie by appearing at the door of number eight with a pail full of coal she stared at him in surprise bindle grinned here you are queenie he said cheerfully now you'll be able to go to sleep with a bit in each and maybe there'll be a bit over to put in your mouth look here don't you go callin me queenie that ain't my name so there and the girl banged the door in his face she'll grow up just like mrs b murmured bindle as he slowly descended the stairs and perhaps she can't even cook i wonder if she's religious sort of zoo this ere little ole shouldn't be surprised if things was to appen before old charlie gets ome again and bindle returned to his lodge where removing his boots and throwing off his coat he lay down on the couch that served as a bed for the porter at fulham square mansions during the next two days bindle discovered that his duties were endless everybody seemed to want something or have some complaint to make he was expected to be always at his post night and day and if he were not he was threatened with a possible complaint to the secretary of the company to which the flats belonged bindle's fertile brain however was not long in devising a means of relieving the monotony without compromising poor old charlie he sent home for his special constable's uniform although he had obtained a fortnight's leave on account of his work henceforth whenever he required relaxation he donned his official garb which he found a sure defence against all complaints well queenie he remarked one evening to the maid at number eight i'm orf to catch the robbers what might carry you away i can see you catchin a man snorted the girl scornfully 
sorry i can't return the compliment little lovebird retorted bindle so long queenie had found her match two you er have a furnished er flat to let bindle looked up from the paper he was reading a timid mouse-like little man with side whiskers and a deprecating manner stood on the threshold come in sir said bindle heartily but i'm afraid it's let but the board's up replied the applicant bindle rose walked to the outer door and there saw the notice board announcing that a furnished flat was to let funny me not noticing that he murmured to himself as he returned to the porter's lodge was you wantin it for long sir he inquired a month i think was the reply but three weeks oh, i'm sorry sir began bindle then he smacked his leg with such suddenness that the stranger started back in alarm his soft felt hat falling from his head and hanging behind him attached to a hat guard now isn't that jest like me cried bindle his face wreathed in smiles the stranger eyed bindle nervously as he fumbled to retrieve the lost headgear looking like a dog endeavouring to ascertain if he still possessed the tail i was thinking of the other one said bindle yes there's number six to let from next monday what is the rent inquired the caller bindle who had no idea of the rent of furnished flats decided to temporize i'll go and ask sir he said what was you exactly wantin and about what figure well a bedroom bathroom sitting-room kitchen and attendance would do was the reply i do not want to pay more than three and a half guineas a week now ain't that funny cried bindle and without waiting to explain what was funny he picked up the key of number six from his desk now you just come with me sir and i'll show you the very place you're wantin number six consisted of two bedrooms a sitting-room bathroom and kitchen charlie hart had taken bindle over it explaining that miss sissy boy who was entering into occupation on the following monday would use only the smaller bedroom with the single bed therefore the double bedded room was to remain locked the applicant who introduced himself as mr jabez stiffson expressed himself as quite satisfied with all he saw and agreed to enter into possession on the following monday afternoon at a rental of three and a half guineas a week he appeared mildly surprised at bindle waiving the question of references and a deposit but agreed that the smaller bedroom should be kept locked as containing the owner's personal possessions mrs stiffson he explained was staying with friends in the country their own house being let but she would join him on the tuesday morning in the privacy of his own apartment bindle rubbed his hands with glee if this ain't going to be a little story for the night club he murmured well put me down as a cuthbert he persuaded mrs sedge to get both rooms ready in case of accidents as he expressed it bindle foresaw that there might be some difficulty in the matter of catering for mr jabez stiffson but he left that to the inspiration of the moment he looked forward to monday as a schoolboy looks forward to the summer holidays he forgot to rebuke queenie when she became impertinent he allowed number seven to swear with impunity and he even forgot to don his specials uniform and go on duty in short he forgot everything save the all-absorbing topic of miss sissy boy and mr jabez stiffson on monday mrs sedge was persuaded to take a half day off she announced her intention of putting some flowers on her husband's grave in kilburn cemetery well remarked bindle who knew that mrs sedge's kilburn cemetery was the public bar of the ancient earl you won't want no bus fares you go hon with a nose like that retorted mrs sedge in no way displeased well don't be late in the morning grinned bindle at six thirty mr jabez stiffson arrived with a bewildering collection of impedimenta ranging from a canary in a cage to a thermos flask bindle put all that he could in the double bedded room the rest he managed to store in the kitchen a slight difficulty arose over the canary mr stiffson suggested the dining room wouldn't he sort of feel lonely without seeing you when he opened his little eyes questioned bindle solicitously a cove i knew once had a canary which had a fit through being lonely and they had to throw water over him to bring him to and then what do you think sir mr stiffson shook his head in mournful foreboding 
he come to a sparrow he did really sir that settled the canary who slept with mr stiffson it was nearly eight before mr stiffson was settled and he announced his intention of going out to dine at ten he was ready for bed having implored bindle to see that he was up by eight as mrs stiffson would inevitably arrive at ten i'm a very heavy sleeper he announced to bindle's great relief and my watch has stopped he added some dirt must have got into the works if mrs stiffson were to arrive before i was up he did not venture to state what would be the probable consequence but his manner implied that mrs stiffson was a being of whom he stood in great awe just as bindle was leaving for the night mr stiffson called him back porter i'm worried about oscar bindle noticed that mr stiffson's hands were moving nervously are you really sir inquired bindle wondering who oscar might be the bird you know continued mr stiffson answering bindle's unuttered question you you don't think it will be unhygienic for him to sleep with me sure of it sir replied bindle entirely at a loss as to mr stiffson's meaning mr stiffson sighed his relief and bade bindle good night with a final exhortation as to waking him at eight you know he added i always sleep through air raids mr stiffson's bugbear in life was lest he should oversleep he seldom failed to wake of his own account but constitutionally lacking in self-reliance he felt that at any moment he might commit the unpardonable sin of oversleeping bindle returned to his room to await the arrival of miss sissy boy it was nearly midnight when his alert ear caught the sound of a taxi drawing up outside as he opened the outer door miss sissy boy appeared at the top of the stone steps bindle caught a glimpse of a dainty little creature in a long travelling coat with fur at the collar cuffs and round the bottom a small travelling hat and a thick veil oh can you help with my luggage she cried right o miss you go in there and sit by the fire we'll have things right in a jiffy and bindle proceeded to tackle miss boy's luggage which consisted of a large dress basket a suitcase and a bundle of rugs and umbrellas when these had been placed in the hall and the taxi-man paid bindle went into his lodge miss boy was sitting before the fire her coat thrown open and her veil thrown back between her dainty fingers she held a cigarette so that's that she cried i'm so tired mr porter bindle regarded her with admiration honey-coloured fluffy hair blue eyes dark eyebrows and lashes pretty petite features in a manner that suggested half baby half woman of the world bindle found her wholly alluring i'm afraid we can't get that little picnic camper of yours upstairs to-night miss he remarked miss boy laughed isn't it huge she cried it needn't go up till the morning i've all i want in the suitcase you must have a rare lot of duds miss remarked bindle duds interrogated miss boy clothes miss explained bindle miss boy laughed lightly miss boy laughed at everything now i must go to bed i've got a call to-morrow at eleven as they went upstairs bindle learnt quite a lot about miss boy among other things that she was appearing in the review at the regent theatre known as kiss me quick that she never ate suppers that she took a warm bath every morning and liked coffee bacon and eggs and strawberry jam for breakfast you'll be very quiet miss in the flat won't you he whispered sure replied miss boy they're such a funny lot ere he explained if a fly wakes up too early or a bird as a nightmare they comes down and complains next morning miss boy laughed hush miss please whispered bindle as he switched on the electric light in the hall of number six bindle showed the new tenant the sitting-room bathroom kitchen and finally her own bedroom you will be quiet miss won't you bindle interrogated anxiously or you may wake oscar who's oscar queried miss boy you'll see him in the morning miss replied bindle with a grin good night miss good night mr porter smiled miss boy and she closed the door now i wonder if anything will happen before old whiskers gets up in the morning mused bindle as he descended the stairs to his room end of chapter nine read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com
Chapter Ten of the Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Ten: The Downfall of Mister Jabez Stiffson. One. The next morning, Bindle let Missus Sedge in at her usual time, seven o'clock. Now mind, mother, he said. Four eggs and plenty of bacon and coffee. Number six has got a appetite had no supper poor gal mrs sedge grunted kilburn cemetery had a depressing effect upon her i'll take it up myself remarked bindle casually mrs sedge eyed him deliberately she's pretty then she said ain't you men just all alike she proceeded to shake her head in hopeless despair bindle stood watching her as she descended to the heart's kitchen she's got an ed piece on her as old sedgy he muttered fancy her a tumblin to it like that and er still half full o royal richard having prepared and eaten his own breakfast bindle sat down and waited at five minutes past nine he rose it's time oscar and old whiskers was up and doin he murmured as he stood in front of the dingy looking glass over the fireplace joe bindle there's a goin to be rare doin's in number six to-day and it may mean that you'll lose your job you old reprobate at the head of the stairs of the second floor bindle stopped as if he had been shot old me orus he muttered if it ain't er running towards him was miss boy in a white silk wrapper a white lace matinee cap her stockingless feet thrust into dainty slippers bindle eyed her appreciatively oh mr porter she cried breathlessly there's a man in my bath a what miss inquired bindle in astonishment a man i heard him splashing and i peeped in i only just peeped you know mr porter and there was a funny little man in spectacles with whiskers isn't it lovely she cried clapping her hands gleefully where could he have come from well personally myself i shouldn't call him lovely muttered bindle i suppose it's only a matter of taste but where did he come from persisted sissy boy excitedly he must have been left behind by the other tenant said bindle grinning widely i must see into this now you'd better get back miss you mustn't go up and about like this or i'll lose my job why don't i look nice asked miss boy archly looking down at herself that's just it miss said bindle if number seven or number eighteen was to see you like that well anything might happen now we'll find out about this man what you think has got into your bath followed by miss boy bindle entered the outer door of number six as he did so mr stiffson emerged from the bathroom in a faded pink bathrobe and yellow felt slippers with a towel over his shoulder and a sponge in his hand he gave one startled glance past bindle at sissy boy and with a strange noise in his throat turned and fled back into the bathroom bolting the door behind him isn't he a scream gurgled miss boy oh what would bobby say like a decree of fate bindle marched up to the bathroom door and knocked imperiously what is it inquired mr stiffson in a trembling voice it's me responded bindle sternly open the door sir if you please i can't have you a frightenin this young lady tell her to go away and then i'll come out was the response miss boy giggled you'd better come out sir there was decision in bindle's voice i'll go into my room she whispered and then i'll come out again see bindle did see and nodded his head vigorously miss boy disappeared she ain't here now sir he said so you'd better come out the bathroom door was cautiously opened and mr stiffson looked out with terror dilated eyes is she really of course she is said bindle reassuringly fancy you being afraid of a pretty little bit of fluff like that but but she was in her of course she was she was going to have a rinse in there bindle indicated the bathroom with his thumb when you frightened her dirty trick a frightening of a pretty gal like that with affected indifference bindle strolled over to the bathroom looked in and then stood before the door look there she is again almost shrieked mr stiffson dashing for bindle and endeavouring to get past him into the bathroom there there sir said bindle soothingly you're a very lucky cove only you don't seem to know it but but mrs stiffson 
there was a terror in mr stiffson's voice on his forehead beads of perspiration glistened what the wife don't see the husband don't have to explain remarked bindle oracularly but she's in my flat persisted mr stiffson oh you naughty old thing cried sissy boy it's you who are in my flat but i came in last night quavered mr stiffson so did i didn't i mr porter she turned to bindle for corroboration take my dying oath on it miss said bindle but began mr stiffson then stopped at loss how to proceed look here said bindle pleasantly there's been a little mistake sort of a misunderstanding and things have got a bit mixed up you can say it's me what's done it if you like now you'd better both get dressed and come and have breakfast then turning to mr stiffson he said don't you think o meetin your missus on an empty stomach i'm married myself and missus b's as ought as ginger when there's another bit of skirt about sissy boy slowly approached mr stiffson you're surely not afraid of little me mr man she inquired looking deliciously impudent that was exactly what mr stiffson was afraid of and he edged nearer to bindle but mrs stiffson he stammered regarding sissy boy like one hypnotized oh you naughty old thing admonished miss boy enjoying mr stiffson's embarrassment you come into my flat then talk about your wife and she laughed happily now look ere sir said bindle there's been a little mistake and this young lady is willing to forgive and forget and you ain't a-goin to old out are you now you just run in and get rid of them petticoats come out lookin like a man and then what o oh, for a nice little breakfast which'll all be over before your missus turns up at ten o'clock see you can trust me married myself i am he added as if to explain his breadth of view in such matters but i can't began mr stiffson oh yes you can sir and what's more you'll like it bindle gently propelled the protesting mr stiffson past sissy boy towards his room don't forget now in a quarter of an hour i'll be up with the coffee and bacon and eggs you're a rare lucky cove sir only you don't know it i'm so hungry wailed sissy boy of course you are miss said bindle sympathetically i'll get a move on oh isn't he delicious gurgled sissy boy isn't he a perfect scream but how did he get here mr porter well miss the only wonder to me is that aft fulham ain't ere to see you a-lookin like that now you just get a rinse in your room and a rinse what's that inquired sissy you does it with soap and water miss and you might add a bit or two of lace just in case the neighbours was to come in now i must be orf old sedgy ain't at her best after them aft days with royal richard now don't let him nip orf miss will you bindle added anxiously ease that modest and retiring like that he might try at that moment mr stiffson put his head out of his door porter he stammered oscar has not had his breakfast it's on the kitchen mantelpiece he shut the door hurriedly oscar's got to wait muttered bindle as he hurried downstairs ten minutes later he had the gas stove lighted in the sitting-room and coffee eggs and bacon bread and butter strawberry jam and marmalade ready on the table miss boy emerged from her room a vision of loveliness in a pale blue tea-gown open at the throat with a flurry of white lace cascading down the front there was a good deal of sissy boy visible in spite of the lace she still wore her matinee cap with the blue ribbons and bindle frankly envied mr stiffson now sir he cried banging at the laggard's door the coffee and the ladies waitin and i want to feed oscar mr stiffson came out timidly he evidently realized the importance of the occasion he wore a white satin tie reposing beneath a low collar of nonconformity a black frock coat with a waistcoat that had been bought at a moment of indecision as to whether it should be a morning or evening affair light trousers and spats my ain't we dressy cried bindle looking appreciatively at mr stiffson's trousers you got her beaten with them bags sir or my name ain't joe bindle mr stiffson coughed nervously behind his hand now continued bindle you've got a good hour then we must see what's to be done i'll keep the old bird away the old bird questioned mr stiffson in a thin voice as he opened the door but oscar is only i meant your missus sir explained bindle you leave her to me come on mr man cried sissy boy don't be afraid i never eat men when there's eggs and bacon 
Mr. Stiffson motioned Bindle to accompany him into the sitting-room. "'I've got to see Oscar,' said Bindle reassuringly. "'Now sit down,' ordered Sissy Boy. Mr. Stiffson seated himself on the edge of the chair opposite to her. She busied herself with the coffee, bacon, and eggs. Mr. Stiffson watched her with the air of a man who is prepared to bolt at any moment. He cast anxious eyes towards the clock. It pointed to a quarter to nine. Bindle had taken the precaution of putting it back an hour. Suddenly Oscar burst into full song. Mr. Stiffson sighed his relief. Oscar had had his breakfast. "'Now, Mr. Man, eat,' commanded Sissy Boy, "'and, handing him a cup of coffee, drink.' "'And be merry, sir,' added Bindle, who entered at the moment. "'You're having the time of your life, and don't you forget it.' Mr. Stiffson looked as if the passage of centuries would never permit him to forget. "'And now I'll leave you, little lovebirds,' said Bindle, with the cheerful assurance of a Cupid, "'and go and keep watch.' "'But,' pouted Mr. Stiffson, half rising from his chair, "'Oh, do sit down, old thing,' cried Sissy. "'You're spoiling my breakfast.' Mr. Stiffson subsided. Destiny had clearly taken a hand in the affair. "'Now you just enjoy your little selves,' apostrophized Bindle. "'And then we'll try and find out how all this ere happened. It does me blowed if it don't.' Two. "'I'm not aware that I speak indistinctly.' The voice was uncompromising, the deportment aggressive. "'I said Mr. Jabez Stiffson.' "'You did, Mum,' agreed Bindle tactfully. "'I heard you myself, quite plainly.' "'Then where is he? I'm Mrs. Stiffson.' Mrs. Stiffson was a tall woman of generous proportions. Her hair was grey, her features virtuously hard, her manner overwhelming. Her movements gave no suggestion of limbs. She seemed to wheel along with a slight swaying of the body from side to side. "'Well?' she interrogated. "'He's sort of engaged, Mum,' temporized Bindle. "'Avin' breakfast. I'll tell him your ear. I'll break it gently to him. You know, Mum, joy sometimes kills, and he don't look strong.' Without a word, Mrs. Stiffson wheeled round, and, ignoring the lift, marched for the stairs. As he followed, Bindle remembered with satisfaction that he had omitted to close the outer door of number six. Straight up the stairs, like never-ending time, marched Mrs. Stiffson. She did not hurry. She did not pause as she climbed evenly, mechanically, a model wife seeking her mate. Any doubts that Bindle may have had as to Mrs. Stiffson's ability to find the husband she sought were set at rest by the shrill pipings of Oscar. Even a trained detective could not have overlooked so obvious a clue. Along the corridor, straight for number six, moved Mrs. Stiffson, Bindle in close attendance, fearful lest he should lose the dramatic intensity of the arrival of the wronged wife. Unconscious that Nemesis was marching upon him, Mr. Stiffson, stimulated by the coffee, bacon, and eggs, and the gay insouciance of Sissy Boy, was finding the situation losing much of its terror for him. No man for long could remain indifferent to the charming personality of Sissy Boy. Her bright chatter and good looks, her innocence strangely blended with worldly wisdom, her daring garb all combined to divert Mr. Stiffson's mind from the thoughts of his wife, apart from which the clock pointed to five minutes past nine, and Mrs. Stiffson was as punctual as fate. Had he possessed the intuition of a mongoose, Mr. Stiffson would have known that there was a snake in his grass. Instinct guiding her steps, Mrs. Stiffson entered the flat. Instead of turning to the right in the direction of the bedroom in which Oscar was overdoing the Thanksgiving business for birdseed and water, she wheeled to the left and threw open the sitting-room door. From under Mrs. Stiffson's right arm, Bindle saw the tableau. Mr. Stiffson, who was facing the door, was in the act of raising his coffee cup to smiling lips. Sissy Boy, sitting at right angles on his left, was leaning back in her chair, clapping her hands. "'Oh, you naughty old thing!' she was crying. At the sight of his wife, Mr. Stiffson's jaw dropped, and the coffee cup slipped from his nerveless hands. It struck the edge of the table, and emptied its contents down the opening of his low-cut waistcoat. At the sight of the abject terror on Mr. Stiffson's face, Sissy Boy ceased to clap her hands, and, turning her head, met Mrs. Stiffson's uncompromising stare and Bindle's appreciative grin. Jabez! It was like the uninflected accents of doom. Mr. Stiffson shivered. That was the only indication he gave of having heard. 
with unblinking eyes he continued to gaze at his wife as if fascinated the empty coffee cup resting on his knees jabez repeated mrs stiffson i thought i told you to wear your tweed mixture to-day mrs stiffson had a fine sense of the dramatic the unexpectedness of the remark caused mr stiffson to blink his eyes like a puzzled owl without however removing them from his wife or changing their expression sissy boy laughed bindle grinned won't you sit down it was sissy boy who spoke silence hussy there was no anger in mrs stiffson's voice it was just a command and an expression of opinion sissy boy rose the light of battle in her eyes bindle pushed past mrs stiffson and stood between the two women look ere mum he said we likes manners in this ere flat and we're a-gonna have them see sorry if i irk your feelings this ain't a woman's club hold your tongue fool the deep voice thundered oh no you don't said bindle cheerfully looking up at his mountainous antagonist you can't frighten me i ain't married to you now you just be civil listen cried sissy boyd with flashing eyes don't you go giving me the bird like that or she paused at a loss with what to threaten her guest it's all right miss said bindle you just leave her to me i got one of my own at home she's going to speak to me she is mrs stiffson's efforts of self-control were proving unequal to the occasion her breathing became laboured and her voice husky what is my husband doing in this person's flat demanded mrs stiffson apparently of no one in particular there was something like emotion in her voice well mum responded bindle e was eatin bacon and eggs and drinkin coffee how dare you appear before my husband like that mrs stiffson turned fiercely upon sissy boy you brazen creature anger was now taking possession of her here easy on old thing said sissy boy seeing mrs stiffson's rising temper and entirely regaining her own good humour i repeat said mrs stiffson what is my husband doing in your company ask him what he's doing in my flat countered sissy boy triumphantly look here mum broke in bindle in a soothing voice it's no use a playin amlet in a rage you just sit down and talk it over friendly like and perhaps i can get a drop of old richard from old sedgy it's sort of been a shock to you mum i can see well things do look bad anyhow royal richard'll bring you round in two ticks mrs stiffson turned upon bindle a look that was meant to annihilate bindle glanced across at mr stiffson who was mechanically rubbing the middle of his person with a napkin his eyes still fixed upon his wife because your husband gets into the wrong duds continued bindle ain't no reason why you should get into an owling temper is it there was a knock at the door and without waiting for a reply mrs sedge entered wearing a canvas apron and a crape bonnet on one side and emitting an almost overpowering aroma of royal richard in her hand she carried a large bowl of porridge marching across to the table she dumped it down in front of mr stiffson ain't there just like a man forgettin off what he ought to remember she remarked and without waiting for a reply she stumped out of the room banging the door behind her bindle sniffed the air like a hound that's royal richard what you can smell mum he explained sissy boy laughed ignoring the interruption mrs stiffson returned to the attack i demand an explanation her voice shook with suppressed fury listen cried sissy boy if your boy will come and sleep in my flat sleep in your flat cried mrs stiffson in something between a roar and a scream sleep in your flat she turned upon her husband jabez did you hear that oh you villain you liar you monster but but my dear protested mr stiffson becoming articulate oscar was here all the time sissy boy giggled so that is why you have put on your best clothes you deceiver you viper you scum steady on mum broke out bindle he ain't big enough to be all them things besides if you starts a megaphonin like that you'll have all the other bunnies a runnin to see what's happenin and if you was to ear number seven's language and see what queenie calls her face mr s might be a widower before e knew it where did you meet this person demanded mrs stiffson of her husband who now that the coffee was cooling began to feel chilly and was busily engaged in trying to extract the moisture from his garments where did you meet her repeated his wife in in the bathroom responded mr stiffson weakly mrs stiffson gasped and stood speechless with amazement i heard a splashing broke in sissy boy and i peeped in 
i only just peeped in really and really and then we had a little friendly chat in the all explained bindle and after breakfast we was going to talk things over and see how we could manage so that you didn't know your bathroom roared mrs stiffson at length the true horror of the situation at last seeming to dawn upon her my husband in your bathroom jabez she turned on mr stiffson once more like a raging fury you heard were you in this creature's bathroom mr stiffson paused in the process of endeavouring to extract coffee from his exterior eh eh he began answer me shouted mrs stiffson were you or were you not in this person's bathroom yes er but began mr stiffson mrs stiffson cast a frenzied glance round the room action had become necessary violence imperative her roving eye lighted on the bowl full of half-cold porridge that mrs sedge had just brought in she seized it and with a swift inverting movement crashed it down upon her husband's head with the scream of a wounded animal mr stiffson half rose then sank back again in his chair his hands clutching convulsively at the basin fixed firmly upon his head by the suction of its contents from beneath the rim the porridge gathered in large pendulous drops and slowly lowered themselves upon various portions of mr stiffson's person leaving a thin filmy thread behind as if reluctant to cut off all communication with the basin bindle and sissy boy went to the victim's assistance and bindle removed the basin it parted from mr stiffson's head with a juicy sob of reluctance whilst his rescuers were occupied in their samaritan efforts mrs stiffson was engaged in describing her husband's character beginning with a request for someone to end his poisonous existence she proceeded to explain his place or rather lack of place in the universe she traced the coarseness of his associates to the vileness of his ancestors she inquired why he had not been to the front mr stiffson was over fifty years of age why he was not in the volunteers then slightly elevating her head she demanded of heaven why he was permitted to live she traced all degradation including that of the lower animals to the example of such men as her husband he was the breaker-up of homes in some way or other connected with the increased death rate and infant mortality the indirect cause of the income tax and directly responsible for the war she even hinted that he was to some extent answerable for the defection of russia from the allied cause whilst she was haranguing bindle and sissy boy with the aid of dessert spoons were endeavouring to remove the porridge from mr stiffson's head it had collected behind his spectacles forming a succulent pad before each eye bindle listened to mrs stiffson's tirade with frank admiration language always appealed to him ain't she a corker he whispered to sissy boy corks out now any old how was the whispered reply then mrs stiffson did a very feminine thing she gave vent to three short sharp snaps of staccatoed laughter and suddenly collapsed upon the sofa in screaming hysterics sissy boy made a movement towards her bindle laid an arresting hand upon her arm you just leave her be miss he said i know all about them little games she'll come to all right what in the hell is that damn porter the voice of number seven burst in upon them from the outer door here i am sir sang out bindle then why the corruption aren't you in your room bawled number seven bindle slipped quickly out into the corridor to find number seven bristling with rage because old damn and op it i can't be in two places at once he said whilst bindle was engaged with number seven mrs stiffson had once more galvanized herself to action still screaming and laughing by turn she wheeled out of the flat with incredible rapidity and made towards the lift hi stop her stop her shouted bindle bolting after mrs stiffson followed by number seven police police murder murder screamed mrs stiffson she reached the lift and with an agility that would have been creditable in a young goat slipped in and shut the gates with a clang just as bindle arrived the lift began slowly to descend in a fury of impatience mrs stiffson began banging at the buttons with the result that the lift stopped halfway between the two floors bindle and number seven shouted down instructions but without avail the lift had stuck fast mrs stiffson shrieked for help shrieked for the police and shrieked for vengeance damned old tiger cat cried number seven leave her where she is bindle turned upon him a face radiating smiles 
them's the best words i've heard from you yet sir and he walked upstairs to reassure the occupants of number six that fate and the lift had joined the intent against mrs stiffson it was four hours before mrs stiffson was free but mr stiffson his luggage his thermos flask and oscar had fled sissy boy was at rehearsal and bindle had donned his uniform it was a chastened mrs stiffson who wheeled out of the lift and inquired for her husband and it was a stern and official bindle who told her that mr stiffson had gone and warned her that any further attempt at disturbing the cloistral peace of fulham square mansions would end in a prosecution for disorderly conduct and mrs stiffson departed in search of her husband end of chapter ten read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter eleven of the adventures of bindle by herbert jenkins this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter eleven the camouflaging of mr gupperduck one ah cried bindle as he pushed open one of the swing doors of the public bar of the yellow ostrich i thought i should find my little sunflower air and he grasped the hand that ginger did not extend to him demonstration was not ginger's strong point the members of the informal club that used to meet each friday night at the scarlet horse had become very uncertain in their attendance and the consequent diminution in the consumption of liquor had caused the landlord to withdraw the concession of a private room bindle had accepted the situation philosophically but ruddy bill had shown temper in the public bar he had told the landlord what he thought of him finishing up a really inspired piece of decorated rhetoric with yes it's the scarlet horse all right but there's a ruddy donkey behind the bar and with that he had marched out from that date bindle's leisure moments had been mostly spent in the bar of the yellow ostrich it was here that ginger when free from his military duties would seek bindle and the two or three congenial spirits that gathered round him wilkes would cough huggles grin and ginger spit vindictive disapproval of everyone and everything whilst old joe told the tale there are times remarked bindle when he had taken a long pull at his tankard when i feel i could almost thank god for not being religious he paused to light his pipe ginger murmured something that might have been taken either as an interrogation or a protest i just been avin a stroll on putney eath continued bindle settling himself down comfortably in the corner of a bench i likes to give the gals a treat now and then and who do you think i saw there he paused impressively ginger shook his head huggles grinned and wilkes coughed wilkes was always coughing clever lot of coves you are said bindle as he regarded the three grand talkers ain't you well well to get on with the story there was a big crowd making an ell of a row they was and there in the middle was a cove talkin and wavin his arms like flappers so up i goes thinkin he was sellin something to prove that you haven't got a liver and who should it turn out to be but my lodger old guppy what was he doin gasped wilkes between two paroxysms well continued bindle at that particular moment i got up he was talkin about what a fine lot of chaps them uns is and what an awful lot of aunt maudies we was sort of hurt his feelings it did to know he was an englishman when he might a been an un he was just a sayin something about mr llewellyn john when he disappears sudden like and there was a rare old scrap when the police got him out lord he was a sight never thought ten minutes would change a cove so and that ginger all comes about through being a christian and talkin about peace to people what don't want peace we all want peace ginger stuck out his chin aggressively ginger there was reproach in bindle's voice and you a soldier too i'm surprised at you i want this ruddy war to end growled ginger i don't old with war he added as an afterthought now what does it matter to you ginge whether you're a carrying a pack or a piano on your back why don't they make peace burst out ginger irrelevantly oh ginger ginger when shall i teach you that the only way to stop a fight is to sit on the other cove's chest 
and we ain't sitting on germany's chest yet got it but they're willing to make peace growled ginger i don't old with hanging back now you just listen to me why didn't you make peace last week with pincher knobs instead of fighting him he's a ruddy tyke he is snarled ginger well remarked bindle you can call the germans ruddy tykes pleasant way you got a puttin things haven't you ging no old son this ere war ain't a goin to end until you've got the v c that's what we're holdin out for they could make peace if they liked persisted ginger you won't get llewellyn john to give in ging said bindle confidently e's ot stuff he is yes growled ginger savagely all he's got to do is stay at home and read about what us chaps are doin out there now ain't you a regular old yellow-edded uggins remarked bindle with conviction as he gazed fixedly at ginger whose eyes shifted about restlessly why e's always at work he is don't even have his dinner hour he don't what ginger's incredulity gave expression to his features no dinner hour no for breakfast time neither continued bindle there's always a lot of coves hangin around a wantin to talk about the war and what to do next when he's shavin egg will ring him up emma standin with the lather on makin his chin itch ginger banged down his pewter on the counter and ordered another then sometimes when he's gettin up in the mornin george five will nip round for a jaw and of course kings can go anywhere and you mustn't keep em waitin so up he goes and there's l j a-talkin to himself as he tries to get into his collar and george five a-elpin to find his collar stud when he drops it and it rolls under the chest of drawers ginger continued to gaze at bindle with surprise stamped on his freckled face you got a kid's job to is ging continued bindle warming to his subject if llewellyn john ups around the corner for a drink and to have a look at the papers they're after him in two licks why he's had to give up his hot bath on saturday nights because he was always catching cold through nippin out into the all to answer the telephone him in only a smile and his whiskers ginger spat indecision marking the act works like a blackleg he does and all he gets is black garden no added bindle solemnly don't you never change jobs with him ging it'd kill you it would really i don't old with war grumbled ginger falling back upon his main line of defence look at the price of beer he gazed moodily into the depths of his empty pewter funny cove you are ging said bindle pleasantly ginger spat viciously missing the spittoon by inches there ain't no pleasin you continued bindle digging into the bowl of his pipe with a matchstick you ain't willin to die for your country and you don't seem to want to live for the twins what's the use of twins demanded ginger savagely now if they'd been goats goats queried bindle sell the milk was ginger's laconic explanation they might have been billy goats suggested bindle ginger swore well well remarked bindle as he rose you ain't never going to be appy in this world ging and as to the next who knows now i must be orf to tell mrs b what they been a-doin to er lodger so long and he went out whistling i'd never kissed a soldier till the war two where's mr gupperduck there was anxious alarm in mrs bindle's interrogation well responded bindle as he nodded to mr hearty and waved his hand to mrs hearty i can't rightly say he may be appy with an arp in heaven or he may be a groanin in an ospital with a poultice where his face ought to be where's millikins he demanded looking round she's with her aunt rose wheezed mrs hearty what has happened to joseph faltered mr hearty well it ain't altogether easy to say responded bindle with aggravating deliberation it ought to have been a peace meetin' accordin to plan but somehow or other things sort of got mixed up i ain't seen a scrap like it since that little bust up in the country when the lemonade went wrong bindle paused and proceeded to refill his pipe determined to keep mr hearty and mrs bindle on tenterhooks where is he now demanded mrs bindle can't say bindle sucked at his pipe holding a lighted match well down over the bowl i see him being taken orf on a stretcher and what he was wearin wouldn't have made a bathing suit for an ottentot did they kill him joe wheezed mrs hearty you can't kill coves like guppy martha was bindle's response he's got more lives than a rate collector 
what happened joseph said mr hearty i had meant to go to that meeting myself mr hearty made the statement as if providence had interposed with the deliberate object of saving his life lucky for you arty that you didn't remarked bindle significantly you ain't no good at scrappin well i'll tell you what happened guppy seems to have said a little too much about the uns and what fine fellers they was and it sort of given them people what was listening the pip so they goes for guppy the cowards mrs bindle snapped out the words venomously you got to remember lizzie said bindle with unwonted seriousness that lot of those people ad lost them what they was fond of through this ere war and they wasn't keen to ear that the un was a sort of picture postcard with a dove a-sittin on his helmet what did you do demanded mrs bindle aggressively well i just looked on said bindle calmly i warned guppy more'n once that he'd lose his tail feathers if he wasn't careful but he was that self-willed he was you can't throw unwash over crowds in this ere country without runnin risks bindle spoke with conviction but it's a free country joseph protested mr hearty rather weakly oh arty arty said bindle wagging his head despondently when will you learn that no one ain't free to say to a cove things what make him wild leastwise without being ready to put his hands up but weren't any of his friends there inquired mrs bindle i see two of em said bindle with a reminiscent grin they caught old cap and whiskers just as he was shinnin up a tree rare cove for trees he seems hauled him down they did then swore he'd never seen old guppy in all his puff cried about it he did peter muttered mrs bindle that his name inquired bindle anyhow it didn't help him for they pulled his whiskers out and dipped him in the pond and when last i see him he was wearin just a big bruise a soft collar and such bits of his trousers as the boys didn't seem to want made me blush it did serve him right cried mrs bindle bindle looked at her curiously thought you was sort of pals with him he remarked he was a traitor a peter betraying his master bindle looked puzzled mr hearty nodded his head in approval was mr wayskin there asked mrs bindle the little chap with the glasses and a beard too big for him what goes about with old cap and whiskers mrs bindle nodded well he got arf trousers and all said bindle with a grin nippy little cove he was he added oh the brutes exclaimed mrs bindle the cowards well remarked bindle it all come about through im trying to give them treacle when they wanted curry perhaps he's gone home mrs bindle half rose as the thought struck her who oh, guppy interrogated bindle yes mr gupperduck said mrs bindle eagerly guppy ain't never comin back to my place bindle announced with decision where's he to sleep then demanded mrs bindle well remarked bindle judicially by what i last see of him he ain't going to sleep much anywhere for some time and he again launched into a harrowing description of mr gupperduck's plight when the police rescued him from the crowd i'll nurse him announced mrs bindle with the air of a martha you won't do no such thing mrs b even mrs hearty looked at bindle arrested by the unwonted determination in his voice you just remember this mrs b continued bindle if ever i catches mr josiah gupperduck or any other cove what loves germans as if they was ims or beer round my place things'll happen what they done to him in the eath won't be nothing to what i'll do to him in fenton street you're a brute bindle was mrs bindle's comment that may be but you just get his duds packed up including wheezy willie and give em to him when he calls i ain't going to have no german spies round my backyard i ain't got no money to put in tanks bindle added but i still got a fist to knock down a cove what talks about peace bindle rose and yawned now i'm orf comin mrs b he inquired no i'm not i want to talk to mr hearty said mrs bindle angrily well so long all and bindle went out leaving mrs bindle and mr hearty to mourn over the fallen hector a minute later the door half opened and bindle thrust his head round the corner don't forget mrs b he said with a grin if i see guppy in fenton street i'll camouflage him i will and with that he was gone i suppose he remarked meditatively as he walked across putney bridge what happened tonight is what guppy had called the peace what passes all understandin'.
End of chapter 11. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. Chapter 12 of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 12 The Tragedy of Giuseppe Antonio Tolmenicino. 1. Hello, Scratcher! cried Bindle as the swing doors of the yellow ostrich were pushed open, giving entrance to a small lantern jawed man with fishy eyes and a chin obviously intended for a face three sizes larger. Fancy meeting you! What have you been doing? Bindle was engaged in fetching the Sunday dinner beer according to the time honoured custom. Scratcher looked moodily at the barman, ordered a glass of beer, and turned to Bindle i changed my job he remarked mysteriously what you're doing inquired bindle intimating to the barman by a nod that his pewter was to be refilled waiter responded scratcher waiter cried bindle regarding him with astonishment yes at napolini's in regent street and scratcher replaced his glass upon the counter and with a dexterous upward blow scattered to the winds the froth that bedewed his upper lip well i'm blowed said bindle finding solace in his refilled tanker but don't you have to be a foreigner to be a waiter don't you have to speak through your nose or something no and scratcher's voice was the contempt of superior knowledge them furriners all gone to the war or most of em he added and so we get a look in what do you do inquired bindle oh we just take orders and serves the grub and makes out the bills and gets tips i made four pounds last week all but twelve shillings he added well i'm blowed said bindle then proceeded scratcher warming to his subject they often leave something in the bottles last night old grandpa got so squiffy he cried about his mother he did and it didn't cost him anything inquired ginger who had been an interested listener not a copper said scratcher impressively not a brass farden i wish this ratty war was over growled ginger four pound a week and a free drink blast the war i say i don't old with killin then continued scratcher you can always get a bellyful there's old ard scratcher interrupted bindle what place is it you're talking about napolini's replied scratcher looking at bindle reproachfully go on old sport it's all right said bindle resignedly i thought you might have got mixed up with evan when you takes a stew continued scratcher you can always pick out a bit of meat with your fingers if it ain't too hot he added as if not wishing to exaggerate and when it's white bait you can pinch some when no one's looking as for potatoes you can have all you can eat in soup well it's there scratcher's tone implied that napolini's was literally running with soup and potatoes don't go on scratcher said bindle mournfully see what you're a-doin to poor old ginge then there's macaroni continued scratcher relentlessly them bein italians long strings of white stuff there ain't much taste but it fills up scratcher paused then added reflectively you got to be careful with macaroni or it'll get down your collar it's that slippery i suppose old knapp ain't wantin anyone to elp mop up all them things inquired bindle wistfully scratcher looked at bindle interrogatingly do you think you could find your old pal a job at knapp's inquired bindle you come down to-morrow morning about eleven said scratcher with the air of one conferring a great favour three of our chaps was sacked a saturday for fightin well i must be movin said bindle as he picked up the blue and white jug with the crimson butterfly you'll see me round at knapp's at eleven to-morrow scratcher as empty as a drum and with a slong bindle passed out of the yellow ostrich nice time you've kept me waiting snapped mrs bindle as bindle entered the kitchen sorry was bindle's reply as he hung up his hat behind the kitchen door another time i shan't wait remarked mrs bindle and she banged a vegetable dish on the table bindle became busily engaged upon roast shoulder of mutton greens and potatoes after some time he remarked i've been after a job you lost your job again then 
cried Mrs. Bindle in accusing tones. "'Something told me you had.' "'Well, I ain't,' retorted Bindle. "'But I heard o' something better. "'So on Monday I'm orf after a job what'll be better in Artie's Evan.' Bindle declined further to satisfy Mrs. Bindle's curiosity. "'You wait and see, Mrs. B. "'You just wait and see.' Two. On the following morning, Bindle was duly enrolled as a waiter at Mappolini's. He soon discovered that, whatever the privileges and perquisites of the fully experienced waiter, the part of the novice was one of thorns rather than of roses. He was attached as assistant to a diminutive Italian with a fierce upward-brushed moustache. Bindle had not been three minutes under his direction before he precipitated a crisis that almost ended in open warfare what's your name old son he inquired mine's bindle joseph bindle giuseppe antonio tolmanicino replied the italian with astonishing rapidity is it really remarked bindle examining his chief with interest as he proceeded deftly to lay a table sounds like a machine gun don't it then after a pause he remarked quite innocently look here old sport i'll call you kaiser in a flash giuseppe antonio tolmenicino turned upon bindle his moustache bristling like the spines of a wild boar and from his lips poured a passionate stream of southern invective unable to understand a word of the burning phrases of reproach that eddied and flowed about him bindle merely stared there was a patter of feet from all parts of the long dining-room and soon he was the centre of an angry crowd of excited gesticulating waiters with giuseppe antonio tolmenicino screaming his fury in the centre hi called bindle to scratcher who appeared through the service door just as matters seemed about to break into open violence ere scratcher what's up call him orf what did you call him joe inquired scratcher pushing his way through the crowd i asked his name and then he went off like the mad minute so i said i'd call him kaiser because of his whiskers at the repetition of the obnoxious word giuseppe antonio tolmenicino shook his fist in bindle's face and screamed more hysterically than ever he was white to the lips at the corners of his mouth two little points of white foam had collected and his eyes blinked with the rapidity of a cinematograph film with the aid of three other waiters scratcher succeeded in restoring peace giuseppe antonio tolmenicino's fortissimo reproaches were reduced to piano murmurs by the explanation that bindle meant no harm added to which bindle apologized look here he said genuinely regretful at the effect of his remark how was i to know that you was that sensitive you lookin so fierce too the arrival of one of the superintendents put an end to the dispute but it was obvious that Giuseppe Antonio Tolmenicino nourished in his heart a deep resentment against Bindle for his unintentioned insult. "'Fancy him taking on like that,' muttered Bindle, as he strove to adjust a white tablecloth so that it hung in equal folds on all sides of the table. "'Funny things, foreigners, as uffy as birds they are.' Turning to Scratcher, who was passing at the moment, he inquired, "'What the hell am I going to call him?' call who inquired scratcher his mouth full of something bindle looked about warily old kaiser he whispered he's that sensitive explodes if you looks at him he does scratcher worked hard to reduce the contents of his mouth to conversational proportions i can't never remember his name continued bindle went off like a rattle it did don't know his name myself said scratcher after a gigantic swallow he's new wouldn't help you much old son if you did know it said bindle with conviction seemed to me like a patent gargle never heard anything like it here said bindle to giuseppe antonio tolmenicino who was darting past on his way to another table the italian paused hatred smouldering in his dark eyes i can't remember that name of yours old sport said bindle sorry but i ain't a gramophone what have i got to call you call me sir replied giuseppe antonio tolmenicino with dignity call you what cried bindle indignantly call you what call me sir repeated the italian me call a foreigner sir cried bindle now ain't you the funniest old uggins giuseppe antonio tolmenicino cast upon bindle a look of consuming hatred look here remarked bindle cheerfully if he goes about a-lookin' like that, you'll spoil the good impression them whiskers make. Murder flashed in the eyes of the Italian as he ground out a paralyzing oath in his own tongue. 
there's a going to be trouble between me and old oaky pokey pleasant sort of cove to ave about the ouse customers began to drift in and soon bindle was kept busy fetching and carrying for giuseppe antonio tolmenicino who by every means in his power strove to give expression to the hatred of bindle that was burning in his soul at the end of the first day it was in reality the early hours of the next morning as bindle with scratcher walked from napolini's to the tube he remarked well i ain't hungry though i could drink a deal more still i says nothing about that but as for tips well old oaky pokey's pocketed every bloomin penny when i asked him to divvy up fair he started that machine gun in his tummy rolled his eyes and seemed to be trying to tell me what a great likin he'd taken to me one of these days something's going to happen to him added bindle prophetically he ain't no sport anyhow what's he done inquired scratcher i offered to fight him for the tips and all he did was to turn on his rattle and bindle winked at the girl conductor who clanged the train gates behind him for nearly a week bindle continued to work thirteen hours a day satisfying the hunger of others and quenching alien thirsts thanks to judicious hints from scratcher at the same time he found means of ministering to his own requirements he tasted new and strange foods but of all his discoveries in the realm of dietetics curried prawns held pride of place more than one customer looked anxiously into the dark brown liquid curious as to what had become of the blunt pointed crescents but disliking the fuss attending complaint he ascribed the reduction in their number to the activities of the food controller when as occasionally happened in the absence of his chef bindle came into direct contact with a customer and received an order he invariably found himself utterly at a loss by buzz de marseilles pommes sautés called out one customer bindle who was hurrying past came to a dead stop and regarded him with interest do you mind saying that again sir he remarked bouillabaisse de marseilles pommes sautés repeated the customer well i'm blowed was bindle's comment the customer stared but before he had time to reply bindle was unceremoniously pushed aside by giuseppe antonio tolmenicino who pad in hand bent over the customer with servile intentness what did he mean was he telling me his name inquired bindle of a lath-like youth with frizzy hair and a face incapable of expressing anything beyond a meaningless grin it was scratcher however who told the puzzled bindle that the customer had been ordering lunch and not divulging his identity bully bays de marsales pomme sorte is things we eat joe he explained you got to learn the main you well i'm blowed was bindle's sole comment fancy people eatin things with names like that he followed giuseppe antonio tolmenicino towards the service regions in response to an imperious motion of his dark well-greased head when bindle returned to the dining-room after listening to the unintelligible rebukes of his immediate superior he found himself beckoned to the side of the customer whose wants he had found himself unable to comprehend new to this job he inquired you've got it sir was bindle's reply new as new i'm in the furniture movin line myself but scratcher told me this ere was a soft job and so i took it on he didn't happen to mention okey pokey however hokey pokey interrogated the guest that chap with his whiskers growing up his nose explained bindle can't say anything without hurting his feelings never come across such a cove later when the customer left it was to bindle and not to giuseppe antonio tolmenicino that he gave his tip this precipitated a crisis once out of the dining-room the italian demanded of bindle the money you shall have aff old son said bindle magnanimously if you forks out aff of what you've had given to you see giuseppe antonio tolmenicino did not see his eyes snapped his moustache bristled his sallow features took on a shade of grey and discarding english he launched into a torrent of words in his own tongue bindle stood regarding his antagonist much as he would a juggler or quick change artist his good-humoured calm seemed to goad giuseppe antonio tolmenicino to madness with a sudden movement he seized a bottle from another waiter and brandishing it above his head rushed at bindle bindle stepped swiftly aside but in doing so managed to place his right foot across giuseppe antonio tolmenicino's path the italian lurched forward bringing down the bottle with paralyzing force upon the shoulder of another waiter 
who heavily laden was making towards the dining-room the assaulted waiter screamed giuseppe antonio tolmenicino rolled on the floor and the assaulted waiter's burden fell with a crash on top of him the man who had been struck hopped about the room holding his shoulder his shirt front dyed a deep red with the wine that had flowed over it never see such a mess in all my puff said bindle in describing the scene afterwards poor old okey pokey comes down on his back and a lot of tomato soup falls on his head then a dish o white bait gets on top of that so he has soup and fish anyhow funny thing to see them little fishes sticking out o the red soup he got an airing down his collar and a dish o macaroni in his ear and all his clothes was covered with different things an old bloomin menu he was holy angels but he was a sight for a moment giuseppe antonio tolmenicino lay inert then he slowly sat up and looked about him mechanically picking white bait out of his hair and removing a creme caramel from the inside of his waistcoat suddenly his eyes lighted on bindle in an instant he was on his feet and with head down and arms waving like flails he rushed at his enemy at that moment the door leading into the dining-room was opened and attracted by the hubbub mr james smith who before the war had been known as herr sigismann the chief superintendent entered he was a heavy man of ponderous proportions with dun dreary whiskers and a pompous manner his entrance brought him directly into the line of giuseppe antonio tolmenicino's attack before he could take in the situation the italian's head covered with tomato soup and bristling with white bait caught him full in the centre of his person and he went down with a sobbing grunt the italian on top of him the shock released a considerable portion of the food adhering to giuseppe antonio tolmenicino on to the chief superintendent whitebait forsook the ebon locks of the waiter and dived into the magnificent dundreries of herr smith and on his shirt front was the impression of giuseppe antonio tolmenicino's features in tomato soup without a moment's hesitation giuseppe antonio tolmenicino was on his feet once more but bindle feeling that the time had arrived for action was equally quick taking him from behind by the collar he worked his right arm up as high as it would go behind his back the italian screamed with the pain but bindle held fast you ain't safe to be trusted about old sport he remarked and i got to old you until old whiskers decides what's going to be done you'll get six months for wasting food like this why you looks like a bloomin restaurant look at him bindle gazed down at the prostrate superintendent knocked his wind out you have struck him bang in the solar plexus blowed if you didn't with rolling eyes and foaming mouth giuseppe antonio tolmenicino screamed his maledictions a group of waiters was bending over herr smith one was administering brandy another was plucking whitebait out of his whiskers a third was trying to wipe the tomato soup from his shirt front an operation which transformed a red archipelago into a flaming continent when eventually the superintendent sat up he looked like a whiskered robin redbreast he gazed from one to the other of the waiters engaged upon his renovation then his eye fell upon giuseppe antonio tolmenicino he uttered the one significant british word Belice. when giuseppe antonio tolmenicino left napolini's that night it was in the charge of two policemen with two more following to be prepared for eventualities giuseppe antonio tolmenicino was what is known professionally as violent not satisfied with the food that was plastered upon his person he endeavoured by means of his teeth to detach a portion of the right thigh of police constable higgins and with his feet to raise bruises where he could on the persons of his captors poor old okey pokey remarked bindle as he returned to the dining-room where he had been allotted two tables for which he was to be entirely responsible poor old okey pokey i'm afraid i got his goat but didn't he make a mess of old whiskers herr smith had gone home when a man is sixty years of age and furthermore when he has been a superintendent of a restaurant for upwards of twenty-five years he cannot with impunity be rammed in the solar plexus by a hard-headed and vigorous italian while giuseppe antonio tolmenicino in a cell at vine street police station was forecasting the downfall of the allies by the secession of italy from the entente bindle was striving to satisfy the demands of the two sets of customers that sat at his tables he made mistakes errors of commission and omission but his obviously genuine desire to satisfy everybody inclined people to be indulgent 
the man who was waiting for pancakes received with a smile half a dozen oysters whilst another customer was bewildered at finding himself expected to commence his meal with pancakes and jam when such errors were pointed out bindle would scratch his head in perplexity then as light dawned upon him he would break out into a grin make a dive for the pancakes and quickly exchange them for the oysters the names of the various dishes he found almost beyond him and to overcome the difficulty he asked the customers to point out on the menu what they required then again he found himself expected to carry a multiplicity of plates and dishes at first he endeavoured to emulate his confreres on one occasion he set out from the dining-room with three dishes containing respectively caille and casserole a welsh rarebit and a steak and fried potatoes the steak and fried potatoes were for a lady of ample proportions with an almost alarmingly low-cut blouse in placing the steak and metal dish of potatoes before her bindle's eye for a second left the other two plates which began to tilt the proprietor of the large bosomed lady was with the aid of a fish knife able to hold in place the welsh rarebit but he was too late in his endeavour to reach the underplate on which reposed the caille and casserole which suddenly made a dive for the apex of the v of the lady's blouse as she felt the hot moist bird touch her she gave a shriek and started back bindle also started and the lady's possessor lost his grip on the welch rarebit which slid off the plate on to his lap greatly concerned bindle placed the empty welch rarebit plate quickly on the table and seizing a fork stabbed the errant and romantic quail placing it upon its plate he then went to the assistance of the gentleman who had received the welch rarebit face downwards on his lap with great care bindle returned it to the plate with the exception of such portions as clung affectionately to the customer's person to confound confusion the superintendent dashed up full of apologies for the customers and threatening looks for the cause of the mishap bindle turned to the lady who was hysterically dabbing her chest with a napkin i hope you ain't hurt mum he said with genuine solicitude i didn't see where he was going slippery little devil and bindle regarded the bird reproachfully then remembering that another was waiting for it he crossed over to the table at which sat the customer who had ordered calais and casserole and placed the plate before him the man looked up in surprise you'd better take that away he said that bird's a bit too enterprising for me a bit too what sir interrogated bindle lifting the plate to his nose i don't smell it sir he added seriously i ordered calais and casserole responded the man you bring me calais and cocotte do you mind saying that in english sir asked bindle wholly at sea at that moment he was pushed aside by the owner of the lady of generous proportions thrusting his face forward until it almost touched that of the calais guest he launched into a volley of reproaches mon dieu he shouted you have insulted that lady you are a scoundrel a wretch a traducer of fair women and he went on in french to describe the customer's ancestry and possible progeny throughout the dining-room the guests rose to see what was happening many came to the scene of the mishap by almost superhuman efforts and an apology from the customer who had ordered calais and casserole peace was restored and at a motion from the superintendent bindle carried the offending bird to the kitchen to exchange it for another a simple process that was achieved by having it reheated and returned on a clean plate this here all comes about through these coves wantin foreign food muttered bindle to himself if they'd all have a cut from the joint and two veggies it'd be just as simple as drinkin beer and ain't they touchy too he continued can't say a word to em but what they flies up and wants to scratch each other's eyes out tranquillity restored bindle continued his ministrations for half an hour everything went quietly until two customers ordered ginger beer one electing to drink it neat the other in conjunction with a double gin bindle managed to confuse the two glasses the customer who had been forced to break his pledge was greatly distressed and much official tact on the part of a superintendent was required to soothe his injured feelings seems to me muttered bindle that i gets all the crocks if there's anything funny about it comes and sits down at one of my tables right o sir comin he called to an impatient customer who accompanied by a girl clothed principally in white boots rouge and peroxide had seated himself at the table just vacated by a couple from the suburbs the man ordered a generous meal including a bottle of champagne 
bindle attentively wrote down a phonetic version of the customer's requirements the wine offered no difficulty it was numbered bindle had observed that wine was frequently carried to customers in a white metal receptacle sometimes containing hot water at others powdered ice no one had told him of the different treatment accorded to red and white wines desirous of giving as little trouble as possible to his fellows he determined on this occasion to act on his own initiative obtaining a wine cooler he had it filled with hot water and placing the bottle of champagne in it hurried back to the customer placing the wine cooler on a service table he left it for a few minutes whilst he laid covers for the new arrivals the lady thirstily demanded the wine bindle lifted it from its receptacle wound a napkin around it as he had seen others do and nippers in hand carried it to the table he cut the wires suddenly about half a dozen different things seemed to happen at the same moment the cork leapt joyously from the neck of the bottle and careering across the room caught the edge of the monocle of a diner and planted it in the soup of another at the next table just as he was bending down to take a spoonful the liquid sprayed his face he looked up surprised not having seen the cause he who had lost the monocle began searching about in a short-sighted manner for his lost property the cork continuing on its way took full in the right eye a customer of gigantic proportions he dropped his knife and fork and roared with pain bindle watched the course of the cork in amazement holding the bottle as a fireman does the nozzle of a hose from the neck squirted a stream of white foam catching the lady of the white boots rouge and peroxide full in the face she screamed you damn fool yelled the man to bindle in his amazement bindle turned suddenly to see from what quarter this rebuke had come and the wine caught the man just beneath the chin never had champagne behaved so in the whole history of napolini's a superintendent rushed up and with marvellous presence of mind seized a napkin and stopped the stream then he snatched the bottle from bindle's hands at the same time calling down curses upon his head for his stupidity the lady in white boots rouge and peroxide was gasping and dabbing her face with a napkin which was now a study in pink and white her escort was feeling the limpness of his collar and endeavouring to detach his shirt from his chest the gentleman who had lost his monocle was explaining to the owner of the soup what had happened and asking permission to fish for the missing crystal that was lying somewhere in the depths of the stranger's mulligatawny bindle was gazing from one to the other in astonishment fancy champagne behaving like that he muttered might have been a stone ginger in hot weather at that moment the superintendent discovered the wine cooler full of hot water one passionate question he levelled at bindle who nodded cheerfully in reply yes it was he who had put the champagne bottle in hot water this sealed bindle's fate as a waiter determined not to allow him out of his sight again the superintendent hailed him off to the manager's room there to be formally discharged ah this is the man said the manager to an inspector of police with whom he was engaged in conversation as bindle and the superintendent entered the inspector took a notebook from his pocket what is your name and address he asked of bindle bindle gave the necessary details adding i'm a special fulham district what's up you will be wanted at marlborough street police court to-morrow at ten with regard to he referred to his notebook a charge against giuseppe antonio tolmenicino said the inspector what's he going to be charged with assault and battery inquired bindle curiously under the defence of the realm act replied the inspector documents were found on him bindle whistled well i'm blowed a spy i never did trust them sort of whiskers he muttered as he left the manager's room five minutes later he left napolini's forever whistling at the stretch of his powers so the lodger pawned his second pair of boots end of chapter twelve read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter thirteen of the adventures of bindle by herbert jenkins this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter thirteen the return of charlie dixon oh uncle joe charlie's back and he's going to take us out tonight and i'm so happy bindle regarded the flushed and radiant face of millie hearty 
who had just rushed up to him and now stood holding on to his arm with both hands i thought i should catch you as you were going home she cried uncle joe i i think i want to cry well remarked bindle if you'll give your poor old uncle a chance to get a word in edgeways he'd like to ask you why you wants to cry because i'm so happy cried millie dancing along beside him her hand still clasping his arm i see replied bindle dryly still it's a funny sort of reason for wantin to cry millikins and he squeezed against his side the arm she had now slipped through his you will come uncle joe won't you there was eager entreaty in her voice we shall be at putney bridge at seven i'm afraid i can't to-night millikins replied bindle i got a job on oh uncle joe the disappointment in millie's voice was too obvious to need the confirmation of the sudden downward droop of the corners of her pretty mouth you must come and bindle saw a hint of tears in the moisture that gathered in her eyes he coughed and blew his nose vigorously before replying you young love-birds won't miss me he remarked rather lamely but we shan't go unless you do said millie with an air of decision that was sweet to bindle's ears and i've been so looking forward to it oh uncle joe can't you really manage it just to please me bindle looked into the pleading face turned eagerly towards him at the parted lips ready to smile or to pout their disappointment and in a flash he realized the blank in his own life perhaps his nibs might like to have you all to himself for once he suggested tentatively there ain't much chance with a gal for another cove when your uncle joe's about millie laughed why it was charlie who sent me to ask you and to say if you couldn't come to-night we would put it off oh do come uncle joe charlie's going to take us to dinner at the universal cafe and they've got a band and oh it will be lovely just having you two well began bindle but discovering a slight huskiness in his voice he coughed again loudly seemed to have caught cold he muttered then added of course i might be able to put that job orf but don't you want to come uncle joe asked millie anxiety in her voice want to come repeated bindle of course i want to come but well i wanted to be sure you wasn't just askin me because you thought it ud please your old uncle he concluded somewhat lamely oh uncle joe cried millie how could you think anything so dreadful why wasn't it you who gave me charlie bindle looked curiously at her he was always discovering in his niece naive little touches that betokened the dawn of womanhood ain't we becomin a woman millikins he cried whereat millie blushed thank you so much for promising to come she cried seven o'clock at putney bridge station don't be late and don't forget she cried and with a nod and a smile she was gone bindle watched her neat little figure as she tripped away at the corner she turned and waved her hand to him then disappeared now i don't remember promising nothink he muttered ain't that just millikins all over a twistin her poor old uncle round her little finger fancy arty havin a gal like that he turned in the direction of fenton street it's like an old inn havin a canary funny place evan he remarked shaking his head dolefully they may make marriages there but they make bloomers as well at five minutes to seven bindle was at putney bridge station makes me feel like five pound a week he murmured looking down at his well-cut blue suit terminating in patent boots the result of his historical visit to lord windover's tailor a pair of yellow gloves and an art at would make a duke out of a drain man hello general he cried as sergeant charles dixon entered the station with a more than ever radiant millie clinging to his arm ere steady now young feller cautioned bindle as he hesitatingly extended his hand no pinchin charlie dixon laughed the heartiness of his grip was notorious among his friends i'm far too glad to see you to want to hurt you uncle joe he said uncle joe exclaimed bindle in surprise uncle joe i told him to uncle joe explained millie you see she added with a wise air of possession you belong to us both now what o oh, remarked bindle goin goin gone and cheap it aft the price here no you don't by a dexterous dive he anticipated charlie dixon's movement towards the ticket window a moment later he returned with three white tickets oh uncle joe cried millie in awe you've booked first class we're a first-class party to-night ain't we charlie was bindle's only comment 
as the two lovers walked up the stairs leading to the up platform bindle found it difficult to recognize in sergeant charles dixon the youth millie had introduced to him two years previously at the cinema wonder what arty thinks of him now muttered bindle filled out he has wonderful what the army can do for a feller he continued regretfully thinking of the various veins that had debarred him from the life of a soldier well millikins he cried as they stood waiting for the train and what do you think of his nibs i think he's lovely uncle joe said millie blushing and nestling closer to her lover not much chance for your old uncle now eh there was a note of simulated regret in bindle's voice oh uncle joe she cried releasing charlie dixon's arm to clasp with both hands that of bindle oh uncle joe there was an entreaty in her look and distress in her voice you don't think that do you really bindle's reassurances were interrupted by the arrival of the train millie became very silent as if awed by the unaccustomed splendour of travelling in a first-class compartment with a first-class ticket she had with her the two heroes of her valhalla and womanlike she was content to worship in silence as bindle and charlie dixon discussed the war she glanced from one to the other then with a slight contraction of her eyes she sighed her happiness to millie hearty the world that evening had become transformed into a place of roses and of honey if life held a thorn she was not conscious of it for her there was no yesterday and there would be no to-morrow my ain't we a little mouse cried bindle as they passed down the moving stairway at earl's court oh uncle joe i'm so happy she cried giving his arm that affectionate squeeze with both her hands that never failed to thrill him please go on talking to charlie i love to hear you and think now i wonder what she's thinking about bindle muttered right o millikins he said aloud you got two young men to-night and you needn't be afraid of em scrappin as they entered the universal cafe with its brilliant lights and gaily chattering groups of diners millie caught her breath to her it seemed a nirvana brought up in the narrow circle of mr hearty's theological limitations she saw in the long dining-room a gilded palace of sin against which mr hearty pronounced his anathemas as they stood waiting for a vacant table she gazed about her eagerly how wonderful it would be to eat whilst the band was playing and playing such music it made her want to dance many glances of admiration were cast at the young girl who with flushed cheeks and parted lips was drinking in a scene which to them was as familiar as their own fingernails when at last a table was obtained due to the zeal of a susceptible young superintendent and she heard charlie dixon order the three and sixpenny dinner for all she seemed to have reached the pinnacle of wonder but when charlie dixon demanded the wine list and ordered a bottle of number sixty eight the pinnacle broke into a thousand scintillating flashes of light she was ignorant of the fact that charlie was as blissfully unaware as she of what number sixty eight was and that he was praying fervently that it would prove to be something drinkable some wines were abominably sour i've ordered the dinner i suppose that'll do he remarked with a man of the world air millie smiled her acquiescence bindle not to be outdone in savoir faire picked up the menu and regarded it with wrinkled brow well charlie he remarked at length it's beyond me i suppose it's all right but it might be the german for cat and dog for all i know i hopes he added anxiously there ain't none of them long white sticks with green tops what's always trying to kiss their tails them things does me asparagus cried millie proud of her knowledge i love it i ain't nothing against it said bindle recalling his experience at oxford if they didn't expect you to suck it like a sugar stick you wants a mouth as big as a dustbin if you're a-going to catch the end when the wine arrived charlie dixon breathed a sigh of relief as he recognized in its foam and amber an old friend with which he had become acquainted in france oh what is it cried millie clasping her hands in excitement champagne said charlie dixon oh charlie cried millie gazing at her lover in proud wonder isn't it isn't it most awfully expensive charlie dixon laughed bindle looked at him quizzically ain't he a knockout he cried might be a duke a order and champagne as if it was lemonade or a porth and a penworth but ought i to drink it uncle joe questioned millie doubtfully looking at the bubbles rising through the amber liquid if you wants to be temperance you didn't ought to i don't uncle joe interrupted millie eagerly but father that ain't nothing to do with it replied bindle 
you're grown up now millikins and you got to decide things for yourself and millie hearty drank champagne for the first time when coffee arrived charlie dixon who had been singularly quiet during the meal exploded his mind it came about as the result of bindle's inquiry as to how long his leave would last ten days he replied and and i want he paused hesitatingly out with it young feller demanded bindle what is it that you wants i want millie to marry me before i go back the words came out with a rush millie looked at charlie dixon wide-eyed with astonishment then as she realized what it really was he asked the blood flamed to her cheeks and she cast down her eyes oh but i couldn't charlie father wouldn't let me in and bindle looked at charlie dixon millie you will won't you dear said charlie dixon i've got to go back in ten days and and oh charlie i i began millie then her voice broke look here you kids broke in bindle it ain't no good you two settin a stutterin there like a couple of machine guns you know right enough that you both want to get married that you was made for each other that you been lying awake o nights wonderin when you'd have the pluck to tell each other so and here you are he broke off now look here millikins do you want to marry charlie dixon millie's wide open eyes contracted into a smile yes uncle joe please she answered demurely now charlie do you want to marry millikins demanded bindle rather responded charlie dixon with alacrity then what you want to make all this bloomin fuss about demanded bindle but it's so little time protested millie blushing so much the better said bindle practically you can't change your minds you see millikins if you wait too long charlie may meet someone he likes better or you may see a cove what takes your fancy more the lovers exchanged glances and meaning smiles oh yes i understand all about that said bindle knowingly you're very clever ain't you you two kids you know everything there is to be known about weddings and lovin and all the rest of it now look here millikins are you going to send this ere boy back to france unhappy oh uncle joe quavered millie well you say you want to marry him and he wants to marry you if you don't marry him before he goes back to the front he'll be unhappy won't you charlie it'll be rotten said charlie dixon with conviction there you are millikins how's he going to beat the kaiser if he's miserable now what's up against you to beat the kaiser by marrying charlie dixon are you going to do it or are you not they both laughed bindle was irresistible to them it's a question of patriotism if you can't buy war bonds marry charlie dixon and do the old kaiser in but father uncle joe protested millie what will he say arty responded bindle with conviction will say about all the most unpleasant and uncomfortable things what any man can think of but you leave him to me there was a grim note in his voice which caused charlie dixon to look at him curiously i ain't been your daddy's brother-in-law for nineteen years without knowin ow to manage him millikins bindle continued now you be a good gal and go home and ask him if you can marry charlie dixon at once oh but i can't uncle joe millie protested i simply can't father can be she broke off very well then remarked bindle resignedly the germans'll beat us millie smiled in spite of herself i'll i'll try uncle joe she conceded now look here millikins you goes home to-night and you says to that appy arted old dad o yours father i'm going to marry charlie dixon next tuesday or whatever day you fix he'll say you ain't going to do no such thing millie nodded her head in agreement well continued bindle what you'll say is i won't marry no one else and i'm going to marry charlie dixon then you just nips round to fenton street and leaves the rest to me if you two kids ain't married on the day what you fix on then i'll eat my aunt yes the one i'm wearin and the concertina that i got at home eat em both i will millie and charlie dixon looked at bindle admiringly you are wonderful uncle joe she said then turning to charlie dixon she asked what should we have done charlie if we hadn't had uncle joe charlie dixon shook his head the question was beyond him we shall never be able to thank you uncle joe said millie you'll thank me by being just as happy as you know how and if ever you wants to scrap you'll kiss and make it up ain't that right charlie charlie dixon nodded his head violently he was too busily occupied gazing into millie's eyes to pay much attention to the question asked him oh you are a darling uncle joe said millie then with a sigh she added i wish i could give every girl an uncle joe 
well now we must be orf here's the band to goin home and they'll be puttin the lights out soon said bindle as charlie dixon called for his bill as they said good night at earl's court station charlie dixon going on to hammersmith millie whispered to him it's been such a wonderful evening charlie dear then rather dreamily she added the most wonderful evening i've ever known good-bye darling i'll write to-morrow and you will millie inquired charlie dixon eagerly she turned away towards the incoming putney train then looking over her shoulder nodded her head shyly and ran forward to join bindle who was standing at the entrance of a first-class carriage as she entered the carriage bindle stepped back to charlie dixon you just make all your plans young feller he said let me know the day and she'll be there charlie dixon gripped bindle's hand bindle winced and drew up one leg in obvious pain at the heartiness of the young lover's grasp there are times young feller when i wish i was your enemy he said as he gazed ruefully at his knuckles your friendship hurts like hell End of chapter 13 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com Chapter 14 of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter 14 Mr. Hearty Yields god started making a man and then sort of losing interest he made arty that's what i think of your brother-in-law mrs b mrs bindle paused in the operation of lifting an iron from the stove and holding its face to her cheek to judge as to its degree of heat there was a note of contemptuous disgust in bindle's voice that was new to her you always was jealous of him she remarked rubbing a piece of soap on the face of the iron and polishing it vigorously upon a small square of well-worn carpet kept for that purpose he's got on and you haven't and there's an end of it and she brought down the iron fiercely upon a pillow-case what do you think he's done now demanded bindle as he went to the sink and filled a basin for his evening rinse plunging his face into the water with much puffing and blowing he began to lather it with soapy hands he had apparently entirely forgotten his question well what is it inquired mrs bindle at length too curious longer to remain quiet bindle turned from the sink soap suds forming a rim round his face and filling his tightly shut eyes he groped with hands extended towards the door behind which hung the roller towel having polished his face to his entire satisfaction he walked towards the door leading into the passage well what's he done now demanded mrs bindle again with asperity he says millikins ain't going to marry charlie dixon there was anger in bindle's voice you're a nice one commented mrs bindle always sneerin at marriage and now you're blaming mr hearty because he won't well i'm blowed bindle wheeled round his good humour reasserting itself i hadn't thought of that having cleared away her ironing mrs bindle threw the white tablecloth over the table with an angry flourish now ain't that funny continued bindle as if highly amused at mrs bindle's discovery now ain't that funny he repeated seems to amuse you she retorted acidly it does mrs b you've just it it one of the funniest things i ever come across ere's me a-tellin everybody about this chamber of horrors what we call marriage and blessed if i ain't a-tryin to shove poor old charlie dixon in and shut the door on him bindle grinned expansively supper'll be ready in five minutes said mrs bindle with indrawn lips right o cried bindle as he made for the door i'm going to get into my uniform before i ops round to see arty it's wonderful what a bit of blue cloth and a peak cap'll do with a cove like arty especially when i happens to be inside yes mrs b he repeated as he opened the door you're right it does amuse me and he closed the door softly behind him mrs bindle expressed her thoughts upon the long-suffering table appointments when bindle returned in his uniform supper was ready for some time the meal proceeded in silence funny thing he remarked at length i can swallow most things from stewed steak to half-cooked ems but arty just sticks in my gizzard you're jealous that's what you are remarked mrs bindle with conviction a man what could be jealous of arty said bindle ain't safe to be let out only on a chain why don't he try and bring a little happiness down here instead of saying it's all in heaven with you and him a-sittin on the lid makes life like an addock what's been reduced in price it does <laughs>
what are you going to say to mr hearty inquired mrs bindle suspiciously well remarked bindle that depends rather on what Artie's going to say to me you've no right to interfere in his affairs you're quite right mrs b remarked bindle that's what makes it so pleasant i haven't got no right to punch Artie's head but one of these days i know i shall do it never see an head in all my life what looked so inviting as Artie's. seems to be crying out to be punched it does you didn't ought to go around upsetting him said mrs bindle aggressively he's got enough troubles he's going to have another to-night mrs b and if he ain't careful he'll probably have another to-morrow night mrs bindle banged the lid on a dish you ain't against them kids a getting married are you bindle demanded you used to be sort of fond of millikins no i'm not against it but i'm not going to interfere in mr hearty's affairs said mrs bindle virtuously well i am said bindle grimly as he rose and reached for his cap a moment later he left the room whistling cheerily at the hearty's house millie opened the door oh uncle joe she cried i wondered whether you would come course i'd come millikins said bindle now you just run and tell your father that i want to ave a little talk with him in the drawing-room then you'll turn on the light and behave as if as i was a real lemonade swell millie smiled tremulously and led the way upstairs ushering bindle into the drawing-room she switched on the light and went out gently closing the door behind her five minutes later mr hearty entered from the movement of his fingers it was obvious that he was ill at ease hello hearty said bindle genially good evening joseph responded mr hearty trade good inquired bindle conversationally quite good thank you joseph was the response going to open any more shops was the next question mr hearty shook his head bindle sucked contentedly at his pipe won't you sit down Artie? he asked solicitously mr hearty sat down mechanically then a moment later rose to his feet now arty said bindle you and me are going to have a little talk about millikins mr hearty stiffened visibly i i don't understand he said you just wait a minute arty and you'll understand a rare lot now are you or are you not going to let them kids get married most emphatically not said mr hearty with decision millie is too young she's not twenty yet now ain't you just tiresome arty ere have i been arranging for the wedding for next tuesday and you go and say it ain't coming arf you should have told me this before but millie only asked me this morning protested mr hearty whose literalness always placed him at a disadvantage with bindle did she really remarked bindle dear me and she knew she was going to get married last night never could understand women he remarked shaking his head hopelessly mr hearty was at a loss he had been prepared for unpleasantness but this geniality on the part of his brother-in-law he found disarming i have been forced to tell you before joseph he said with some asperity that i cannot permit you to interfere in my private affairs quite right arty agreed bindle genially quite right you said it in them very words bindle's imperturbability caused mr hearty to look at him anxiously then why do you come here to-night and and he broke off nervously i was always like that arty never seemed able to take no for an answer now what are you going to give them for a wedding breakfast he inquired and have we got to bring our own meat tickets i have just told you joseph remarked mr hearty angrily that they are not going to be married now ain't that a pity remarked bindle as having refilled his pipe he proceeded to light it now i ain't that a pity i been and fixed all up with charlie dixon and now ere you are a upsettin of my plans i don't like my plans upset arty i don't really mr hearty looked at bindle in amazement this was to him a new bindle he had been prepared for anything but this attitude which seemed to take everything for granted i shouldn't make it a big wedding arty there ain't time for that and just a nice pleasant little weddin' breakfast a cake of course you must have a cake no woman don't feel she's married without a cake she'd sooner have a cake than an husband i tell you joseph that i shall not allow millie to marry this young man on tuesday i am very busy and i must i shouldn't go arty if i was you i shouldn't really i should just stop here and listen to what i have to say i have been very patient with you for some years past joseph began mr hearty and i must confess you ave hearty interrupted bindle quietly looking at him over a flaming match you ave 
if you wasn't wanted in the green grocery line you'd have been on a monument you're that patient as it ever struck you arty there was a sterner note in bindle's voice as it ever struck you that sometimes coves is patient because they're afraid to knock the other cove down i refuse to discuss such matters joseph said mr hearty with dignity well well arty perhaps you're right responded bindle least said soonest mended so them kids ain't going to get married on tuesday you say he continued calmly i thought i had made that clear mr hearty's hand shook with nervousness you ave arty you ave said bindle mournfully what right have you to to interfere in such matters demanded mr hearty deliberately endeavouring to work himself into a state of indignation millie shall marry when i please and her husband shall be of my choosing bindle looked at mr hearty in surprise he had never known him so determined you think because you're martha's brother-in-law mr hearty was meticulously accurate in describing the exact relationship existing between them that gives you a right to to order me about he concluded rather lamely look here arty said bindle calmly if you goes on like that you'll be ill i have been meaning to speak to you for some time past continued mr hearty gaining courage once and for all you must cease to interfere in my affairs if we are to to continue er brothers in the lord suggested bindle there is another thing joseph proceeded mr hearty i i have more than a suspicion that you know something about those that the mr hearty paused spit it out arty said bindle encouragingly there ain't no ladies present if if there are any more disturbances in in my neighbourhood continued mr hearty i shall put the matter in the hands of the police i i have taken legal advice as he uttered the last sentence mr hearty looked at bindle as if expecting him to quail under the implied threat have you really was bindle's sole comment i have a clue there was a woolly triumph in mr hearty's voice you don't say so said bindle with unruffled calm you better see the panel doctor and have it taken out mr hearty was disappointed at the effect of what he had hoped to prove a bombshell now joseph i must be going said mr hearty i am very busy mr hearty looked about him as if seeking something with which to be busy so millikins ain't going to be allowed to marry charlie dixon said bindle with gloomy resignation as he rose certainly not said mr hearty my mind is made up nothing wouldn't make you change it i suppose inquired bindle nothing joseph there was no trace of indecision in mr hearty's voice now poor little millikins said bindle sadly as he moved towards the door i done my best poor little millikins he repeated as he reached for the door handle mr hearty's spirits rose he wondered why he had not asserted himself before he had been very weak lamentably weak still he now knew how to act should further difficulties arise through bindle's unpardonable interference in his affairs bindle opened the door then closed it again as if he had just remembered something you was saying that you been to your lawyer arty he said i have consulted my solicitor mr hearty looked swiftly at bindle at a loss to understand the reason for the question useful sometimes knowing a lawyer remarked bindle looking intently into the bowl of his pipe suddenly he looked up into mr hearty's face you'll be wantin him soon arty what do you mean there was ill-disguised alarm in mr hearty's voice i see an old pal o yours yesterday arty said bindle as he opened the door again ratty she was with you she's goin to make trouble i'm afraid well so long arty i must be orf and bindle went out into the passage joseph called out mr hearty i want to speak to you bindle re-entered mr hearty walked round him and shut the door stealthily what do you mean joseph there was fear in mr hearty's voice and eyes bindle walked up to him and whispered something in his ear i i mr hearty stuttered and paled my god you see arty she told me all about it at the time said bindle calmly it's a lie a damned lie shouted mr hearty ush arty ush said bindle gently such language from you oh naughty arty naughty it's a lie i tell you mr hearty's voice was almost tearful it's a wicked endeavour to ruin me all you got to do arty said bindle is to go to old six and eight pence and ever up it's a lie i tell you said mr hearty weakly as he sank down upon the couch so you just said remarked bindle calmly 
i thought i'd better let you know she was goin up to tell the old bird on the ill women is funny things arty when you gets their goat she asked me if i'd mind her goin she says she wouldn't do anything i didn't want her to because i was the only one what stood by her made a rare fuss she did though it wasn't much i done well arty you're busy and i must be orf bindle made a movement towards the door joseph you must stop her mr hearty sprang up his eyes dilated with fear me exclaimed bindle in surprise it ain't nothing to do with me you've just been telling me i'm always a button in where i ain't wanted and now but but you must joseph pleaded mr hearty if this was to get about it would ruin me now ain't you funny arty said bindle here are you a wantin me to do what you said hurt your feelings if you do this joseph i'll i'll bindle looked at mr hearty steadily i'll try he said and now i must be open tuesday i think was the date i suppose you'll be avin it at the chapel i'd like to have a word with millikins before i go i'll come into the parlour with you arty you will see began mr hearty right o replied bindle cheerfully you leave it to me mr hearty turned meekly and walked downstairs to the parlour where mrs hearty and millie were seated it's all right millikins your father says he don't object i persuaded him that you're old enough to know your own mind millie jumped up and ran to bindle oh uncle joe you darling she cried yes ain't i that's what all the ladies tell me millikins makes your aunt lizzie so cross it does hello martha he cried hope you got a pretty dress for next tuesday a weddin what o oh. now i must be orf there's a rare lot of burglars in fulham and when they ears i'm out lord they runs ome like bunnies to their utches good night arty cheer o martha give us a kiss millikins and bindle went out shown to the door by millie oh uncle joe you're absolutely wonderful i think you could do anything in the world she said i wonder muttered bindle as he walked off if they'll charge me up with that little fairy tale i told arty end of chapter fourteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter fifteen of the adventures of bindle by herbert jenkins this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Fifteen: A Billeting Adventure. Somehow or other, Ginger, I feel I'm going to have quite a nappy day. Bindle proceeded to light his pipe with the care of a man to whom tobacco means both mother and wife. I don't hold with playing the fool like you do, Joe. Grumbled Ginger. It only gets you the sack bindle and ginger were seated comfortably on the tailboard of a pantechnicon bearing the famous name of harridge's stores ginger had a few days leave which he was spending in voluntarily helping his mates with their work as they rumbled through putney high street bindle from time to time winked at a girl or exchanged some remark with a male passer-by for the wounded soldiers taking their morning constitutional he had always a pleasant word hello matey how goes it he would cry cheerio would come back the reply look at em ginge without legs and arms bindle cried and laughin like ell there ain't much wrong with a country what can breed that sort of cove from the top of the pantechnicon could be heard wilkes's persistent cough whilst huggles was in charge of the ribbons as they reached the foot of putney hill bindle slipped off the tailboard calling to ginger to do likewise and to wilkes to come down to save the horses i don't old with walkin to save horses grumbled ginger i'm tired of bein on my feet you ain't so tired of bein on your feet remarked bindle as god is of earin o the things what you don't old with ging now arf you come old sport ginger slowly slid off the tail of the van and wilkes clambered down from the roof and the two weary horses were conscious of nearly a quarter of a ton less weight to haul up a tiring hill bindle was too popular with his mates for them to refuse him so simple a request as walking up a hill on bindle's head was the inevitable cricket cap of alternate triangles of blue and white which exposure to all sorts of weather had rendered into two shades of grey he wore his green baize apron his nose was as cheery and ruddy and his smile as persistent as ever 
at the corners of his mouth were those twitches that he seemed unable to control to bindle existence meant opportunity as he saw it each new day might be a day of great happenings of some supreme joke to him a joke was the anaesthetic which enabled him to undergo the operation of life blessed with a wife to whom religion was the be-all and end-all of existence he had once remarked to her after an eloquent exhortation on her part to come on the side of the lord what should i do in heaven lizzie i never heard of an angel what was able to see a joke and they'd just oof me out heaven's a funny place and i can't be funny in their way i got to go on as i was made if you was to smile more ginger remarked bindle presently you'd find that life wouldn't hurt so much if you can grin you can bear anything even mrs b and she takes a bit of bearin as the three men trudged up putney hill beside the sweating horses bindle beamed ginger grumbled and wilkes coughed wilkes was always coughing wilkes found expression in his cough he could cough laughter scorn or anger as he was always coughing life would otherwise have been intolerable he was a man of few words and as bindle phrased it when wilkie ain't coughin he's thinkin and as it hurts him to think he coughs ginger was sincere in his endeavour to discover objects he didn't hold with marriage temperance drinks mr asquith twins and women were some of the things that ginger found it impossible to reconcile with the beneficent decrees of providence after a particularly lengthy bout of coughing on the part of wilkes bindle remarked to ginger wilkie's cough is about the only thing i never heard you say you didn't old with ginger it can't help it was ginger's reply no more can't women help twins bindle responded i don't old with twins was ginger's gloomy reply he disliked being reminded of the awful moment when he had been informed that he was twice a father in the first year of his marriage it's a good job god don't ask you for advice ginger or he'd be up a tree in about two ticks ginger grumbled some sort of reply it's a funny world ging continued bindle meditatively there's you what ain't appy in your own life and there's poor old wookie a coughin up his accounts all day long after a few moments devoted to puffing contentedly at his pipe bindle continued did you ever hear ginger ow poor old wilkie's cough got him into trouble ginger shook his head mechanically well said bindle he was walkin out with a gal and one evenin he coughed rather arder than usual and she took it to mean that he wanted her to marry him and now there's eighteen little wilkies ain't that true wilkie wilkes stopped coughing to gasp twelve well well half a dozen more or less don't much matter wilkie old sport you lined up to your duty anyhow look out for the poplars uggles bindle called out don't go passin a bit and comin all the way back there was a grumble from the front of the van two minutes later huggles swung the horses into the entrance of the poplars the london house of lady knob carrick and the pantechnicon rumbled its way up the drive bindle pulled vigorously at both the visitors and servants bells you never knows what you're expected to be in this world he remarked we ain't servants and we ain't exactly visitors therefore we pulls both bells which shows that we're something between the two ginger grumbled about not olden with something or other and huggles clambered stiffly down from the driver's seat presently the door was flung open and a powdered footman all plush and calves as bindle phrased it looked superciliously down at the group of men standing before him mornin eustace said bindle civilly we've come john regarded bindle with a blank expression but made no response now then calves op it said bindle we ain't the war office we're in a hurry we've brought the bedsteads and the beddin for the soldiers you've made a mistake my man was the footman's response we've not ordered any beds for soldiers now look here don't be uffy old sport said bindle cheerily or who knows but what you may get yourself damaged like one of them funny-coloured birds in the zoo ain't he ginge when he turned once more to the footman my friend uggles here bindle jerked his thumb in the direction of huggles won the middleweight championship before his nose ran away with him and as for me well i'm what they calls the white oak bindle made a pugilistic movement forward john started back suddenly producing a paper from his pocket bindle read lady knob carrick the poplars putney hill sixteen bedsteads bedden etc is this lady knob carrick's old son 
this is her ladyship's residence replied john very well continued bindle with finality we brought her sixteen beds beddin etc there's an ell of a lot of etc so you'd better look slippy and go find out all about it if you wants to get orf to see your gal to-night the footman looked irresolute wait here for a moment he said and i'll ask mr wilton he half closed the door which bindle pushed open and entered followed by wilkes ginger and huggles a minute later the butler mr wilton approached what is the meaning of this he inquired the meaning of this your royal Highness, is that we've brought sixteen bedsteads beddin etc there's an ell of a lot of etc as i told calves for to turn the old bird's drawing room into billets for soldiers as per instructions according to this ear and he held out the delivery note to mr wilton there must be some mistake replied the butler pompously taking the document there ain't no bloomin mistake on our part all you got to do is to let cav show us where the drawing room is and we'll do the rest here's the delivery note and when it's in the delivery note it's so that's Erridge's way ain't the old bird told you nothing about it he inquired mr wilton took the paper and subjected it to a careful scrutiny he read all the particulars on the delivery note then turning it over read the conditions under which harridge's did business after a careful inspection of bindle he returned to a study of the paper in his hand john ask mrs marlings to step here he ordered the footman john disappeared swiftly oh i forgot said bindle got a note for you i have and he drew a letter from his breast pocket addressed to mr wilton care of lady knob carrick the poplars putney hill southwest with great deliberation mr wilton opened the envelope and unfolded the quarto sheet of note-paper on which was written by the instructions of lady knob carrick we are sending herewith goods as per delivery note it is her ladyship's wish that these be installed by our men in her drawing-room which it is her intention to turn into a dormitory for billeting soldiers our men will do all the necessary work as mr wilton finished reading the note mrs marling sailed into the room she was a woman of generous build marvellously encased in black silk with a heavy gold chain around her neck from which hung a cameo locket mr wilton handed her the letter in silence she ferreted about her person for her glasses which after some trouble she found placing them upon her nose she read the communication slowly and deliberately having done so she handed it back to mr wilton her ladyship hasn't said anything to me about the matter she said in an aggrieved tone nor to me either said mr wilton mrs marling sniffed as if there was nothing in her mistress not having taken mr wilton into her confidence here come along boys cried bindle they don't seem to want these ere goods we'd better take em back keep us here all day at this rate this remark seemed to galvanize mr wilton into action you had better do as you have been instructed he said this he felt was a master stroke by which he avoided all responsibility he could truthfully say that he had not given orders for the bedsteads and bedding to be brought into the house from that moment mr wilton's attitude towards the whole business was one of detached superiority which seemed to say here is a matter about which i have not been consulted i shall merely await the inevitable catastrophe which i foresee and as becomes a man endeavour to render such assistance as i can in gathering up the pieces with great dignity he led the way to the drawing-room on the first floor followed by bindle ginger and john mrs marlings disappeared again into the shadows from which she had emerged once in the drawing-room ginger began to disembarrass himself of his coat and with incomparable gloom proceeded to roll it up and place it upon the mantelpiece beside the ormolu clock mr wilton stepped forward quickly not there my man he said ginger looked around with an expression on his face that caused mr wilton instinctively to recoil it was in reality to ginger's countenance what to another man would have been a reluctant and fugitive smile mr wilton however interpreted it as a glance of resentment and menace seeing his mistake bindle stepped immediately into the breach he's a bit difficult is ginger he said in a loud whisper it sort of irks him to be called my man that sensitiveness of his has made more than one widow he means well though does ginger he just wants andlin like a wife perhaps you ain't married yourself sir mr wilton drew himself up hoping to crush bindle by the weight of his dignity but bindle had turned aside and was proceeding to attend to his duties 
removing his coat he rolled up his shirt sleeves and walked to the window better take the stuff in from the top of the van he remarked it'll save old calves from cleaning the stairs here he called down to huggles back the van up against the window mr wilton left the room indicating to john that he was to stay bindle and ginger then proceeded to pile up the drawing-room furniture in the extreme corner they wheeled the grand pianoforte across the room drew from under it the carpet which was rolled up and placed beneath chairs were piled up on top bindle taking great care to place matting beneath in order to save the polish at the sound of the van being backed against the house bindle went to the window ere what the ell are you doin he cried looking out hold her up hold her up you old luggins do you want to go through the bloomin window look what you done to that tree that'll do steady on steady you didn't ought to have charge of two goats uggles let alone orses here come on up bindle returned to the work of making room for the bedsteads suddenly he paused in front of john yes he remarked critically you look pretty but i'd love you better if you was a bit more useful what about a drink i like a slice of lemon in mine but ginger'll have a split soda suddenly huggles voice was heard from without hi joe he cried hello responded bindle going to the window where's the ladder came huggles question where do you suppose it is uggles why in wilkie's waistcoat pocket of course and bindle left it at that just as huggles head appeared above the window mr wilton re-entered i have telephoned to the harridges he said her ladyship's instructions are quite clear there seems to be no mistake there ain't no mistake old sport said bindle confidently it's all down in the delivery note the old bird has sort of taken a fancy to soldiers and wants to have a supply on the premises huggles had climbed in through the window and was being followed by wilkes suddenly bindle went up to mr wilton and in a confidential voice said jerking his thumb in the direction of john if you wants to see something what'll make you happy you just make calves whistle or um ginger your barmy then you'll see what'll happen you'll die a laughin you will really for a moment mr wilton looked incomprehendingly from bindle to ginger then appreciating the familiarity with which he had been addressed by a common workman he turned and with great dignity walked from the room on the balls of his feet ginger watched him with gloomy malevolence i don't old with ruddy waiters like him he remarked all right ging never you mind about dicky bird you get on with your work bindle picked up wilkes hat a battered fawn bowler with a mourning band and placed it upon the head of the late sir benjamin biggs lady knob carrick's father whose bust stood on an elaborate pedestal near the window he's on the bus now all right grinned bindle as he regarded his handiwork in the space of twenty minutes the room was bare but for an enormous pile of furniture in one corner soon sections of small japanned bedsteads and bundles of bedding appeared mysteriously out the window and were hauled in by bindle and ginger after the bedsteads and bedding there appeared four baths these were immediately followed by four tin wash handstands and basins a long table two looking-glasses half a dozen towel horses and various other articles necessary to a well-ordered dormitory throughout the proceedings wilkes's cough could be heard as a sort of accompaniment from without there's one thing ging remarked bindle there ain't much chance o' mislayin poor old wilkie that cough of his is as good as a bell round his neck at twelve o'clock work was knocked off wilkes entered through the window carrying a frying-pan and huggles with a parcel wrapped in newspaper ginger and bindle both went down the ladder the first named returning a minute later with a parcel also wrapped in newspaper from his parcel huggles produced a small piece of steak which he proceeded to fry at the fire ginger in turn unfolded from its manifold wrappings a red herring sticking this on the end of his knife he held it before the bars soon the room was flooded with a smell of burning red herring and frying steak when bindle entered a minute later he sniffed at the air in astonishment what the ell are you up to he cried here ginger chuck that thing on the fire as for you uggles you ought to be ashamed of yourself ain't you never been in a drawing-room before i'm surprised at him and you uggles that i am ginger chuck that thing on the fire he commanded huggles muttered something about it being his dinner hour i don't old with wastin food began ginger i don't care what you old with ging you got to chuck that soldier on the fire it's only an erring began ginger 
yes but it's got the stink of a whale cried bindle reluctantly ginger removed the sizzling morsel from the end of his knife and threw it on the fire just as mrs marlings entered she gave a little cry as the pungent smell of huggles and ginger's dinners smote her nostrils oh she cried starting back whatever has happened what a dreadful smell where can it it's ginger forgot hisself mum explained bindle with a withering glance in the direction of his subordinate he thought he was in an undugout. you see mum ginger ain't happy in his own life but but look it's on the fire cried mrs marlings pointing to ginger's dinner at which he was gazing with an expression that was a tragedy of regret when excited mrs marlings had some difficulty with her aspirates oh mr winton she cried to the butler who entered at that moment and stood regarding the scene as achilles might have viewed the reverses of the greeks oh mr wilton take it away please it will poison us with his head held well in the air mr wilton beckoned to john who walked to the fireplace with a majestic motion of his hand mr wilton indicated to the footman that ginger's offending dinner was to be removed gravely john took up the tongs deliberately gripping the herring amidships and turned towards the door holding it aloft as if it were some sacred symbol ginger's eyes were glued to the blackened shape it ain't every red herring what has a funeral like that remarked bindle to ginger mr wilton threw open the door suddenly john started back and retreated the herring still held before him all smell and blue smoke old me orus murmured bindle who was in a direct line with the door if it ain't the old bird lady knob carrick entered followed by miss strint her companion and echo casting one annihilating look at the speechless john she gazed with amazement at the disorder about her miss strint gave vent to a spasmodic giggle which lady knob carrick did not even notice her gaze roved round the room as if she had found herself in unexpected surroundings finally her eyes fixed themselves on mr wilton wilton what is that john is holding lady knob carrick prided herself on her self-control all eyes were immediately turned upon john who shivered slightly it is what they call a herring a red herring my lady responded wilton poor people eat them i believe and what is it doing in my drawing-room demanded lady knob carrick with ominous calm it was smellin mum broke in bindle and we was gettin calves to take it out it's all through ginger he likes tasty food but he ain't appy hold your tongue said lady knob carrick turning to bindle and withering him through her lorgnettes she turned once more to her major-domo wilton she demanded what is the meaning of this outrage it's the billets my lady the what the billets my lady i haven't ordered any billets what are billets suddenly her eye caught sight of the bust of the late sir benjamin biggs who did that rage had triumphed over self-control all eyes turned to the marble lineaments of the late sir benjamin's features never had that worthy knight presented so disreputable an appearance as he did with huggles hat stuck upon his head at a rakish angle it must have been one of the workmen my lady mr wilton tiptoed over to the bust and removed the offending headgear placing it on a bundle of bedding one of the workmen stormed lady knob carrick is everybody mad what is being done with my drawing-room bindle stepped forward we come from arages mum with the beds and things for the soldiers for the what demanded her ladyship for the soldiers billets mum explained bindle you're going to billet sixteen soldiers here billet sixteen soldiers almost screamed her ladyship red in the face with great deliberation bindle pulled out the delivery note from behind his green baize apron and read solemnly lady knob carrick the poplars putney ill that's you mum ain't it lady knob carrick continued to stare at him stonily sixteen bedsteads bedding four baths four washing stands etc there's a rare lot of etceteras mum fit up bedsteads and drawing-room for billeting soldiers carefully storing at one end of room existin furniture there ain't no mistake said bindle solemnly it's all on this ere paper which was handed to me by the foreman this morning there ain't no mistake mum really but i tell you there is a mistake cried lady knob carrick angrily i have no intention of billeting soldiers in my drawing-room well mum said bindle shaking his head as if it were useless to fight against destiny it's all down here on this ere paper and if your lady knob carrick he referred to the paper again of the poplars putney hill 
then you want these soldiers sure as eggs perhaps you forgotten he added with illumination forgotten what demanded lady knob carrick forgotten that you want sixteen soldiers mum how a sharp snapping sound from without everybody turned to the window the situation had become intensely dramatic bindle walked over and looked out then turning to lady knob carrick he said triumphantly here's the sixteen soldiers mum so there ain't no mistake the what demanded lady knob carrick looking about her helplessly the sixteen soldiers with all their kit said bindle oh, i counted em he added as if to remove any glimmer of doubt that might still exist in lady knob carrick's mind is everybody mad lady knob carrick fixed her eyes upon wilton wilton looked towards the door which opened to admit john who had seized the occasion of the diversion to slip out with ginger's dinner the soldiers my lady he announced there was a tremendous tramping on the stairs and a moment afterwards fifteen soldiers in the charge of a sergeant streamed in each bearing his kit bag rifle etc the men gazed about them curiously the sergeant looked bewildered at so many people being grouped to receive them after a hasty glance round he saluted lady knob carrick then he removed his cap the men one by one sheepishly following suit i hope we haven't come too soon your ladyship lady knob carrick continued to stare at him through her lorgnettes wilton stepped forward there has been a mistake her ladyship cannot billet soldiers the sergeant looked puzzled he drew a paper from his pocket and read the address aloud lady knob carrick the poplars patney hill will billet sixteen soldiers in her drawing-room she will also cater for them cater for them almost shrieked lady knob carrick cater for sixteen soldiers i haven't ordered sixteen soldiers i'm very sorry said the sergeant but it's it's the man looked at the paper he held in his hand i don't care what you've got there said lady knob carrick rudely strint lady knob carrick had suddenly caught sight of miss strint yes my lady responded miss strint did i order sixteen soldiers demanded lady knob carrick in a tone she always adopted with servants when she wanted confirmation no my lady not as far as i know lady knob carrick turned triumphantly to the sergeant and stared at him through her lorgnettes you hear she demanded yes my lady i hear said the sergeant respectful but puzzled don't you think mum you could let em stay insinuated bindle seeing that all the stuff's here let them stay lady knob carrick regarded bindle in amazement let them stay in my drawing-room she pronounced the last four words as if bindle's remark had outraged her sense of delicacy they wouldn't be doing no harm mum if no harm cried lady knob carrick gazing indignantly at bindle through her lorgnettes soldiers in my drawing-room if it wasn't for them mum said bindle dryly you'd be avin soldiers in your bedroom uns he added significantly lady knob carrick hesitated she was conscious of having been forced upon rather delicate ground and she prided herself upon her patriotism suddenly inspiration seized her she turned on bindle fiercely why are you not in the army she demanded with the air of a cross-examining counsel about to draw from a witness a damning admission bindle scratched his head through his cricket cap he was conscious that all eyes were turned upon him answer me commanded lady knob carrick triumphantly why are you not in the army bindle looked up innocently at his antagonist you got various veins in your legs mum he lowered his eyes to lady knob carrick's boots how how dare you gasped lady knob carrick aware that the soldiers were broadly grinning and that every eye in the room had followed the direction of bindle's gaze because continued bindle quietly when you have various veins in your legs you ain't no good for the army i went on trying till they said they'd run me in for wasting time i seen him the remark came from ginger who finding that he had centred upon himself everybody's attention looked extremely ill at ease bindle looked across at him in surprise impulse with ginger was rare with flaming face and murderous eyes lady knob carrick turned to the sergeant you will remove your sixteen soldiers and take them back and say that they were not ordered as for you she turned to bindle you had better take all these things back again and tell harridge's that i shall close my account and i shall sue them for damages to my drawing-room and with that she marched out of the room at a word from the sergeant the men trooped out putting on their caps and grinning broadly 
bindle scratched his head took out his pipe and proceeded to fill it signing to his colleagues to get the beds and bedding down to the van quick march the short sharp order from below was followed by a crunch of gravel and then the men broke out into a song here we are here we are here we are again bindle went to the window and looked out as the sound died away in the distance the question are we downhearted was heard followed immediately by the chorus reply no my ain't them boys just it muttered bindle as he withdrew his head and proceeded with the work of reloading the van two hours later the van was grinding down putney hill with the skid pan adjusted ginger had gone home wilkes was on top and bindle sat on the tailboard smoking well he got ome all right on the old bird to-day remarked bindle contentedly my ain't he a knockout for his little joke beats me does mr little and i takes a little bit o beatin end of chapter fifteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com chapter sixteen of the adventures of bindle by herbert jenkins this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter sixteen milly's wedding it don't seem right somehow muttered bindle as he stood before the oval mirror of what a misguided fulham tradesman had catalogued as an elegant duchess dressing-table in walnut substitute a concertina that don't seem just right for a wedding bindle readjusted the crush hat that had come to him as part of the properties belonging to the oxford adventure he tried it on the back of his head over his eyes and at the sir david Beatty angle oh get out of the way do we shall be late mrs bindle in petticoat and camisole pushed bindle aside and took her place in front of the mirror anybody would think you was a woman standing looking at yourself in front of the glass what'll mr hearty say if we're late you need never be afraid of what ordeal say remarked bindle philosophically because he'll never say anything what can't be printed in a parish magazine mrs bindle sniffed and continued patting her hair with the palm of her hand bindle still stood regarding his crush hat regretfully you can't wear a hat like that at a wedding snapped mrs bindle that's for a dress suit bindle heaved a sigh i'd a like to have worn a top hat at millikin's wedding he remarked with genuine regret but as you'd say mrs b he remarked regaining his good humour god has ordained otherwise so it's a ard at for j b to-day remember you're going to chapel bindle remarked mrs bindle and it's a sin to enter the house of god with blasphemy upon your lips is it really was bindle's only comment as he produced the hard hat and began to brush it with the sleeve of his coat this done he took up a position behind mrs bindle bent his knees and proceeded to fix it on his head appropriating to his own use such portion of the mirror as could be seen beneath mrs bindle's left arm oh get away do mrs bindle turned on him angrily but bindle had achieved his object and had adjusted his hat at what he felt was the correct angle for weddings he next turned his attention to a large white rose which he proceeded to force into his buttonhole this time he took up a position on mrs bindle's right and going through the same process managed to get the complete effect of the buttonhole plus the hat he next proceeded to draw on a pair of canary-coloured wash leather gloves this done he picked up a light cane heavily adorned with yellow metal and mrs bindle having temporarily left the mirror he placed himself before it personally myself he remarked i don't see that charlie'll have a sportin chance to-day lord i pays for dressin he remarked popping quickly aside as mrs bindle bore down upon him you ought to be a proud woman to-day mrs b he continued there's many a fair art what'll flutter as i walks up the aisle mrs bindle's head however was enveloped in the folds of her skirt which she was endeavouring to assume without rumpling her hair ah oh, mrs b bindle said reprovingly late again late again he proceeded to bite off the end of a cigar which he lit don't smoke that cigar snapped mrs bindle not smoke a cigar at a weddin exclaimed bindle incredulously then if you can't smoke a cigar at a weddin when the ell can you smoke one 
don't you use those words at me retorted mrs bindle if you smoke you'll smell of smoke in the chapel the only smell i ever smelt in the chapel is its own smell and that ain't a pleasant one anyhow i'll put it out before i gets to the door i'm just goin to op round to see millikins you'll do nothing of the kind cried mrs bindle with decision you mustn't see a bride before she appears at the chapel bindle stopped dead on his way to the door and turning round exclaimed mustn't what you mustn't see a bride before she appears at the chapel or church it isn't proper well i'm blowed cried bindle you mean to tell me that charlie dixon ain't goin to nip round and have a look at her this mornin certainly not said mrs bindle but why persisted bindle because it's not proper it's not the right thing to do replied mrs bindle as she struggled into her bodice now ain't that funny said bindle i suppose it all came about because they was afraid the chap might sort of funk it and do a bunk not likin the looks of the gal anyhow that ain't likely to happen with millikins the cove what gets her has got a winner i thought you didn't believe in marriage said mrs bindle acidly oh, i don't mrs b replied bindle leastways the marriages what are made in the place where they don't play billiards but this little one was made in the putney cinema pavilion oh, i made it myself and when j b takes a thing in hand it's goin to be top ole then he proceeded after a pause millikins has got me to look after her if her man don't make her appy i'd skin him yes and rub salt in afterwards there was a grimness in bindle's voice that caused mrs bindle to pause in the process of pinning a brooch over her bodice yes mrs b continued bindle that little gal means an ell of a lot to me i mrs bindle looked round a little startled at a huskiness in bindle's voice she was just in time to see him disappear through the bedroom door when she returned to the looking-glass the face that was reflected back to her was that of a woman in whose eyes there was something of disappointment and cheated longing mrs bindle proceeded with her toilette everything seemed to go wrong and each article she required appeared to have hidden itself away finally she assumed her bonnet a study in two tints of green constructed according to the inevitable plan upon which all her bonnets were built narrow of gauge with a lofty superstructure she gave a final glance at herself in the glass and sighed her satisfaction at the sight of the maroon-coloured dress with the bright green bonnet when mrs bindle emerged into fenton street working her white kid gloves with feverish movement she found bindle engaged in chatting with a group of neighbours here comes my little beetroot remarked bindle at which mrs rogers went off into a shriek of laughter and told him to go on do mrs bindle acknowledged the salutations of her neighbours with a frigid inclination of her head she strongly objected to bindle's holding any truck with the occupants of other houses in fenton street well well so long all of you said bindle it ain't my weddin that's one thing there were cheery responses to bindle's remarks and sotto voce references to mrs bindle as a stuck-up cat mind you throw that cigar away before we get to the chapel said mrs bindle still working at her gloves right o said bindle as they turned into the new king's road he waved the hand containing the cigar in salutation to the driver of a passing motor bus with whom he was acquainted i wish you wouldn't do that said mrs bindle snappishly wouldn't do what inquired bindle innocently recognizing common people when you're with me was the response but that was airy sales said bindle puzzled at mrs bindle's attitude he ain't common he drives a motor bus what will people think demanded mrs bindle oh they're used to airy driving a bus replied bindle they might think it funny if he was to drive an earse you know what i mean said mrs bindle why can't you remember that you're going to a wedding nobody wouldn't know it from your looks mrs b commented bindle you look about as appy as arty does when he ears there's goin to be an air raid oh don't talk to me snapped mrs bindle and they continued on their way in silence when about a hundred yards from the alton road chapel mrs bindle demanded of bindle that he throw away his cigar which he did with great reluctance there was a small collection of women and children outside the chapel doors there exclaimed mrs bindle suddenly where inquired bindle looking first to the right and left and then on the ground and finally up at the sky i knew we should be late said mrs bindle there's the carriage 
at that moment a two-horse carriage bearing mr hearty and millie passed by and drew up at the entrance to the chapel mr hearty's white kid-gloved hand appeared out of the window fumbling with the handle of the carriage a moment later his silk hat adorned with a deep black band appeared still the carriage door refused to open suddenly as if out of sheer mischief it gave way and mr hearty lurched forward his hat fell off and rolled under the carriage a stray dog that had been watching the proceedings dashed for the hat just at the moment that mr hearty hurriedly stepped out to retrieve his headgear mr hearty's foot came down upon the dog's paw the animal gave a heart-rending howl mr hearty jumped the people laughed and the dog continued to howl holding up its wounded paw mr hearty however was intent upon the recapture of his hat with his silver-mounted umbrella he started poking beneath the carriage to try and coax it towards him an elderly gentleman seeing the mishap had approached from the other side of the carriage and with his stick was endeavouring to achieve the same object the result was that as soon as one drew the hat towards him the other immediately snatched it away again it's a game of hockey said bindle who had come up at this moment go it arty you got it mrs bindle tore at bindle's arm just as the benevolent gentleman succeeded in securing mr hardy's hat mr hardy dashed round to the other side of the carriage snatched his damaged headgear from the hands of the stranger and stood brushing it upon the sleeve of his coat excuse me sir said the stranger but it's my hat said mr hearty endeavouring to restore something of its lost glossiness mr hearty had apparently forgotten all about the bride and it was bindle who helped millie from the carriage and led her into the chapel mrs bindle reminded mr hearty of his duty putting his hat on his head he entered the chapel door it was mrs bindle also who reminded him of his mistake it's a good omen uncle joe whispered millie as she clung to bindle's arm what's a good omen millikins that you should take me in instead of father she whispered just as mr hearty bustled up and relieved bindle there was a craning of necks and a hum of voices as mr hearty intensely nervous led his daughter up to the altar bindle followed carrying mr hearty's hat and umbrella my don't his nibs look smart bindle muttered to himself as he caught sight of tardy dixon standing at the further end of the chapel the reverend mr sopley had come up from eastbourne specially for the occasion milly refusing to be married by mr mcfee the ceremony dragged its mournful course to the point where milly and charlie had become man and wife mr sopley then plunged into a lugubrious address full of dreary foreboding he spoke of orphans widowhood plague and famine the uncertainty of human life and the persistent quality of sin he ain't much at marryin whispered bindle to mr hearty but he ought to be worth a rare lot for funerals mr hearty turned and gazed at bindle uncomprehendingly it was bindle who snatched the first kiss from the bride and it was he who in the vestry lightened the depressing atmosphere by his cheerfulness mrs hearty in mauve and violet dabbed her eyes and beat her breast with rigid impartiality mr hearty strove to brush his hat into respectability millie clinging to her soldier husband stood with downcast eyes bindle looked at her with interest as she stood a meek and charming figure in a coat and skirt of puritan grey and a toque of the same shade mr sopley shook hands mechanically with everybody casting his eyes up to heaven as if mournfully presaging the worst about the gloomiest old cove i ever come across whispered bindle to mrs hardy whereat she collapsed upon a seat and heaved with silent laughter it was bindle who broke up the proceedings now then charlie op it i'm hungry he said and charlie dixon who had seemed paralyzed moved towards the vestry door it was bindle who held on mr hardy's hat when he entered his carriage and it was bindle who heaved and pushed mrs hardy until she was able to take her place beside her lawful spouse it was bindle who went back and captured the vague and indeterminate mr sopley and brought him in the last carriage that he might participate in the wedding breakfast come along sir he said to the pastor never mind about evan let's come and cut old artie's pineapple that'll make him ratty during the journey bindle went on to explain that mr hearty never expected a guest to have the temerity to cut a pineapple when placed upon his hospitable board is that so remarked mr sopley not in the least understanding what bindle was saying it is said bindle solemnly you see they goes back into stock ah remarked mr sopley gazing at the roof of the carriage 
clever old bird this muttered bindle about as brainy as a cock sparrow what's ad the wind knocked out of him when bindle entered the hearty's dining room he found the atmosphere one of unrelieved gloom mrs hearty was crying mr hearty looked nervously solemn mrs bindle was uncompromisingly severe and the other guests all seemed intensely self-conscious the men gazed about them for some place to put their hats and umbrellas the women wondered what they should do with their hands at the further end of the room stood millie and charlie dixon millie's hand still tucked through her husband's arm never was there such joylessness as in mr hearty's dining-room that morning hullo hullo cried bindle as he entered with mr sopley ain't this a jolly little crowd millie brightened up instantaneously charlie dixon looked relieved mr hearty dashed forward to welcome mr sopley tripped over bindle's cane which he was holding awkwardly and landed literally on mr sopley's bosom mr sopley stepped back and struck his head against the edge of the door look at Artie trying to kiss old woe and whiskers remarked bindle audibly millie giggled charlie dixon smiled mrs bindle glared and the rest of the guests looked either disapprovingly at bindle or sympathetically at mr hearty and mr sopley mrs hearty collapsed into a chair and began to undulate with mirth couldn't we have an im suggested bindle mr hearty looked round from abjectly apologizing to mr sopley he hesitated a moment and glanced towards the harmonium uncle joe is only joking father said millie mr hearty looked at bindle reproachfully now then let's sat down said bindle after much effort and a considerable expenditure of physical force he managed to get the guests seated at the table at a sign from mr hearty mr sopley rose to say grace every one but bindle was watching for movement and a sudden silence fell on the assembly from which bindle's remark stood out with clear-cut emphasis old arty playing ockey with his top hat under then bindle stopped looking about him with a grin gravely and ponderously mr sopley besought the lord to make the assembly grateful for what they were about to receive and amidst a chorus of amens the guests resumed their seats the wedding party was a small one for once mr hardy had found that patriotism was not at issue with economy the guests consisted of the bridegroom's mother a gentle sweet-faced woman with white hair and a sunny smile her brother-in-law mr john dixon a red-faced hurly-burly type of man a genial loud-voiced john bull hearty of manner and heavy of hand and half a dozen friends and relatives of the hearties at the head of the table sat millie and charlie dixon at the foot was mr sopley the other guests were distributed without thought or consideration as to precedence bindle found himself between mrs dixon and mrs hearty mrs bindle was opposite where she had planted herself to keep watch mr hearty sat next to mrs dixon facing mr dixon whose uncompromising stare mr hearty found it difficult to meet with composure alice the maid-servant reinforced by her sister bertha heavy of face and flat of foot attended to the wants of the guests the meal began in constrained silence the first episode resulted from alice's whispered inquiry if mr dixon would have lime juice or lemonade beer cried mr dixon in a loud voice alice looked across at mr hearty who being quite unequal to the situation looked at alice and then directed his gaze toward mr sopley i beg pardon sir said alice beer roared mr dixon everybody began to feel uncomfortable except bindle who was watching the little comedy with keen enjoyment we we began mr hearty we don't drink beer mr dixon don't drink beer cried mr dixon in the tone of a man who has just heard that another doesn't wear socks don't drink beer mr hearty shook his head miserably as if fully conscious of his shortcomings extraordinary said mr dixon most extraordinary well i'll have a whiskey and soda he conceded magnanimously mr hearty rolled his eyes and cast a languishing glance in the direction of mrs bindle we are temperance said mr hearty what roared mr dixon incredulously temperance temperance at a wedding always said mr hearty hm snorted dixon he glared down the length of the table as if the guests comprised a new species alice repeated her question about the lemonade and lime juice i should be sick if i drank it said mr dixon crossly i'll have a cup of tea he's like me mum said bindle to mrs dixon who was greatly distressed at the occurrence he likes his glass of beer and ain't none the worse for it 
mrs dixon smiled understandingly the meal continued gloomily silent or with whispered conversations as if the guests were afraid of hearing their own voices bindle turned to mrs hearty look here martha he cried we ain't a very cheero crowd are we ain't you got none of them naughty stories of yours to tell just to make us laugh mrs hearty was in the act of conveying a piece of chicken to her mouth the chicken and fork dropped back to the plate with a jangle and she leaned back in her chair heaving and wheezing with laughter look here sir said bindle addressing mr sopley who temporarily withdrew his eyes from the ceiling i had a little argument with a cove the other day as to where this ear was to be found i said it's from the bible he says it's from the pinkin bindle looked round to assure himself that he had attracted the attention of the whole table now this is it the lord said unto moses come forth and he come fifth and lorst the cup mrs dixon smiled millie and charlie dixon laughed but mr dixon threw himself back in his chair and roared mr hardy looked apprehensively at mr sopley who regarded bindle with uncomprehending eyes you've lost your money mr bindle you've lost your money it's the pinkin i'll bet my life on it choked mr dixon best thing i've heard for years pon my soul it is he cried mr bindle i'm afraid you're a very naughty man said mrs dixon gently me mum inquired bindle with assured innocence me naughty that's just where you're wrong mum when i die it ain't the things i done what i shall be sorry for but the things what i ain't done and as for arty he'll be as sorry for himself as ginger was when he got a dose of twins bindle remember there are ladies present cried the outraged mrs bindle from the other side of the table it's all right mrs b said bindle reassuringly these was gentlemen twins the meal progressed solemn and joyless few remarks were made but much food and drink was consumed bindle made a point of cutting both the pineapples that adorned the table delighting in the anguish he saw on mr hearty's face if only they had a drink groaned bindle it was sort of wake em up but what can you do on lemonade and glass ginger can't even have stone ginger cause they're sort of afraid it might make em tight when everyone had eaten to repletion mr hearty cast a glance round and then with the butt end of a knife rapped loudly on the table there was a sudden hush mr hearty looked intently at mr sopley who was far away engaged in a contemplation of heaven via the ceiling bindle began to clap which brought mr sopley back to earth seeing what was required of him he rose with ponderous solemnity and in his best grief and woe manner proceeded to propose the health of the bride in a sepulchral voice reminiscent of a damp church of england service in the country dear friends he raised a pair of anguished eyes to the green and yellow paper festoons that trailed from the electrolier above the dining-table to various picture nails on the walls he paused his lips moving slowly and impressively then aloud he continued dear friends of all the ceremonies that attend our brief stay in this vale of tears marriage is infinitely the most awful ear ear from bindle and murmurs of hush it is a contract entered into uh, uh, in the sight of heaven but with uh, uh, the almighty's blessing it may be a linking of hands of two of uh, god's creatures as they pass down the uh, uh, valley of the shadow of death to eternal and lasting salvation mr sopley paused ere i say sir broke in bindle cheer up this ain't a funeral there were murmurs of hush mrs hearty began to cry quietly mr hearty appeared portentously solemn mrs bindle looked almost cheerful we see two young people resumed mr sopley having apparently renewed his store of ideas from a further contemplation of the ceiling on the threshold of life with all its disappointments and temptations all its sin and misery all its fears and misgivings we know that we know we have evidence of mr sopley lost the thread of his discourse and once more returned to his contemplation of mr hearty's ceiling bindle beat his fist on the table but was silenced by a hush from several of the guests marriages continued mr sopley marriages are made in heaven 
i knew you was going to say that sir broke in bindle cheerfully ere stop it he yelled stooping down to rub his shin who's a kickin me under the table he fixed a suspicious eye upon a winter-worn spinster in a view rose satin blouse sitting opposite marriage is a thing of terrible solemnity resumed mr sopley not to be entered upon lightly or with earthly thoughts it is symbolical of many things sometimes terrible things ear ear interposed bindle but throughout all its vicissitudes in spite of all earthly woes desolation and despair it should be remembered that there is one above to whom all prayers should be directed and in whom all hope should be reposed in the course of the long life that the lord has granted me i have joined together in holy wedlock many young couples shame from bindle and a laugh from mr dixon and i hope our young friends here will find in it that meed of happiness which we all wish them in spite of the entire lack of conviction with which mr sopley wished the bridal pair happiness he resumed his seat amidst murmurs of approval his words were too solemn to be followed by applause from any one save bindle who tapped the table loudly with the butt end of his knife every one looked towards charlie dixon who in turn looked appealingly at bindle interpreting the glance to mean that bindle contemplated replying mrs bindle kicked him beneath the table ere who's kicking me on the shins again he cried as he rose mrs bindle frowned at him oh it's you is it he remarked now charlie you see what's going to appen when you know you're married been kicking my shins all the morning she has me with various veins in my legs too bindle looked at milly it was obvious that she was on the point of tears charlie dixon was gazing down at her solicitously mr dixon was clearly annoyed at the conclusion of mr sopley's address he had cleared his throat impressively as if prepared to enter the lists mrs dixon gazed anxiously at her son mr hardy looked at mrs bindle mrs bindle's eyes were fixed on bindle bindle rose deliberately if ever i wants to get married again began bindle looking at mr sopley i'll come to you sir to tie me up it'll sort of prepare me for the worst but i got to wait till mrs b ops it with the lodger not old guppy he added e's gone mr dixon laughed loudly into mrs bindle's cheeks there stole a flush of anger well continued bindle i promised charlie that he shouldn't have no speeches to make and so i'm on my hind legs a givin thanks for all them cheerful things what we just heard about i ain't altogether a believer and ow to be appy though married but this ere gentleman bindle indicated mr sopley by a jerk of his thumb well he can give me points no one didn't ought to have such ideas what ain't done time for bigamy i can see now why there ain't no givin and takin in marriage up there and bindle raised his eyes to the ceiling i got a new respect for evan i have i don't rightly understand what he means by a veil o tears or walkin hand in hand along the valley of the shadow perhaps they're places he's been to abroad i seen a good deal o wanderin end in end along the river between putney and Emmersmith. i'm a special you know i ad to ask the sergeant to change my duty used to make me ot all over it did there's one thing where you're wrong sir bindle turned to mr sopley who reluctantly brought his eyes down from the ceiling to gaze vacantly at bindle you said this ere marriage was made in evan well it wasn't it was made in fulham mrs dixon smiled mr dixon guffawed mr hardy looked anxiously from mrs bindle to mr sopley i made it myself so i ought to know proceeded bindle i seen a good deal of them two kids he looked affectionately at milly and if they ain't goin to be appy and fulham instead o wanderin about vales and valleys a snivellin you got one up against joe bindle i remember once earin a parson say that when we died and went to the sort of old bailey in the sky we should be asked if we'd ever done anybody a good turn if we ad then we'd got a sportin chance when i'm dead i can see myself a knockin at them golden gates of evan sort o registered letter knock what means an answer's wanted when they ask me if i ever done anyone a good turn i shall say i got millikins and charlie dixon tied up right o old sport they'll say up in and i shall nip in quick before they can bang the gates too like they do in the tube then i shall see old arty all wings and whiskers a playin ragtime on an arp again mr dixon's hearty laugh rang out splendid he cried splendid 
oh, i seen a good deal of marriage one way and another me and mrs b have been tied up a matter of nineteen years and look at her don't she look happy everybody turned to regard mrs bindle then continued bindle there's arty look at him one of the jolliest coves i know mechanically all eyes were directed towards mr hearty it all depends how you goes about marriage there's one thing you got to remember before you gets married bottles is returnable likewise new laid eggs what ain't new laid but you can't return your missus not even if you pays the carriage it's a lifer is marriage i ain't going to make a long speech because the pubs close at half past two and you'll all want to wash the taste of this ere lemonade out of your mouths bindle paused and looked at the now happy faces of millie and charlie dixon for a moment he gazed at them then with suddenness he resumed his seat conscious that his voice had failed him and that he was blinking and swallowing with unnecessary vigour the silence was broken only by the loud thumping on the table of mr dixon bravo he cried bravo one of the best speeches i've ever heard excellent splendid everybody looked at everybody else as if wondering what would happen next and obviously deploring mr dixon's misguided enthusiasm alice solved the problem by entering and whispering to millie that the taxi was at the door this was a signal for a general movement a pushing back of chairs and shuffling of feet as the guests rose charlie dixon walked across to bindle get us off quickly uncle joe will you he whispered millie doesn't think she can stand much more right o charlie replied bindle leave it to me now then hurry up hurry up he called out you'll lose that train come along once aboard the motor and the gal is mine now charlie where's your cap i'll see about the luggage almost before anyone knew what was happening they were gazing at the tail end of a taxicab being driven rapidly eastward when it had disappeared over the bridge bindle turned away and found himself blinking into the moist eyes of mrs dixon he coughed violently then as she smiled through her tears he remarked ain't i an old fool mum he said mr bindle she said in a voice that was none too well under control i think you have been their fairy godmother well i am a bit of an old woman at times remarked bindle swallowing elaborately now i must run after my little bit of evan or else she'll be off with old woe and whiskers it's wonderful how misery seems to attract some women he took two steps towards the door then turning to mrs dixon said don't you worry mum he'll come back all right god ain't a going to spoil the happiness of them two young kids mrs dixon's tears were now raining fast down her cheeks mr bindle she said you must be a very good man bindle stared at her for a moment in astonishment and then turned and walked through the hearty's private door well i'm blowed he muttered fancy er a saying that i wonder what old artie would think well i'm blowed here come along sir he cried to mr dixon it's a quarter past two we just got a quarter of an hour and the two men passed down the high street in the direction of putney bridge end of chapter sixteen end of the adventures of bindle by herbert jenkins read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com